Dr. Els. Uh, it is very late here in the US, but it is my pleasure, my privilege, my honor uh, to uh, reintroduce um, uh, our, our uh, conference because we had a full day conference yesterday. Uh, this is our second day and it is going to be about a half day, but we have lined up uh, once again, eminent speakers, thoughtful analysts and commentators who have uh, drunk deep from the wonderful uh, uh, trough that uh, Sri Sitaram Goel created for all of us to, to drink from. Uh, surely, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, I think we are all beholden uh, to Sitaram Goel in terms of just his perceptiveness uh, in his observation uh, uh, of India, and not just uh, of India, but also about how uh, the world had impacted India and the kinds of changes that he saw coming. And therefore, uh, once again, uh, uh, it's my privilege uh, to, to start uh, this morning's proceedings. And I just want to briefly say uh, that India Facts, as the sponsor uh, of this conference, uh, by name, yes, sponsor, but the sponsors behind and the help and support behind this conference, uh, surely I should recognize uh, uh, C.V. Sridharan, sorry, D.V. Sridharan, who is here with us today, uh, R. Jagannathan, and of course, Harikiran Vatlamani. Uh, without their support and without the support of our Hyderabad team, who are people behind the scene who, who put this together, uh, who organize everything from not merely the technology part of it, but all of the posters and the flyers and the announcement and the marketing, uh, 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 <clears throat> the advertising of this conference. So I want to thank all of you. Uh, I, I do this, I wish I could stay back and do a final thank you, but, but since it is so very late and it will be about four o'clock in the morning for me if I were to stay up, but so I take this opportunity to thank everyone. And I want to finally hear in terms of my, my, my brief presentation here, I want to thank uh, Shashant who, who uh, moderated so well yesterday's uh, proceedings and who is going to be in charge today too. Uh, and of course, uh, we will let uh, Dr. Conrad Els then uh, help us navigate through the conference. So with that said, welcome once again, and Shashant, over to you. Yeah. Uh, a very good morning to all of you and namaste. Uh, we are in the second day of our uh, conference on life and significance of Sri S.R. Goel. And uh, after yesterday's very uh, uh, enlightening and precise discussion on various aspects of his life, Today, that is Sunday, 17th October, we would be having our fifth and sixth, that is the final uh, uh, parts of our conference. Uh, session five is on intra-Hindu controversies that would go on from 9.30 to 11. And in session six, we have the challenge of Islam uh, that goes on from 11 to 1. After that, uh, Dr. Els would be concluding uh, from 1 to 1.30. I again uh, thank you India Facts and all the organizers and the technical team for organizing this and making me a part of this. And also I welcome all the panelists today and all the attendees who are gracious enough uh, to attend this on a Sunday morning. So uh, I really thank you all for your time and your energies as always. Uh, I would go on now to introduce uh, Shri uh, Shankar Sharanji, who would be the first speaker this morning. Uh, as the schedule uh, dictates, uh, we are we have a time slot from 9.30 to 11. Uh, each of the speakers, uh, Shri Shankar Sharanji and Ranveer Sikonji, would be getting 45 minutes uh, of time uh, for their deliberations and discussions. Uh, so while uh, going on and introducing Shankar Sharanji, 
uh, he is a phd from jnu uh, jnu new delhi uh, in the theory and practice of soviet communist party uh, organization and diploma on soviet polity from institute of social sciences moscow uh, currently he is a professor of political science new delhi and former professor of political science ms university of badoda that is badodara he regularly writes and is a columnist uh, and a regular contributor to hindi daily newspapers such as dainik jagran and naya india uh, so far 22 of his books have been published some of which is uh, marxvad ke khandar tibet since asian relations conference marxism and writing of indian history and uh, uh, gandhi ahimsa aur rajniti musliman suche and musalmanon ki musalmanon ki ghar wapsi kyon kya aur kaise uh i welcome uh, shankar sharan ji as he would be speaking on sr goel and the sang so uh, namaste shankar ji uh, warm welcome and uh, please i request you to uh, take over and uh, uh, share your thoughts and insights with us thank you namaskar shashank ji aur sabhi bhagidar main aapko dhanyawad deta hu ki mujhe aapne is avsar par bolne ke liye समय दिया ये बड़े गर्व की बात है बड़े सम्मान की बात है यह विषय बहुत गंभीर है बहुत संवेदनशील है और आज विशेषकर ये बहुत सामयिक भी हो गया है मैं संक्षेप में पहले ये रखूंगा कि श्री सीताराम गोयल का संघ परिवार से कितना और कैसा संपर्क था फिर मैं ये रखूंगा कि उन्होंने उनके बारे में क्या अंतिम निर्णय दिया अपना मूल्यांकन किया और फिर मैं इस बात की तुलना करूंगा कि जो निष्कर्ष उन्होंने संघ परिवार के बारे में दिए थे आज भी इस वर्ष के बाद बल्कि कहना चाहिए 25 वर्ष के बाद क्या वे निष्कर्ष कहीं गलत हुए हैं या सही अधिक सही लग रहे हैं या उसमें किसी संशोधन की आवश्यकता है तो मैं इन तीन बिंदुओं पर संक्षेप में अपनी बात रखूंगा कुछ बातें लोग जानते हैं लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि देश में अधिकांश लोग इन बातों से परिचित नहीं सबसे पहली बात तो यह कि संघ परिवार से श्री सीताराम गोयल का संबंध 50 वर्षों से भी ज्यादा रहा छिटपुट और बहुत करीब से और हर तरह का सबसे पहली बार वो उन्नीस में उनसे संघ के स्वयंसेवकों ने विद्यार्थियों ने संपर्क किया जब वे दिल्ली विश्वविद्यालय में इतिहास के विद्यार्थी उसके बाद उन्नीस में जब कलकत्ता में श्री सीताराम गोयल ने कम्युनिज्म के विरोध में एक शिक्षण और जन जागरण अभियान शुरू किया तब फिर से संघ के नेताओं ने उनसे संपर्क किया और वो काफी अच्छा चला उसका परिणाम संभवतः यह हुआ कि उन्नीस में जब आरएसएस ने अपनी पॉलिटिकल पार्टी बनाई थी उन्नीस में जनसंघ तो उन्नीस में खजुराहो लोकसभा सीट से सीताराम गोयल को जनसंघ के टिकट पर चुनाव भी लड़ाया गया फिर उन्नीस में तब वो दिल्ली आ गए आ चुके थे फिर उन्नीस से संघ परिवार का जो मुख्य साप्ताहिक अंग्रेजी पत्र है ऑर्गेनाइजर उसमें उन्होंने लिखना शुरू किया जो रुक रुक कर लगभग तीन दशकों तक चलता रहा बीच बीच में उनके संपादक उनसे बार बार लिखवाते थे के आर मलकानी उसके संपादक रहे एल के अडवाणी उसके संपादक रहे और बावजूद इसके कि सीताराम गोयल काफी कड़ी आलोचना करते थे कुछ मुद्दों पर उन्होंने उनसे ऑर्गेनाइजर के लिए लिखवाना जारी रखा तो एक लेखक के रूप में उन्होंने लंबे समय तक ऑर्गेनाइजर के लिए लिखा फिर उन्नीस सौ दशक नब्बे के अंतिम दशक के आरंभिक वर्षों में राम जब राम जन्मभूमि आंदोलन अयोध्या में शुरू हुआ तो विश्व हिंदू परिषद के लिए अदालत के लिए दस्तावेज तैयार करने में एकेडमिक एविडेंस तैयार करने में बहुत बड़ी भूमिका श्री सीताराम गोयल ने निभाई बल्कि वो पूरा एविडेंस जो विश्व हिंदू परिषद के तरफ से कोर्ट में रखा गया था श्री सीताराम गोयल के ऑफिस में ही तैयार हुआ फाइनली फिर अंततः उन्नीस में संघ परिवार पर एक संघ के लेखक के ही पर्चे पर देश उन्होंने देश भर से 
जागरूक लोगों की एक मिनट के लिए आ जाए नीचे मेरे को जागरूक लोगों की टिप्पणियां इकट्ठा कर जो बहुत संजीदा लोग थे संघ के भी काफी लोग थे उन्होंने संघ परिवार उन्होंने उस पर्चे पर पूरे देश भर से विमर्श करवाकर अंतिम जो एक बड़ी किताब तैयार की वो भी संघ परिवार पर थी विदर संघ परिवार टाइम फॉर स्टॉक टेकिंग ये 1997 में छपी कुल मिलाकर ये उनके 50 वर्ष से अधिक लंबा उनका संघ से संपर्क रहा जनसंघ से भाजपा से विश्व हिंदू परिषद से उनके बड़े नेताओं से उनके कार्यकर्ताओं से उनके पाठकों से इसकी इस पर एक संक्षिप्त उन्होंने विवरण भी दिया है अपनी बौद्धिक आत्मकथा मैं हिंदू कैसे बना जो उन्नीस में छपी थी उसमें उन्होंने काफी लिखा है अपने संघ परिवार के अनुभवों पर फिर उनकी एक पुस्तक है जो कि किंकेट की शिवाजी की पुस्तक का अनुवाद है शक्तिपुत्र शिवाजी उसकी दूसरी प्रस्तावना उन्होंने उन्नीस में लिखी उसमें भी उन्होंने इसकी पृष्ठभूमि दी कि कैसे उन्हें पुस्तक प्रकाशन में आना पड़ा और संघ परिवार के नेताओं का भी इसमें एक अपने तरह का योगदान है तो उसमें उनका विवरण है संघ परिवार से उनके संबंधों का जिन्हें विशेष जानने की इच्छा हो वो उन्हें ये किताबें पढ़नी चाहिए तो इस तरह से लगभग 50 वर्ष से अधिक अनुभव के बाद हर तरह के अनुभव के बाद श्री सीताराम गोयल ने संघ परिवार के बारे में जो अपनी टिप्पणी थी वो बड़ी रिमार्केबल है बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण है और विचार करने योग्य है क्योंकि यह एक बड़े योद्धा संत ऋषि तुल्य व्यक्ति की है उन्होंने लिखा था संघ के बारे में इसी संगठन के जीवन में एक बिंदु आता है जब अपनी ही चिंता करने में उसके मूल लक्ष्य ओझल हो जाते हैं ये उन्होंने बहुत ही संयत रूप से लेकिन ऐसा मुझे लगता है कि इसमें लगभग सारी बातें इसमें आ जाती हैं लेकिन जो बातचीत होती थी या मौखिक रूप से उन्होंने इन बातों को कुछ ज्यादा साफ और बिल्कुल बेलाग लिखा था और दो टूक कहा था में उनकी कुछ बातें अब धीरे धीरे काफी प्रचलित भी हो गई हैं, जिसमें मुख्य बातें ये हैं, वे कहते हैं सीताराम गोयल ने संघ के बारे में कहा कि पूरे विश्व इतिहास में वज्र मूर्खों का सबसे बड़ा एकत्रित संगठन राष्ट्रीय स्वयं सेवक संघ है उनके ओरिजिनल वर्ड्स जो रिकॉर्ड किए गए हैं ये उन्नीस सौ दबासी में उन्होंने कहे थे बिगेस्ट कलेक्शन ऑफ टफर्स That ever came together in world history. उनकी दूसरी बात इस संगठन में जैसे जैसे आप ऊपर के नेताओं को जानते हैं वैसे वैसे मूर्खता का आकार बढ़ता मिलता है बिगर द डर यू मीट ये उन्होंने 1996 में एक संघ स्वयं सेवक को ही पत्र में लिखा तीसरा उनका मूल्यांकन था जो बहुत गंभीर है आरएसएस हिंदू समाज को एक ऐसे फंदे की ओर ले जा रहा है जिससे इसका निकल सकना शायद संभव ना हो ये उन्होंने नाइन उन्नीस में कहा था कि आरएसएस इज लीडिंग हिंदू सोसाइटी इनटू ए ट्रैप फ्रॉम विच इट मे नॉट रिकवर उन्होंने एक और मूल्यांकन किया था अपने लंबे अनुभव से यदि संघ भाजपा का पतन नहीं होता तो हिंदू समाज का पतन तय है ये उन्होंने दो में कहा था लगभग अपने अंत के समय हिंदू सोसाइटी इज डूम्ड अनलेस दिस आरएसएस बीजेपी मूवमेंट पेरिशेस एक और जो संघ के ही एक बुजुर्ग व्यक्ति ने अपनी स्वयं कहा है क्योंकि वो उस मीटिंग में थे उन्होंने कहा कि उन्नीस में विठल भाई पटेल भवन दिल्ली में एक मीटिंग हुई थी जिसमें सर सार तब तब के संघ सर कार्यवाह श्री सुदर्शन के आर मलकानी वसंत राव ओक रामस्वरूप जो मुरली मनोहर जोशी जी देवेंद्र स्वरूप अरुण जेटली सहित लगभग तीस के लोग थे वहां उन्होंने सीताराम गोयल ने कहा मैं इस मंच से घोषणा करता हूं कि राष्ट्रीय स्वयं सेवक संघ से राष्ट्र का अहित होगा अहित होगा अहित होगा जैसा आप देख सकते हैं कि ये पांचों बातें किसी क्षणिक आवेश में नहीं कही गई ये अलग अलग सालों में और एक उसमें कंसिस्टेंसी है और जैसा मैंने कहा कि एक ऋषि तुल्य लेखक योद्धा और मनीषी की बात है जिसके बारे में यह भी ध्यान देना चाहिए कि उनकी बातें लिखी हुई बातें ओल्ड प्रिंट में है 
उनकी शायद ही कोई बात अभी तक गलत साबित हुई है तथ्य के लिए या तर्क के के दृष्टि से इसलिए भी इन बातों को गंभीरता से विचार करने की आवश्यकता है उसे हल्के से डिसमिस करना बहुत ही गलत बड़ी गलती है क्योंकि तो ये बहुत भयंकर चेतावनी है कि जिस हिंदू समाज ने सदियों इस्लामी साम्राज्यवाद को झेल कर हरा दिया जिसने चर्च मिशनरियों के सदियों से आघात सहकर उन्हें अभी तक विफल रखा वह संघ परिवार के कारण नष्ट हो जा सकता है ये बहुत बड़ी टिप्पणी है जिसको डिसमिस करना अपनी ही हानि करना है अब इसकी व्याख्या या इसकी चर, इसकी चर्चा ही चूंकि नहीं होती इसलिए हम लोग इस पर ज्यादा कल्पना नहीं कर पाए हैं कि इससे उनका मतलब क्या था ऐसा कैसे हो जाएगा कि जो हिंदू समाज हजारों हजार साल से लड़ करके बचा रहा वो अपने ही लोगों के हाथों मारा जाएगा या उनके कारण खत्म हो जा सकता है ये इससे पीछे उनका मतलब क्या था शायद ये मतलब था जो मैं समझता हूँ कि संघ परिवार की इतनी बड़ी ढाल इतना बड़ा सहारा या उनकी अकर्मण्यता उनकी ना समझी और समाज और शासन पर या संगठनों पर उनका एकाधिकार शायद इसका लाभ उठाकर इस्लामी चर्च मिशनरी तंत्र और उनके वामपंथी सहयोगी ये सभी हिंदू समाज को ऐसा विवश और बांध दे सकते हैं कि फिर उन्हें हराने लायक हिंदू समाज इस बार बचेगा ही नहीं शायद उन्होंने ये समझा था शायद कुछ और समझा था इस पर लोगों को चर्चा करनी चाहिए लेकिन मैं इतना जरूर समझता हूँ अपने भी अनुभव से आखिर 25 वर्षों का मैं कह सकता हूँ मेरा भी अनुभव है अवलोकन का देखने का विश्लेषण का अध्ययन का पहले का भी अगर जोड़ दिया जाए तो ये अनुभव मेरे अपने विवेक से ये बताते हैं कि सीताराम गोयल ने बहुत सोच समझकर ये बातें कही थी और वो बातें अभी तक गलत साबित नहीं हुई और इसीलिए किसी नेता या संगठन की दिन रात वाहवाही करने से जिनको इसकी आवश्यकता भी शायद नहीं है उससे ये अधिक जरूरी काम है कि हम इस पर खुला विचार विमर्श करें लेकिन इस पर कोई मुंह नहीं खोलता वे लोग भी जो कुछ ना कुछ इसको सही समझते और मेरे अनुमान से ये भी सीताराम गोयल की चेतावनी की एक पुष्टि ही है और इसीलिए सभी सुचिंतित लोगों को सोचना चाहिए कि वह बातें कितनी सही और कितनी गलत साबित हुई है जबकि वह संगठन संघ परिवार बढ़ता गया है यहां तक कि अकेले केंद्रीय सत्ता पर भी वह काबिज हो चुका है इसलिए मैं जरूर कहूंगा कि जिन्हें वो चेतावनी बेढब लगे जिनको ये लगे कि वो चेतावनी बस ऐसे ही दे दी गई किसी खपती व्यक्ति ने या किसी दुखी व्यक्ति ने अपने मन से कुछ ऐसी बात कह दी उनको इस पर सोचना चाहिए कि ये एक संत स्वरूप योद्धा की वाणी है जिसने पांच दशक से अधिक समय तक विपरीत परिस्थितियों में हिंदू समाज के सभी सभ्यतागत सत्वों से लोहा लिया और इसमें वो कभी भयभीत नहीं हुए उनकी जीवनी पढ़नी चाहिए कि जवाहरलाल नेहरू से लेकर के चर्च मिशनरियों तक और इस्लामियों तक उन्होंने सबसे लड़ाई लड़ी और कभी इस पर संकोच नहीं किया यही नहीं साथ समय समय पर बल्कि कहना चाहिए अंत तक उन्होंने संघ परिवार को निस्वार्थ रूप से सहयोग भी दिया उनके साथ निकट से विचार व्यवहार किया इसलिए मैं समझता हूं कि उनका अवलोकन दीर्घ अनुभव और आलोकन दीर्घ अनुभव पर आधारित है उसकी उपेक्षा करना हिंदू समाज के लिए घातक हो सकता है तो मैं समझता हूं कि उनका आकलन शुरू से इस रूप में देखा जा सकता है कि उन्होंने पाया कि जनसंघ शुरू से ही जो भारत जो संघ परिवार ने अपना अपनी पार्टी बनाई आरएसएस ने अपनी जो पार्टी बनाई सीताराम गोयल ने नोट किया कि ये शुरू से ही हिंदू महासभा से इस बात में भिन्न थी कि हिंदू हित और सेकुलरिज्म के मुद्दे पर वह ढुलमुल अस्पष्ट और, और आंख मिचौली की मुद्रा में थी शुरू से फिर उन्होंने उन्नीस में जब उनका निकट से राजनीतिक संपर्क हुआ उस लोकसभा चुनाव के दौरान और इसका विवरण उन्होंने हवाई बिके में हिंदू में दिया है लास्ट चैप्टर में उसमें उन्होंने कहा कि जब उस चुनाव अभियान के दौरान जो संघ और जनसंघ के आलोचक थे उन्होंने उनको कहा उन्होंने उनको कहा वे कांग्रेस और बीजेएस भारतीय जनसंघ की नीतियों पर अंतर पर वो ज्यादा बातचीत न करें उन्होंने अब मैं उनको उद्धृत करता ये सीताराम गोयल के शब्द हैं अंडर कोट उन्होंने मुझे बार बार कहा कि मैं कांग्रेस को बेईमान समाजवादी और सेकुलर 
तथा भारतीय जनसंघ को ईमानदार समाजवादी और सेकुलर कहो आयोजकों ने मुझे मुस्लिम इलाके वाली मीटिंगों में गोहत्या पर प्रतिबंध की मांग न करने और पाकिस्तान के विरुद्ध कुछ न कहने की चेतावनी अंततः उन्होंने अपने भाष मुझे अपने भाषणों में बीच बीच में अंग्रेजी शब्दों और मुहावरों का प्रयोग करने के लिए कहा ताकि लोग मुझे अशिक्षित न समझे मुझे ये सुझाव पसंद नहीं आए अनकोट तो इससे यह झलकता है कि वो शुरू से ही अपने आप को सेकुलर समाजवादी कहना चाहते थे ठीक कांग्रेस की तरह सिर्फ वो उनका उनका भाव ये था भारतीय जनसंघ का या भारतीय जनता पार्टी का कि हम वही काम करेंगे जो कांग्रेस करती है लेकिन हम ज्यादा ईमानदारी से करें और ये चीजें ज्यादा विस्तार से और बहुत प्रमाणिक रूप से उनकी आखिरी पुस्तक में आती है जो मूल्यांकन सीताराम गोयल जी ने प्रकाशित किया टाइम फॉर स्टॉक टेकिंग विदर संघ परिवार और ये बड़ी एक ऐतिहासिक और अपने तरह की अकेली पुस्तक है चार सौ अड़सठ पेज की 1997 में उनके देहांत से पहले यह संभवतः सबसे बृहद आखिरी पुस्तक और इस पर उस ये इसकी शुरुआत एक स्वयंसेवक के कारण ही हुई डॉक्टर श्रीरंग गोट बोले जो पुणे में डॉक्टर हैं उन्होंने संघ की इस्लाम नीति पर और संघ की मुस्लिम नीति पर एक छोटा सा परिचा प्रस्तुत किया था संघ के ही एक, एक आ, मीटिंग में जिसमें बड़े बड़े लोग थे संघ के बड़े बड़े लोग थे सरसंघ चालक तक उन्होंने जो पर्चा पढ़ा था वो उन्होंने सीताराम गोयल को भेजा और सीताराम गोयल ने कहा कि क्या मैं ये पर्चा देश भर में लोगों को विचार के लिए दे सकता हूँ डॉक्टर गोडबोले ने कहा हाँ हाँ आप दे सकते तो श्री सीताराम गोयल ने वो पर्चा टाइम फॉर स्टॉक टेकिंग ए स्वयं सेवक स्पीक्स ये उन्होंने देश भर में आ, ये जो हिंदू चिंतन से जुड़े हुए लोग थे हिंदू समाज की चिंता से जुड़े हुए लोग थे जिसमें संघ के स्वयंसेवक भी थे उनको भेजा और उनसे जो टिप्पणियां आई वो लगभग 80 लोगों से भी अधिक लोगों की टिप्पणियां थी उनमें जितने मूल्यवान थे उन सब को जोड़कर और वो डॉक्टर गोडबोले की का जो दो दस्तावेज था जिसमें उन्होंने संघ की इस्लाम और मुस्लिम नीति पर अपनी टिप्पणियां और अपनी क्रिटिसिजम लिखा था उसको जोड़कर फिर साथ में एक अपना एक बृहत तबलीगी जमात का एक एनालिसिस सीताराम गोयल जी ने उसमें जोड़ा फिर उसने बांग्लादेश की स्थिति पर एक बड़ा बड़ा निबंध था और बड़ा एनालिटिकल पेपर था वो उसमें जोड़ा और डॉक्टर और डॉक्टर डेविड फ्रॉले का बौद्धिक क्षत्रिया पर एक मौलिक निबंध था जिसमें वो आज के हिंदुओं के कर्तव्य पर लिखते हैं इन सब को जोड़कर और कुछ और बातें थी जिसमें मुस्लिम समाज के अंदर जो इंटेलेक्चुअल स्वर उठ रहे हैं इस्लाम की आलोचना में जिसमें ये इब्न बराक और ये सलमान रुश्ती इनसे जुड़ी हुई कुछ महत्वपूर्ण दस्तावेज जो उस समय बड़े चर्चित थे या बड़ी उस पर चर्चा हो रही थी इन सबको इकट्ठा करके उन्होंने वो पुस्तक प्रकाशित अपनी ओर से उन्होंने सिर्फ दो टिप्पणियां जोड़ी सीताराम गोयल ने जो संघ पर रिफ्लेक्ट करती हैं वो कहते हैं कि सन अठारह से ही भारत की राजनीति ऐसी हुई है कि मुसलमान वैचारिक राजनीतिक क्षेत्रगत मांगे करते गए हैं और हिंदू उन्हें स्वीकारते गए हैं फिर भी मुस्लिम समस्या जस की तस है फिर बाहरी पेट्रो डॉलर पीपी सिंह मुलायम सिंह लालू प्रसाद कांसीराम जैसे नेताओं के उदय के साथ मुस्लिम और भी आक्रामक होते गए हैं और उन्नीस से पहले वाली मुद्रा में आ गए हैं ये उन्होंने एक टिप्पणी जोड़ी श्री सीताराम गोयल ने दूसरी टिप्पणी जो उन्होंने जोड़ी वो गांधी जी से लेकर संघ परिवार तक हू बहु लागू होती है वो कहते हैं श्री सीताराम गोयल कहते हैं कि हिंदू नेताओं की आदत हो गई है वो हिंदुओं को अपनी जेब में और ग्रांटेड समझते हैं और मुसलमानों के साथ मुसलमानों की ही शर्त पर सौदेबाजी करते हैं जैसे मुसलमानों के बीच मुसलमानों को संबोधित करते हुए उनकी तमाम बातों में दिखता है कांग्रेस ने 1885 से आज तक अर्थात उन्नीस तक यह किया अब संघ परिवार वही कर रहा है गोयल जी कहते हैं कि यह हिंदुओं को तय करना है कि तब तक वे अपने को इस तरफ और ग्रांटेड लिए जाते रहेंगे उस पर्चे पर जो देश भर के असंख्य जानकार अनुभवी लोगों की समीक्षा मिली उसको जोड़ करके उन्होंने वो पुस्तक प्रकाशित की जो आज भी पठनीय है 25 साल के बाद भी उसकी सामयिकता में और मौलिकता में कोई कमी नहीं आई है 
مولانا وحید الدین خان اور تبلیغی جماعت پر جو انہوں نے جو وسترت پیپر لکھا تھا ریسرچ پیپر جیسا ہے وہ مولانا وحید الدین خان کی کتاب کی ہی سمیکشا ہے استاد سے انت میں اس کو بھی پڑھنے کی ضرورت ہے کیونکہ تبلیغی جماعت تب سے بڑھتا گیا ہے اور پچھلے سال اس کی کافی دیش میں چرچہ بھی ہوئی تھی پھر اس سے بھی ملا کر کے اس کو دیکھا جا سکتا ہے اور مولانا وحید الدین خان جس کو سنگ سنگ نے بہت مہتو دیا تھا اور ہم دیکھتے ہیں کہ آج بھی ان کا مہتو ہے کیونکہ پچھلے سال یہ سرکار نے ان کو پد بھوشن پھر سے دیا واجپئی جی نے ان کو پدم بھوشن دیا تھا اس پرکار مولانا وحید الدین جو تبلیغی جماعت کے سرپرست تھے اس کو سنگ پریوار نے دو دو پدم پرستار دیئے تو اس طرح سے وہ ساری باتیں آج بھی سامعیق ہیں اب میرے مند میں یہ پرشت اٹھتا ہے میں سمجھتا ہوں سب کو یہ ویچار کرنی چاہیے کہ جب سیتارام گویل سنگ کے نیتاؤں کو خاص کر کے اوپر کے نیتاؤں کو وجر مورک ڈفر کہتے ہیں تو ان کی اس بات کو کیسے پرکھا جا سکتا ہے کہ کیا انہوں نے یہ کرود میں یا اتی رنجنہ میں کہہ دیا یا بات صحیح ہے اس کو کیسے پرکھا جا سکتا ہے یہ بات صحیح ہے یا نہیں میں نے ایسی سوٹ میں نے مجھے ایسا لگتا ہے کہ ان کا سوٹیوں پر اس کو پرکھا جا سکتا ہے یہ میں نے سمجھنے کی کوشش کی نمبر ون بدھی ویویک کا پریوگ ان میں نگن نے ملتا ہے جس سے ان کو وہ ساید ایسا کہتے ہیں گاندھی نہرو کمنزم اسلام تک کے پرتی سنگ پریوار میں کوئی صاف سسنگت نسکرس نہیں رکھا گیا ہے نہ اس کی چنتہ کی گئی ہے تو ایک طرح سے یہ بہت مند بدھی کا سنکیت ہے کہ اتنے گمبھیر وشنوں پر ان کی کوئی سپسٹ نیتی نہ ہو سمیں سمیں پر یا نیتا در نیتا یہ انتر ویرودھی باتیں بولتے ہو پھر اس کو چھپاتے ہو پھر کوئی نئی باتیں بولتے ہو تو یہ ایسا لگتا ہے کہ یہ بدھی پریوگ کا پریوگ نگرنے ہے دوسرا کتھنی کرنی میں ان کی ایکتہ بہت کم ہے یا اس میں سامن جیسے کا گھور بھاو ہے بلکہ وپریت ہے جو آج کہا گیا اس سے ٹھیک وپریت کل کہا جاتا ہے یا کیا جاتا ہے تو یہ دوسرا بندو ہے جس سے یہ پرکھا جا سکتا ہے کہ ان کو انہوں نے اگر ڈفر مند وجر مورک کہا تھا تو اس کا پرخ کیسے ہو سکتا ہے تیسرا سادھن سادھ کی سپشتتا اور کار ریکارڈ آدھی نہ رکھنا نہ دینا کہ انہوں نے آج تک کیا کیا اس کا کوئی سارجنک حساب وہ نہ دیتے ہیں نہ رکھتے ہیں سوئے ان کے کاری کرتا بھی نہیں جانتے کہ ان کے پچھلے بڑے نیتاؤں نے کیا باتیں کہی تھی اور کتنے بڑے نرنے کیے اور جب ان کو پتا چلتا ہے تو وہ چکیت ہوتے ہیں ایسے ایسے سوئے سے وقت جو دس دس پندرہ پندرہ بیس بیس سال سے ہیں وہ بھی چکیت ہو جاتے ہیں کہ اچھا پاچپی جی نے ایسا کہا تھا اچھا وہ آئیوگ ایسے بنا تھا اچھا سید صاحب الدین کو واجبی جی نے بڑھایا تھا مطلب وہ ان سب چیزوں کو جان کے چکیت ہو جاتے ہیں تو یہ چکیت ہونا دکھاتا ہے کہ اس طرح پریوار اپنے بھی کارے کرتا ہوں کو اپنے اتحاس کے بارے میں نہیں بتاتا اس کا کوئی ریکارڈ نہیں رکھتا اس کا کوئی ایک آکلن سٹاک ٹیکنگ خود نہیں کرتا تو ہمیشہ یہ ایڈ ہاکیزم اس سمیں کچھ بھی بول کر کام نکالنا یہ جو مانسکتہ ہے یہ ایک مرختہ کا ایک سنکیت ہے جو ان کے ترکوں میں تتھیوں میں اور گتویدیوں میں تینوں میں ملتا ہے چوتھا بندو جو میں کلپنا کرتا ہوں وہ یہ کہ وہ انبھو سے نہیں سیکھتے ہیں یہ بھی ایک مرختہ کا بندو ہے نہ تو دوسروں کے انبھو سے سیکھتے ہیں نہ اپنے انبھو سے سیکھتے ہیں پچھلے کام پچھلے بیان پچھلی پستکیں آدھی وہ چھپانے لگتے ہیں بلکہ انہوں نے اپنے بھی بڑے نیتا کی ایک پستک کو کینسل کر دیا جبکہ اس کا ان کو کوئی ادھکار نہیں تھا کسی پستک کو اس کا لیکھا کی ہٹا سکتا ہے لیکن انہوں نے ایسا کیا اپنے ہی ایک بڑے نیتا کی پستک پنچ آف تھوٹس کو کہا کہ نہیں نہیں اب یہ ہماری نہیں ہے تو یہ ایک طرح کا یہ بھی انبھو سے سیکھنا نہیں بلکہ اس کو چھپانا پانچمہ بندو جو مجھے لگتا ہے مورختہ کی جو سیتارام گوہل کے شبت ہے کہ ہندو سماج کے پرتی ان میں گھور اگیان ہے اور گھور نہ سمجھی ہے وہ ہندو سماج کو نکارہ اور کائر آدھی مانتے ہیں اس کے پرتی سمویدن شیل نہیں ہیں بلکہ اپیکشاتما کرہتے ہیں اور اپنے سنگٹھن کو سب کچھ سمجھتے ہیں سماج کو کچھ نہیں سمجھتے ہیں اور یہ بھی میں میرے وچار سے یہ ایک مرکتہ کا بند ہوں پھر چھٹا بندو چھٹی کسوٹی میں مانتا ہوں کہ وہ اپنی لکش پرابتی کا یا سماج کی لکش پرابتی کا دیش کی لکش پرابتی کا کوئی آکلن نہیں کرتے کہ انہوں نے کیا لکش رکھا تھا اور وہ کیا اطلب ہوا بلکہ وہ لکش ہی بدلتے رہتے ہیں کبھی ایک لکش رکھا پھر اس کو چھوڑ دیا کوئی نیا لکش لے لیا اور وہ پچھلے 
आ, कुछ सालों के भी उनके बयानों और घोषणाओं और नारों में देख सकते हैं कि इनका पिछले नारों घोषणाओं और चिंताओं से विशेष संबंध नहीं है बल्कि एक नया लक्ष्य और नई चिंताएं आ गई इसके अलावा जो मुझे कसौटी के बिंदु लगते हैं कि देश में शिक्षा का जो क्रमशः विध्वंस होता गया उसका राजनीतिकरण होता गया शिक्षा में कम्युनिस्ट विचार भरते गए और उसका हिंदू विरोधी मतवादीकरण होता गया इस पर उन्होंने कभी कोई संघर्ष नहीं किया बल्कि शायद इसका कभी नोटिस भी नहीं लिया कोई मेमोरेंडम तक सरकार को या संस्थाओं को नहीं दिया और इस तरह इसी तरह जो हिंदू मंदिरों पर जो राजकीय कब्जा होता गया और उसका दुरुपयोग किया गया हिंदुओं को उनके धार्मिक अधिकार उनके शैक्षिक अधिकार से वंचित किया गया और ये सामने हुआ ये संविधान में नहीं था ये धीरे धीरे हुआ संविधान की धाराओं को विकृत अर्थ देते हुए हुआ तो ये जो पिछले पचास सालों में हुआ इस पर भी संघ परिवार की कोई संवेदना दिखाई नहीं पड़ती कि उन्होंने इस पर कभी कोई मेमोरेंडम भी दिया कभी कोई विरोध भी किया या कभी इसका नोटिस भी लिया तो मैं समझता हूँ कि ये भी उनके डफर होने का एक कसौटी हो सकता है कि कोई बिल्कुल असंवेदनशील या मूर्ख संगठन या नेता ही ऐसा कर सकते हैं कि इन पिता इन विचारों पर जिस समाज के वो प्रतिनिधि हैं उसकी सबसे मूल अधिकारों पर चोट पड़ती रहे और वो उस पर कुछ बोले तक नहीं कोई उसका नोटिस तक ना दे बल्कि उसमें समर्थन दे क्योंकि तो बहुत से ऐसे काम हुए हैं जिसमें संसद में जनसंघ ने और भारतीय जनता पार्टी ने उसका समर्थन किए जैसे संविधान की धारा पच्चीस से इकतीस को विकृत करते हुए जो अल्पसंख्यक को एक विशेष अधिकार दे दिया गया उस पर उन्होंने कभी कोई बयान नहीं दिया कोई आंदोलन नहीं किया और आज भी वो उसका नोटिस नहीं दे फिर मैं समझता हूं कि यह नितान्त अविश्वसनीय नकारापन है ना समझी कि कि सीधे चोट पड़ने पर हिंदू समाज पर सीधे चोट पड़ने पर कोई विरोध का बयान रिकॉर्ड तक नहीं दिखा सके कि हमने ये प्रस्ताव लिया था या संसद में यह प्रस्ताव रखा था ये नहीं दिखा सके एक और बिंदु मुझे लगता है जो उनके वज्र मूर्ख होने का ही प्रमाण है कि श्री सीताराम गोयल जैसे पुराने सहयोगी जिन्होंने उनके साथ निकट से काम किया जो अप्रतिम विद्वान थे योद्धा थे उनको अगर उनको अगर उन्होंने लंबे समय से जानने के बावजूद अगर वो उनको नहीं पहचान सके और उनके बारे में उन्होंने चूंकि वो बीच बीच में आलोचना करते थे और बिल्कुल सही आलोचना करते थे क्योंकि अगर गलत आलोचना करते तो ये बड़ा आसान है किसी विद्वान को किसी लेखक को जो वो राइटिंग में दे रहा है वो बाई डेफिनेशन फॉल्सिफाइबल होता है मतलब अगर उसकी बात गलत है तो आप आसानी से उसे गलत साबित कर सकते हैं लेकिन उसको गलत साबित करने के बजाय गुपचुप तरीके से उनके बारे में उनका चरित्र हनन करना कि वो किसी बाहरी शक्ति के एजेंट हैं या किसी विदेशी ताकत के लिए काम कर रहे हैं या बहुत वो चुपचाप पैसे बना रहे हैं इस तरह की आलोचना करके या अगर आज आज से जोड़ दिया जाए क्योंकि वो प्रवृत्ति आज भी उनमें है आज भी वो कहते हैं कि या तो वो मूर्ख है ज्ञानचंद है अपने आप को बड़ा बुद्धिजीवी समझता है या फिर उसको कुछ नहीं मिला वो बिकना चाहता है लेकिन उसको किसी ने मोल नहीं लगाया इस तरह के जो आरोप लगाए जाते हैं मैं समझता हूं कि किसी बड़े विद्वान के बारे में ऐसा कहना एक और वह भी ऐसा विद्वान जो कि उनके निकट काम करता रहा है लंबे समय तक करता रहा है और आज भी ऐसे लोग हैं आज भी ऐसे लोग हैं श्री सीताराम गोयल की परंपरा के जो संघ परिवार के साथ निकट से काम करते रहे हैं उनको वो पर्सनली जानते हैं नहीं भी अगर जानते हैं तो उनको जांच सकते हैं लेकिन उनके बारे में गुपचुप रूप से अपने कार्यकर्ताओं को नकारात्मक विशेषण से बताते हैं कि वो ऐसा है वो ऐसा है और उनकी लिखी हुई बातों का कोई उत्तर नहीं दे मैं समझता हूं कि ये एक तरह की स्पष्ट प्रमाण मुझे जैसा दिखता है कि जो व्यक्ति जो लेखक जो विद्वान सीताराम गोयल का अगर उदाहरण ले तो जिसने एक ऐतिहासिक सेवा की समाज की देश की हिंदू समाज की विशेषकर और विद्वता के क्षेत्र में तो अतुलनीय उनके वॉइस ऑफ इंडिया से जो सौ टाइटल छपे हैं सिर्फ उन पर सरसरी नजर डाल के देखा जा सकता है कि किसी ने इतना बड़ा काम नहीं किया अगर वैसे व्यक्ति का आप उनके उनकी जन्म सती पर भी स्मरण नहीं करते हैं उनके नाम से आप एक छोटी सी कोई साहित्यिक या बौद्धिक या शैक्षिक संस्था नहीं बनाते उनको औपचारिक सम्मान भी नहीं देते हैं 
और उनके जीते जी उनके बारे में नकारात्मक और झूठे प्रचार करके अपने स्वयंसेवकों को अपने कार्यकर्ताओं को भी बरगलाते हैं तो मेरे विचार से जितना मैंने समझा है ये परम मूर्खता का ही उदाहरण है कि आप अपने सबसे बड़े सहयोगी सबसे मूल्यवान सहयोगी और समाज और देश के लिए और धर्म के लिए इतने कीमती व्यक्ति का न केवल सम्मान नहीं करते न केवल आपने उनके नाम से कोई स्मारक नहीं बनाया न केवल आपने उनको कोई देश के सामने लाने की कोशिश नहीं की जिनका आपने स्वयं लाभ उठाया है और ये स्वयं संघ के पुराने लोग लोग जानते हैं और आज भी स्वीकार करते हैं बल्कि बातचीत में आ, कहते भी हैं कि हम हमने उनसे बहुत सीखा और हमने आ, उनकी उनका बड़ा सम्मान किया तो इतना कहने के बावजूद अगर आप उनके बारे में जो उन्होंने अपने झूठे लाछन जो अपने लोगों के बीच फैलाए थे उनको आपने आज तक उसके लिए क्षमा नहीं मांगी और आज भी आप उनको उनकी बातों को जो मूल्यवान है जिनसे वास्तव में हिंदू समाज के शत्रुओं आ, का आ, का मुकाबला हो सकता है चर्च मिशनों का इस्लाम का कम्युनिज्म का नेहरूवाद का सेकुलरवाद का देश के ही पैमाने पर नहीं बल्कि अंतरराष्ट्रीय रूप से जैसा कि डेविड फ्रॉले और कुमराड और कुछ अन्य लोगों ने भी कहा है कि इस्लाम और क्रिश्चियनिटी की जो समालोचना श्री सीताराम गोयल और रामस्वरूप जी ने की वो विश्व में किसी ने नहीं की है और हो सकता है आने वाले समय में जो इस क्रिश्चियनिटी और इस्लाम का जो सर्वोत्तम एकेडमिक और पॉलिटिकल एनालिसिस है वो पाया जाएगा कि सबसे अधिक सबसे प्रमाणिक और सबसे महत्वपूर्ण सबसे गंभीर सबसे मौलिक ये वॉइस ऑफ इंडिया से ही रामस्वरूप जी ने ही और श्री सीताराम गोयल ने ही की तो इस शिक्षा को जो आज भी संदर्भ सामयिक है जिसका आज बहुत बड़ा संदर्भ है पूरी दुनिया आज जिहाद से परेशान है स्वयं मुस्लिम विश्व में इस परेशानी को देखा जा रहा है ऐसे समय में सीताराम गोयल और रामस्वरूप जी की बातों को न केवल भारत में बल्कि दुनिया में दूसरी भाषाओं तक में प्रकाशित करना इसको प्रसारित करना उस पर लोगों का ध्यान आकृष्ट करना एक बहुत बड़ी सेवा हो सकती थी मानवता की और हिंदू समाज की रक्षा के लिए तो वो होता ही उसको बिल्कुल ही नोटिस तक नहीं लेना बल्कि ऐसा लगता है कि वो उनके बिल्कुल मस्तिष्क में ही नहीं है रेडार पर ही नहीं है शायद उनके उन्होंने इसको समझा तक नहीं है कि ये कितना मूल्यवान काम है अगर ये स्थिति है तो मेरे अपने मूल्यांकन से भी यह परम मूर्खता के अलावा और कुछ नहीं कहा जा सकता कि आपके हाथ में वज्र जैसा अमोघ हस्त हथियार हो और आप डंडा और छड़ी खोजते फिर रहे हो पूरे देश में जमा करते फिर रहे हो और उसको आप उसका आप इस्तेमाल तो छोड़िए आप उसको छिपाने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं बल्कि उसको आप एक तरह से लांछित करने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं ऐसे भी आज यूनिवर्सिटी में काम करने वाले ऐसे स्वयं सेवक हैं जो कहते हैं कि नहीं नहीं वो सब वो सब चीजें मत पढ़ो अपने कार्यकर्ताओं को कहते हैं और जो ये पार्टी के जो पर्चे और झूठ मूठ के प्रचार होते हैं नेताओं के वो उस पर पूरा ध्यान केंद्रित करते हैं अगर आज ये स्थिति है जब बंगाल में कश्मीर में केरल में यहाँ तक कि बिहार यूपी जैसी जगहों में भी जिहाद की चोट अब हिंदुओं को जलाने लगी है और नए सिरे से वो स्थिति आ रही है जो उन्नीस सौ चालीस से सैतालीस के बीच थी अगर ऐसी स्थिति में संघ के ऐसे स्वयं सेवक भाजपा के ऐसे कार्यकर्ता जो बौद्धिकों के बीच में काम करते हैं यूनिवर्सिटी में काम करते हैं अगर उनको इस बात का सेंस नहीं है कि सीताराम गोयल और वॉइस इंडिया के काम कितने मूल्यवान है और उनको कितनी सहायता पहुंचा सकते हैं हिंदू समाज को और देश को उसकी कितनी आवश्यकता है अगर उनको इस बात का अंदाजा नहीं है अगर उनकी जन्म सती पर संघ और भाजपा के बड़े लीडर एक मामूली ट्वीट नहीं कर सकते एक मामूली शुभकामनाएं मामूली बधाई नहीं दे सकते मैं तो यही समझता हूँ कि श्री सीताराम गोयल ने जो संघ का मूल्यांकन किया था वो अब बिल्कुल सही साबित हुआ है और उनके उनकी नई पीढ़ियां भी वही काम कर रही हैं जो उनकी पुरानी पीढ़ियों ने काम किया चूंकि उनकी पुरानी पीढ़ियों के नेताओं के काम अब छिपा लिए गए हैं जैसा आप देख सकते हैं कि वो स्वयं अपने नेताओं की बात को भी कैंसिल कर देते हैं स्वयं नेताओं को कैंसिल करने की कोशिश करते हैं जब वो सत्ता से बाहर हो जाते हैं या मेन लाइन से छूट जाते हैं तो ये एक तरह की मूर्ता ही है जो मैं समझता हूँ कि पूरी दुनिया में डेमोक्रेटिक वर्ल्ड में कहीं इस तरह से नहीं होता यह सिर्फ कम्युनिस्ट देशों का प्रचलन रहा है कि स्टालिन 
चले गए तो स्टालिन के सिर पर सारी चीजें डाल करके पार्टी को कहा जाए कि पार्टी तो बहुत अच्छी है वो स्टालिन बुरा था उसी तरह और उसी तरह चीन में हुआ उसी तरह ईस्ट यूरोप के कई देशों में हुआ ये कम्युनिस्ट परंपरा है कि नेताओं को इतना अधिक महत्व देना पहले उनको देवताओं की तरफ पूजा करना और फिर बेचारे जब वो सत्ता से बाहर हो जाए या उनकी कोई गलत या मूर्खताएं या भयानक काम उनके सामने आए तो उनको उन्हीं को छोड़ देना ये संघ परिवार ने ये नीति अपना रखी है छोटे और मंझोले पैमाने पर ये कई बार कई नेताओं के साथ देखा जा चुका है तो मैं तो यही महसूस करता हूँ कि सीताराम गोयल ने जो संघ के का जो मूल्यांकन किया है संघ के साथ जो अपने अनुभव लिखे हैं और उनको आज के घटनाओं से मिला करके देखना चाहिए उन्होंने अपनी किताब अपनी पुस्तकों में जहां तहाँ जो टिप्पणियां की है और खास करके ये टाइम फॉर स्टॉक टेकिंग विदर संघ परिवार वो आज बिल्कुल ही सामयिक दस्तावेज है और जिसमें स्वयं कम से कम 20-25 प्रतिशत सामग्रियां संघ के पुराने लोगों द्वारा लिखी गई हैं बल्कि उसका मूल दस्तावेज तो संघ के ही एक प्रखर व्यक्ति का लिखा हुआ है जो आज भी सक्रिय है डॉक्टर श्री रंगोट गोले उन सारे बिंदुओं को और खास करके हाल के दो वर्षो में जो इस्लाम पर और मुसलमानों पर संघ के नेता खास करके और भाजपा के नेता भी जो सत्ता में है वो जो बयान देते रहे हैं जिस पर स्वयं संघ के कई लोग निराशा व्यक्त करते हैं उन सबको जोड़ करके आज उसकी समीक्षा करने का फिर से उसका अध्ययन करने का अवसर है अगर जिनके पास साधन हो जिनके पास अवसर हो संस्थाएं हो उनको तो उन चीजों को भारत की अन्य भाषाओं में भी ला करके लोगों पर लोगों को खुला विचार विमर्श करने के लिए कहना चाहिए और इसको बिल्कुल इमरजेंसी एक्टिविटी के रूप में लेना चाहिए बिल्कुल जैसे आपातकाल आ गया क्योंकि मैं सोवियत और अंतरराष्ट्रीय अध्ययन का विद्यार्थी रहा हूं मैं आपको प्रमाणिक रूप से बता सकता हूं कि दुनिया में कई बार बहुत बड़ी राजनीतिक उथल पुथल बिल्कुल निःशब्द हुई है दो साल पहले एक साल पहले चार महीने पहले तक किसी को पता नहीं होता था कि कितनी कितना बड़ा परिवर्तन होने वाला है तो मैं तो यही समझता हूँ कि अगर सीताराम गोयल जी की बातें उनके मूल्यांकन गलत थे तब तो चिंता की कोई बात नहीं है लेकिन कल्पना कीजिए कि अगर उनकी बात सही है वह बात जो उन्होंने संघ के बारे में कहा था कि वह एक ऐसे ट्रैप में ले जा रहा है जिससे हिंदू नहीं निकल सकेगा और जब वो कहते हैं कि ये हिंदू समाज का पतन निश्चित है अगर संघ और भाजपा का पतन नहीं होता अगर ये दो बातें कल्पना कीजिए कि अगर यह सही है तो इसके कितने भयावह निष्कर्ष इसीलिए इस पर इसी दृष्टि से सोचना चाहिए कि अगर ये गलत है तो चिंता की कोई बात नहीं है हम इसकी इस पर विचार विमर्श करके इसको भूल जाएंगे लेकिन अगर यह सही है तो कितनी बड़ी कितना बड़ा खतरा हमारे सामने है मैं आपको यही निवेदन करना चाहता हूँ कि जैसे सोवियत संघ का विघटन हुआ जैसे चीन में माओ के आने के बाद हुआ जैसे अफगानिस्तान में हुआ जैसे सीरिया में हुआ और ऐसी बहुत यहाँ तक कि भारत का विभाजन भी ऐसी ही घटना है मैंने पढ़ा है कि उन्नीस के फरवरी मार्च तक लोग पाकिस्तान की बात को जोक समझते थे और विद इन टू थ्री मंथ्स पूरे बंगाल सिंध पूरे बंगाल सिंध पंजाब और कश्मीर के हिंदू और सिख गाजर मूली की तरह मारे गए तो ऐसा होता है इतिहास में ऐसा हुआ है इतिहास में और स्वयं हमारे यहाँ हुआ है मैं समझता हूँ कि छह महीने पहले लोग कल्पना भी नहीं कर सकते होंगे कि बंगाल में विधानसभा चुनाव के बाद क्या होगा इसलिए ऐसी चीजें आकस्मिक होती हैं और वो इसीलिए होती हैं जिस पर सीताराम गोयल ने बहुत ही तरह तरह से लिखा है उन्होंने हिंदू समाज के कर्तव्य के बारे में हिंदू सोसाइटी अंडर सीज हिंदू सोसाइटी के कर्तव्य इन पर जो बातें उन्होंने कही है उसमें उन्होंने बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण टिप्पणी दी है कि जब आपका विरोधी जो हिंदू समाज का विरोधी है या किसी भी देश का विरोधी है शत्रु है अगर उसको यह मालूम है कि हम जिस पर हमला करने वाले हैं वो तैयार है तो उसका हमला टल जाता है वो पीछे हट जाता है लेकिन अगर उसको ये आइडिया मिल जाता है कि हमारा शत्रु जिस पर हम हमला करने जा रहे हैं वो बिल्कुल सोया हुआ है आत्मुग्ध है अपने में आनंदित है अपनी बढ़ाई पर खुद आनंद मजा रहा है जलसा कर रहा है तो उसका हमला और नजदीक आता है और बढ़ता है तो कम से कम इन चेतावनियों को ध्यान में रखते हुए मैं यही अनुरोध करना चाहता हूं सभी लोगों से 
संघ परिवार के नेताओं से भाजपा के नेताओं से खास करके उनके कार्यकर्ताओं से खास करके कि अभी उनके पास साधन है अभी उनके पास समय है अभी समाज के पास अवसर है कि वे सीताराम गोयल की बात को गलत साबित करके दिखाएं क्योंकि तो अगर वह सही साबित होगी तो फिर पूरे भारत के लिए ही नहीं वो विश्व के लिए अंधेरे की बात हो सकती है तो ये बात चाहे कितनी भी अकाल्पनीय लगे लेकिन राजनीति एक ऐसा विषय है जिसके बारे में मैक्स वेबर ने कहा था वो तो बड़े सोशियोलॉजिस्ट थे उन्नीस में आज से सौ साल पहले उन्होंने म्यूनिख में म्यूनिख विश्वविद्यालय में दो दो व्याख्यान दिए थे पॉलिटिक्स एज ए वोकेशन एंड साइंस एज ए वोकेशन साइंस का मतलब एकेडमिक्स स्कॉलरशिप वो दोनों आप पढ़ करके देखिए उसमें वह कहते हैं कि ये पॉलिटिक्स में शैतानी शक्तियां काम करती हैं और भयावह विध्वंस कभी भी हो सकते हैं जो इसको नहीं समझता है वेबर कहता है कि वो दुधमुहा बच्चा है इज ए टॉडलर इनफैक्ट मुझे ऐसा लगता है जो मेरा अनुभव है राजनीति का राजनीति शास्त्र का अंतर्राष्ट्रीय अध्ययन का और भारत में जो राजनीतिक घटनाक्रम है जितना मैंने उसको देखा समझा पढ़ा है मैं महसूस करता हूं कि हमारे देश में ऐसे टॉडलर्स ऐसे इन्फ्रेंट्स बहुत बड़े बड़े पदों पर रहे हैं और लगभग यही मूल्यांकन श्री सीताराम गोयल जी ने भी किया तो ये अवसर है जैसा भारतीय परंपरा सिखाती है कि हम जब अपने महापुरुषों का को स्मरण करते हैं उनकी जी, उनका जीवन याद करते हैं उनको श्रद्धांजलि देते हैं तो उनका चेहरा मोहरा उनकी मूर्ति बनाना उनका नाम जपने से ज्यादा ज्यादा मूल्यवान है उन्होंने जो कहा उस पर विचार करें और मैं यही अनुरोध करना चाहता हूँ कि सीताराम गोयल जी के जो विचार हिंदू समाज के बारे में है इस्लाम के बारे में है क्रिश्चियन मिशन के बारे में है वामपंथ के बारे में है नेहरूवाद के बारे में है और संघ परिवार के बारे में इन सारी बातों को इकट्ठा करके देशवासियों तक पहुंचाना चाहिए हर भाषा में उसको लाने की कोशिश करनी चाहिए उस पर खुला विचार विमर्श करना चाहिए और यह साफ दिखाना चाहिए कि उनकी कौन सी बात कैसे गलत है और अगर वह सही है तो युद्ध की मुद्रा में हमें उससे उसका निपटारा करने उसका उपाय करने में लगना चाहिए 24 घंटे नेताओं का पार्टी का संगठन का गुणगान करना ये बहुत 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 बड़ी डफरनेस है बहुत बड़ी मूर्खता है और ये मैं प्रमाणिक रूप से कह सकता हूँ कि सोवियत संघ में कम से कम स्टालिन के बाद उन्नीस से लेकर के खुशेव के बाद तो बिल्कुल नियमित रूप से उन्नीस से उन्नीस तक पूरे 25 साल सिर्फ यही काम हुआ था जो संघ परिवार के लोग करते रहते पार्टी का गुणगान पार्टी नेता का की तस्वीर पार्टी नेता के नाम पर स्मारक सड़क चौराहा बिल्डिंग योजना ये हु बहु कम्युनिस्ट बीमारी है और यही करते हुए वो 25 साल रहे और ये भी कहते रहे कि दुनिया में साम्राज्य साम्राज्यवाद पूंजीवाद खत्म होने वाला है और समाजवाद आने वाला है मैं लगभग वही भावना देखता हूँ कि भारत विश्व विरुद्ध होने वाला है पूरी दुनिया हमारे संगठन से चमत्कृत है पूरी दुनिया हमारे नेता से अभिभूत है और ये मैं साफ साफ देख रहा हूँ कि जिस तरह से सोवियत संघ भीतर रूस भीतर से खोखला होता जा रहा था 1970 के दशक में 1980 के शुरुआती दशक में और उनके इक्का दुक्का नेता इसको समझ भी रहे थे लेकिन कुछ इसका उपाय नहीं कर पाए क्योंकि तो उन्होंने स्वयं अपने आप को बुद्धि से विहीन कर लिया था उन्होंने स्वयं अपने आप को डफर बना लिया था वो तो एक अलग विषय है मैं उस पर विस्तार से कभी बोल सकता हूँ कि सोवियत संघ ने अपनी कथित समाजवादी शिक्षा प्रणाली बनाकर अपने आप को कितना खाली कर लिया और उससे सीख करके किस तरह से चाइना ने अपने आप को बचाने की कोशिश की है अभी तक वहां की कम्युनिस्ट पार्टी ने मैं समझता हूं कि यहाँ के संघ परिवार को सोवियत अनुभव से सीखने की जरूरत है और सीताराम गोयल की तमाम चेतावनियों को गंभीरता से लेने की जरूरत है अपने नेतृत्व में अपने तमाम कथित बौद्धिक थिंक टैंकों को देकर उस पर विचार विमर्श करवाने की जरूरत है अगर वो ऐसा नहीं करते तो मेरे विचार में जितना मैं समझ पाया हूँ वो सीताराम गोयल जी के मूल्यांकन को शत प्रतिशत सही साबित कर रहे मैं अपनी बात समय सीमा के कारण अभी यहीं समाप्त करता हूँ और अगर इस पर कोई विचार बिंदु हो कोई आपत्ति हो कोई प्रश्न हो तो मैं उसका उत्तर देने की कोशिश करूंगा आप सबों को एक बार बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद 
खास करके कुनराट को जिन्होंने ये कष्ट लिया और इस कॉन्फ्रेंस का आयोजन किया जो कायदे से भारत के किसी विद्वान संस्था एकेडमी को करना चाहिए था वो कुनराट एल्स्ट ने किया जो श्री सीताराम गोयल के संभवतः सबसे प्रमाणिक आज प्रतिनिधि है जो हमारा मार्गदर्शन कर रहे हैं अपनी क्षमता भर लोगों को जगाने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं मैं उनको बहुत बहुत विशेष धन्यवाद देता हूं आप सबों का धन्यवाद जी सुशांत जी यस थैंक यू डॉक्टर थैंक यू डॉक्टर शंकर शरण जी आपके सत्यनिष्ठ और प्रखर विचारों के लिए मैं आपका आभारी हूँ और मुझ जैसे जो नवयुवक हैं और जो समझना चाहते हैं संघ के ढांचे को और द कंटेम्प्रेरी इश्यूज दैट द सिविलाइजेशन इज फेसिंग आपने जो प्रकाश डाला उसके लिए बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट एनी क्वेश्चन एनी कमेंट्स फ्रॉम द पैनलिस और yeah if 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 there are any uh, commentaries or questions uh... yeah i would like to see yes uh, yes chikan yes ah, jo aapne kaha wo sach hai jo sitaram goel ji ne likha tha hindu society under siege lekin abhi ek itna aur ek naya force hindu society ke khilaf jo taiyar ho gaya hai that is the bjp government at the center it is more dangerous than all the other forces because when the other forces attack hinduism hindus will unite against it speak against it and when the bjp does that same thing in power then the all those very same hindus put a hand on their mouth and keep quiet and in fact support it and try to think of ways of defending these actions or glory even glorifying these actions and if any hindu outside that uh, circle tries to do something jaise ki abhi uh, some a few people went to the supreme court to protest against the lakhs of crores of rupees which are being distributed as minority schemes and the central government went into the court and put a stop to them put the stop on those hindus not on that those schemes then recently in tamil nadu and uh, andhra we know that uh, in andhra with the support of the government the people are being converted right and left to christianity and uh, recently a film was this month only i think has been taken out um, rudra uh, something uh, rudra tanda or something and uh, that has is exposing the conversion game in tamil nadu and the central ministry central government ministry has gone to court and tried to ban this film because it will create enmities among people so why should we blame muslims or christians for doing what after all is their duty they are doing it for their thing and i don't blame the bjp also strictly speaking because they want to come to power they know this is the way to come to power and they are succeeding even the sang parivar they are succeeding very grandly i think unko murkh ka kehna kuch matlab nahi hai they wo bahut hoshiyar hain murkh hai jo unko ye sab karke vote karte hain mera to kehna hai ki kal agar ye government gas chambers aur concentration camps bana ke usme hindu sadhu santon ko dalna shuru kiya to bhi unke samarthak unko samarthak samarthan karenge kisi bhi tarah se uske liye koi justification hi nahi glorification bhi karenge isliye i think we um, we have to of course point out uh, what sitaram goel has already set out but we have to progress a bit beyond that now based on present circumstances ye mera comment tha question nahi tha sorry sir thank you thank you yeah that is very valuable thank you sir uh ji 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 you have a question or a comment please please go ahead yeah uh, so it was a very illuminating talk by shankar sharan ji and uh, uh, what i what i have it's an observation and as as, as a like a question like uh, currently uh, with uh, mohan bhagwat ji uh, mentioning about uh, the dna remark like uh, everybody is the same dna kind of remark and i see a, l- a large amount of deviation that has happened in the rss uh, policies uh, compared to what sitaram goel has mentioned so is it possible like uh, for us uh, uh, to uh, recommend like for example uh, like if at all uh, the rss has to do its function uh, it has to be faithful to uh, one of its uh, great leaders uh, sitaram goel and uh, uh, take this uh, uh, whatever uh, discoveries he has made uh, with respect to abrahamism it has to become the the policy of uh, the central policy of rss but what we are seeing is the directly opposite so is the you have any comment on this i don't have any special comment i think the most important thing has been already 
uh, uh, spoken by Srikant Talageri ji, that uh, yes, uh, we do understand that when our own people do something which is unexpected attack on ourselves, we feel uh, helpless because as he rightly said, that if enemy says something, you are ready to fight, you do not hesitate. But when your own friends whom you have supported, whom you know, who, are, who have been kind to you and you to them, when they do the same thing, it becomes a, such an unbelievable situation that you feel uh, totally helpless. And there is one, one more thing, that, that is the penchant for uh, organizing. I have seen, and uh, uh, yesterday I was reading uh, 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 Sir Sang Chala Sudarsan Ji's interview with uh, Sekhar Gupta. And there he says, that I don't remember, I don't know exactly number how many sang, how many organizations we have. Sang Parivar has created so many organizations that they don't have even the number for themselves. Their top person says that we don't know. What I see in this is that they they capture every space, whether it is academics, oh, military, army, uh, sorry, police, uh, school education, college education, even culture, film, and do nothing or do the party propaganda, exactly like the Soviet Communist Party or the uh, leftist uh, cultural educational organizations in India that they used to create uh, IPTA, educational and uh, teachers front and everywhere it was a communist propaganda, nothing else. So the same penchant is with the Sangh Parivar. They create a, uh, for instance, last week I was uh, looking into a magazine. They said that it is for uh, X, uh, army men. So I thought maybe something about army is there. The very first article was how a son so and sevak is uh, doing work at the, some uh, disaster place. So every space they capture and they do nothing except the party propaganda, which I believe is one more uh, negative and harmful trend because we do not find the space for ourselves. And there are so many people who have uh, witnessed and they gave the testimony that if at all someone tries to do something, uh, Sangh people try to either capture that thing or try to uh, sabotage that work. It has been experienced in Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, and so many places which I came to know. So I would just uh, uh, concur with you and uh, what uh, Srikanji Talagiriji said that yes, I feel the situation is bad, and uh, actually, I do not know how to tackle it. Thank you. Ah, Susanji, please carry on. Yeah, uh, Ramakrishnan ji, Dr. Ramakrishnan uh, Sitaraman has a comment or a question. Yeah, uh, this is just a small fact that uh, should be important, especially given what uh, Sri uh, Talagari has said. Uh, the, the most recent manifesto, election manifesto of the BJP has removed the Article 30 issue. That is what I noted. Because in some of the earlier manifestos of the Bharati Jansang as well as the Bharati Janata Party, the issue of making Article 30 more equitable and uh, giving uh, Hindu organizations and uh, ed educational institutions the same footing as uh, autonomy as other minority and linguistic and uh, religious minorities has been shelved. Officially, it has been shelved because it no longer appears in the 2019 manifest election manifest. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you. I think uh, we can. Uh, uh, Sridanga Godbole ji and uh, Jatayu B uh, have some comments or questions. Uh, can they uh, uh, ask the questions? Uh, Sridhiva ji, can we allow them? Uh, is there a. Sridhiva ji? Shishanji? Ha, uh, 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 from the attendees, we have two hands that are raised. Uh, 
Yeah. So yeah. you want me to hello them? Uh, I think Shilanga Godboli ji is one of them. So if you of can, allow, yeah. Yeah. Shilang, <coughs> I I'm allowing him. Yes, yes. You can allow him. Yeah. Uh, Namaste, Shilanga ji. You can go ahead and ask your question uh, or any comments that you have. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You're audible. Uh, if you can a bit uh, speak a bit louder, I think the voice is very low. But yeah, please, uh, please go ahead and uh, if you have any comments or questions, please go ahead. So, in a way, uh, I mean, my name was also mentioned there, and uh, in a way, probably I was to some extent instrumental in uh, sort of raising the question of the policy of the Sangha vis-a-vis -vis Islam and Christianity. Uh, and many of the points that Shankarji raised are absolutely valid. I take them. But I have two or three comments to make. See, it is easy to stay on the sidelines and criticize the Sangha, you know. But that, uh, according to me, that doesn't help, you know. All said and done, it is a large Hindu organization with commitment of thousands of uh, sincere Hindus, okay. Now, if you want them to change, the important thing is to remain in the Sangha and effect that change, which I have been attempting to make. I'll give you a few examples. And change has occurred. It will be unfair to say that the Sangha has not changed since 1997, when I first wrote that booklet. And I continue to raise these issues in the Sangha, but by remaining within the Sangha. And it makes it, it's of no use calling people duffers or you know have brainless and expect them to change. That puts them off. If you want people to change, you have to use a little tact, you have to temper your language, and you have to do your things quietly in your own way, and change occurs. I'll give you my own example. Uh, it might seem that I'm uh, blowing my trumpet, but that's not it. I'm just illustrating. Even when Sitaji was alive. We got his, uh, you know, the book on jihad by Suhas Majumdar translated into Marathi by an RSS publishing house. And the RSS publishing house launched a campaign. And in those times, 25,000 copies of that book was, was sold by a campaign launched by RSS Swainshev. I have myself written books on Islam and Christianity based on the insights I've received from Ram Sarupji and Sitaram Goel. And those books have been taken up by the Sangha, translated into several languages, and they have been propagated throughout now. Uh, even in Pune, for example, now, in fact, I head the Research Center for Islam and Christianity, and we draw our inspiration from Sitaram Goel and Ram Surup. But we receive our funding and all the logistical support from the Sangha. And we do, uh, I'm not free to tell you what all we do. It's not just academic, but there are many more things we do about uh, the Muslim organizations and Muslim individuals and various things, which I would not like to go into detail at and divulge at this point in time. So the important thing, if you want to change the Sangha, you should remain in it and effect that change rather than stay on the sidelines and simply <clears throat> abuse it. Makes it, It's of no use. So this is the important thing I wanted to make. You, you, my personal experience is you can effect that change. And while there are people who criticize Sitaram Goel in the Sangh, I know several hundreds of people and very senior people who have highest regard for both Ram Sarup and Sitaram Goel and propagate his ideas. And even Sudarshanji, in fact, Sitaji told me once, would visit him often and buy his books by the dozen and distribute them personally. So the fact that uh, even a person like Ram Sarup who is a Rishi, just like Sitaram Goel, differed with Sitaram Goel on two issues. This is what Sitaji himself told me. One issue was Gandhi. According to Sitaram Goel, he changed his opinion later. Gandhi was an unmitigated disaster for the Hindus. But in his earlier writings, if you see Sitaram Goel's views on Gandhiji were different. But Ram Surup had high regard for Gandhiji. And the second point of difference was the Sangha. In fact, in one of my meetings with both of them, when Ram Sarup, Sitaram Goel, and myself were present, Sitaram Goel started criticizing the Sangha. Ram Sarup walked out of the room. And Sitaram Goel said, see, he walks out of the room. He doesn't like what I say. So what I'm trying to say is, if a Rishi like Ram Sarup can have a different opinion about the Sangha, 
surely there has to be some merit in it so this is all i want to say it's difficult it's easy to criticize the sun it's difficult to deal with people you know when see it's difficult for, it's easy for an academician to criticize but if you stay in an organization and you have to deal with different kinds of people with different temperaments and different backgrounds it's a very difficult thing to bring everyone you know to your on your page and you know expect them to work as you are doing it's difficult on the ground so what i would say is most of the people who criticize the sang including the very distinguished panel have not actually gone into the sang you know and spent time there you're criticizing from the sideline i have been in the sang and continue to be in the sang and still criticize and raise issues even with mohan bagwat in a one to one uh, meeting when i have with him but i do this from the inside i don't go on the sideline and start criticizing the sang if you want to change the sang go inside and do what you want to do don't sit on the sidelines and criticize it it makes it's of no use you know and especially calling them duffers or brainless people you know you know it makes no use it puts people off so it's counterproductive that's all i want to say thank you thank you shrianga ji uh, i think uh, raghavan jagannathan ji has a comment or a question and then dr elst uh, please mm-hmm. raghavan ji please if you can uh, sir your mic uh, has to be uh, unmuted uh, please do that uh, uh, i have two points to make and uh, broadly like to take off from where uh, god village football ji mesh uh, talked i think uh, uh, i think to uh, it's not a great idea to um, attack the sang beyond a point suppose they were just another hindu sect with their own idea let's say they were tantric or something uh, many hindus would not agree with tantrism or something like that but you would still say okay they are part of the larger group right so we uh, hindus have an enormous capacity to self destruct by targeting our own people just because let's say they have a different view on it by that yaar sikh we should target the arya samaj also because they only accepted the authority of the vedas and said everything else from the upanishads there is all nonsense and that the, only this is correct and that kind of this kind of fundamentally suppose then you can target iskon because they have taken a slightly more abrahamic approach to hinduism so my point is today it is far better to uh, uh, have the sang and try and talk <coughs> our ideas into them rather than try and think that they are something that needs demolishing they are uh, in their own way they think they are doing the right thing i think we should criticize them i have criticized them even in fact uh, just a few days ago swarajya we published an article by nageshwar rao where we made a difference between uh, uh, you know hindutva and pseudo hindutva so the point is like uh, we need to Uh, criticize them challenge them on to the intellectual plane and see where they think they're going wrong but to treat them uh, as enemies is a huge huge mistake because we have a hindus have a s- enormous capacity to shoot ourselves in the foot and fight among ourselves and make sure that the only guys who win are our enemies so my thing is i don't regard them as enemy though i do feel that they need a lot of education and i am happy to be part of that whenever is possible whenever i have interacted i have tried to do that i am not of course not of course interacted that's my only point but i certainly certainly think that some of the criticism is well deserved whether it's from sitaram ji when he was around and or for that matter when uh, 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 dr rails and others and uh, talagiri uh, all say that absolutely i buy that uh, argument and the criticism needs to be driven even maybe hard harshly but we should not treat them as somebody beyond the pale or that they are actually trying to destroy us i don't think that is the case i think you you need to treat them like just another sect that has got his own approach to how they think they need to defend me in fact i asked myself one simple question today if i had the choice between wishing away the entire sun and uh, having them there what would i choose i say if it's a binary choice i would say they are better there we are probably better off with them being there somewhere in the horizon than not having them at all in that case we will be busy only killing each other not doing anything useful for society thank you can i say something yeah sure yeah see uh, i don't think we should not have them at all we should have them as in the opposition because then when the congress does whatever it is doing they will oppose it but when they are doing anti hindu acts obviously the congress and the leftists will not oppose and obviously their own people will not oppose so no one is opposing so we absolutely. are on the complete losing side yeah and absolutely you know we have a saying in konkani chimana thamana pot bharwada 
you say chi you say cha but you give me plenty you have to eat let my stomach be full and for the bjp it doesn't care how much you curse them or what you say and in fact many of their supporters do that they criticize them at other times and when elections come they go and vote for them they know that that is the only thing they want they don't care what you say so then why will they change themselves so you see the this saying that we'll criticize them but uh, there is no alternative is just like saying okay let them continue we'll no, no. Uh, do a little criticism to appease people who are uh, angry that's no. there's no sense in that if you ask me no no not and, like uh, for that for example let us take uh, no no i am i am yeah. okay if somebody wants to start a second sang i have no issue with that yeah. i would happily back it but whether you want to have that because you will have shades of opinion on all sides i don't think uh, hindus are the type to want a single monochromatic view of anything so uh, it is actually in character for us Uh, so shan can you see at the moment at uh, the moment uh, uh, if a few hindus go to court to protest against minority this thing or to protest or they uh, actually produce take the trouble to produce a film about conversion in tamil nadu it is a central government which is coming and putting they do, uh, leftists don't have to lift a finger yeah it is a central government which is in power with our votes are uh, not my vote let me be clear but you know hindu votes it yeah, is yeah. they who are doing all this and putting a stop to other hindus from doing anything Absolutely. so i think it is futile i think we can each in our own field continue doing what are we are doing and that is all right but saying that uh, you know some people are fools they are not understanding they are not fools they are very clever they are they know that the only thing they want is to come to power they know how to do it and they are doing it who are the fools is the question <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, uh, I think uh, there are uh, two hands that are raised. Uh, Jatayu uh, G has to say something, but before that, uh, I think uh, uh, Shank, uh, Dr. Sharan, if you allow me, uh, uh, Dr. Elst has to say something. He has raised his mm -hmm. hand. Uh, can we do that? And after that, you can uh, go I and. Think, uh, I think this is the uh, time. Uh, our time is going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, uh, so I would suggest that uh, let Conrad finish the uh, finish the yes, uh, yes. session, and uh, before that, I should comment on that uh, what uh, Guru okay. Bolesi has said. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Doctor Elst, uh, can you would you like to uh, then uh, say what you have? Uh, well, yes. Um, we all know what Doctor Godbole uh, reiterated here that there are very many people with uh, Hindu dedication. Uh, that have joined the Sangh, that have joined the BJP even. Um, so this is no news. You know, this is not a new development. I don't see it in particular as the fruit of Godbole's own um, uh, engagement. Uh, but you see, the, the fact that we can all notice that I from afar can't fail to notice is that somehow all this good in Hindu involvement does not rise to the top. And so when you see Mohan Bhagwat's statements, you see they largely outdo any merit that all the ground workers may have. And even worse, of course, is the case of the BJP government. Uh, you know, Modi may be remembered by many Hindus fondly as a man who worked uh, development and so on, but for the Hindu cause, He is now a disaster. You see, Hindus are never going to have the kind of parliamentary majority that they now enjoy. Now is the time to reform the state to the extent that the anti-Hindu discriminations are lifted. This is not being done. So you see, this is the great tragedy that precisely as Dr. Godbole says, there are very many Hindus at the ground level, at the local level, who have their heart in Hinduism. It's at the top where the decisions are made that this is no longer the case. Okay. Uh, uh, Koti ji, if you can allow Jatayu uh, ji to have a small comment, and I would request that uh, Jatayu ji, if you can keep it very brief, because of the paucity of time, we need to have uh, other panelists also express their views. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Koti ji, can you please allow Jatayu ji to? Yeah, please, please go on, Jatayu ji. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, Namaste, Shankar ji. So, uh, I think uh, uh, the the real issue with the Sang Parivar is the Tina factor. There is no alternative. I read this book with her with her Sang Parivar in two thousand one, when I was the Prachar Pramukh 
of the Bangalore IT Milan, and every line in that book made sense to me, but I just didn't have any alternate. So I had a lot of mental uh, uh, dilemma, but I continued to be with the Sang IT Milan, and I still have connections with them. So one question that I want, want to ask you, uh, since you said uh, that uh, uh, Goelji said that unless the Sang and the BJP perishes, the Hindu society is going to do. So did he have any intention of creating an alternative socio-political mass movement to challenge the Sangh? Or did he want the Sangh to reform itself? I mean, since you were very close, you, you people were very close to him, what was there in his mind? Uh, I really want to know that. Okay. Now, can I say, Susan? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But uh, yeah, uh, the time is a factor. Please, uh, please okay, keep that. I, I, I will confine myself. I think uh, Jaggi and Godboleji and uh, this the last commentator, I forgot his name. Jatayuji. Yeah. Uh, Jatayuji. All three uh, spoke uh, from the perspective of the sun. They missed the point that there is a there is a Hindu society outside sun. They cannot force the discipline of sun showing sevak upon an independent and free observer. So what Sitaram Goelji said and what I said, not from the perspective of a member of the organization. Fine, you are a member, you have the discipline, you have the limitation, you have the, your own idea. But you cannot say that you cannot criticize, you cannot comment on an organization until you become a member. That way, that was the logic of Soviet Communist Party. That is the logic of ISIS. That is the logic of Taliban. That is the logic of OIC, that you first become a Muslim and then you will understand the problem of Muslims and Muslim organizations. I totally reject this. They should not uh, confuse this issue of independent Hindu voice and the Sangh voice. From a Sangh perspective, God, Dr. Godbolezi is right, but he is totally wrong if he says that an independent Hindu has no right to criticize the Sangh. It is a totalitarian mindset that until all Hindu become a Hindu, a Sangh supporter or Sangh Swang Sevak, there is no way out. It is 100% Soviet Communist Party view. So please, please, please allow the independent voice and try to prove them wrong on facts and arguments, not on the thing that you are shooting yourself, you are killing yourself, and Hindus have destroyed themselves. Please mind that thing. It is the political mindset and the partisanship which divided the Hindu society. When the Jansang was created, there was already a Hindu society and a Hindu party. Congress party was fully Hindu party. Why you created a, another political party for the same development, for the same secularism, for the same uh, socialism? So you created, you created division. Please understand that. That this mindset of everything comes through Sang and BJP is dividing Hindu society. So please, uh, this here I differ. And then uh, it is not abuse. Sitaram Goyal or Ram Sarup never abused. And I tried to explain that what he meant by duffer. And I said that buddhi vivek ka pryog nahi hona, kathani aur karani mein samanjas nahi rakhna, anubhav se nahi sikhna. I have tried to academically explain his word. And he should, or everybody should try to answer this. And finally, uh, what Kurnad said, that what you are doing in the lower places means nothing. What the leadership decides as a policy and allow as a state, state policy or organization policy, that affects the society. And finally, last word is this, what I said, that if the word is wrong and the word is wrong, then there is nothing. But you should think about it a little bit, that if it is right, then what do you have to do? If you have such a big organization, then what is it for that you say something down, say something down, say something down? Sitaram Goel ji ki kitab hai use kare aur phir vote le kar ke aap exactly wahi kaam kare jo Ovesi karenge, jo Mulayam Singh karenge. I think you should think about this and let Hindu society free to express itself. Don't try to muzzle their criticism. It is in your benefit. And that is what Solzhenitsyn said. Please read Solzhenitsyn. He was abused like this and he was told like this that you be, uh, you feel like, you don't feel like a communist, you don't feel like a Russian. And he proved right, and not the uh, Brezhnev and company. So please try to understand that we are discussing Sitaram Goel. Today, we are not discussing uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee or Deen Dayal Upadhyay or 
Balraj Madhok or your own leaders whom you try to uh, put on the sky. We cannot learn a single thing from th those of your leaders and you yourself shun them. Please try to understand that their words and what we are expressing like Srikant Talagiriji and Kundrat is useful for you. It is not abuse to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, there are many views uh, regarding this topic. And yes, it is a very crucial topic. Uh, but I think uh, the time also is an important factor. So with all due respect and a, a humble request I would make to all the panelists, uh, can we go ahead? Uh, is that OK? Uh, Dr. Else, should we uh, move ahead? Uh, Yes, yeah, Shishant, I think you sh we should move ahead. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Sir. In thank fact, you. even I could pitch in because uh, I, I am a consultant for Seva International. Yeah. So I am both an insider and outsider. I have some views on these <laughs> matters, but we can go on, yeah. you know, till the cows come everyone, home. But everyone, I think we yeah, can move yeah, on. Yeah, thank yeah. Everyone gets enriched, but yeah, the time and other panelists are also very important. So yeah, yeah. moving on, yes. uh, the next uh, panelist that we have is Sri Ranbir Sikon. And uh, I'll quickly introduce him and then uh, Ranbir Ji can take over. So Ranbir Ji has his master's in arts from School of Oriental and African Studies uh, in London. And he is deeply inspired by the books of uh, Sri Sitaram Goelji and Ram Sarubji. And Konrad Elst has been a constant inspiration to him and has helped him founding the UK group of Hindu human rights. Uh, today, uh, Ranbir Ji would be talking about Voice of India uh, in practice, Hindu human rights. So I request uh, Ranbir ji to present his views. Yes, uh, Ranbir ji, are you there? Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah. Okay, namaste. namaste. Um, so actually, it's Ranbir Singh. I mean, I thought it was you, second. Um, how many job Sikhs were involved in a Hindu activism? <laughs> so... That's why I tend not to use my surname. Um, that aside, it was actually when I was at SOAS that I came across um, books by Sri Kardel, Sri Jongo, Ram Sarut, they're in the library. Um, the teaching, of course, is even, and it's in the case now, in those days especially, slant towards the left. So India's problems are blamed on Hindu fundamentalism, Hindu fascism, um, all sorts of things. Um, you can see the video on the HHR website, which exposes this. So you've been taught one thing, but you're reading books, which are giving you something that's completely opposite. And, and, and no one's discussing it. Um, now I made a mistake then, which a lot of people do even now. And I was only 21, but um, people do it right to the, the end of their lives. Um, I ignored inconvenient facts. However, it, um, it stays in your mind. It kind of eats at you. You try to uh, harmonize what you're being taught, what you're actually reading, and what you're witnessing out there. You know, how, how do you make sense of this conquered distance? Um, the, the big um, change came in 825, I read Ibn Warak's book, Why I'm Not a Muslim. Um, Islamic radicalism had been pushing in the UK for many years on campuses. No one's really attacking it. Um, everyone knew there were a problem, but they were kind of avoiding the subjects. And it, it this is just as the internet was taking off, so it's very hard to get accurate information. Um, it was after that that I really started looking at um, Voice of India again properly. Um, and, and to this day, Steve Ram Gore's book, Ram's Roots books, that they remain incredible. Um, as I'm sure are aware, a lot of our thinking would be very different without the trailblazing they did. Um, of course, with three, three comrades entering to the scene, um, this brought a much new Western perspective to it because e even now, look, I mean, even if we all speak English, and this is not just for India, okay? They say, what was England and America? Uh, two countries divided by a common language. The thinking, the culture is different, yeah? And in India, the culture is different, okay? I I'm born in the UK, parents are Indian, but my thinking is not like in India. So my approach will be different. This is an important thing to understand because this is where, where Hindus often fall down. There's no single approach. It's, for me, it's not hard to combine both the Indian and the Western stuff. 
And I'm inspired by uh, groups such as the Anti-Nazi League and uh, Anti-Fascist Groups that fought racist in the streets of Britain. And that's one of the reasons why Hindu Human Rights Group was formed. We wanted to highlight the issues faced by Hindus people knew about, but it wasn't really being pushed. Hence, our first demonstration was against persecution of Hindus in Bangladesh. That's over 20 years ago, yet it continues this day, as we found this week. Um, there seemed to be a reluctance, though, and I know we criticised Sang Borivar, but the fact is there was a lot of reluctance. Um, what what Sitram Gore wrote back about the Sang in the 50s remains true today. They're not very concerned about any criticism of, of Hindus. They're not. But what it is, you can't criticise the organisation. That is the case with Indian politics as a whole. You can't criticise the tribe, the group, clan, political, wherever the entity is. You can't criticise it. You must show loyalty to it. Yeah. Getting ahead is not based on talent or intelligence. It's based on that loyalty, psychophancy. That has been imported into Hindu organisations in Britain on the whole. We talk criticise the BJP just now. But things in India will not change. And the reason it won't change is um, until you get rid of that colonial mindset, which has been inherited and entrenched, which is that you have a system in place that is set up to benefit the rulers, not the ruled. Yeah. In the UK, MPs are public servants. Now, theoretically, same is true in India. That's not the case. Even to the level of the MLA, the level of Desildar, people are elected to rule you, not to serve you. Difference in mentality, which is why in the UK, Hindu organisations go to MPs, Hastjorki, begging for help. Well, you don't do that. They don't serve you. I mean, that's why they're elected. It's a public service job. In UK, police are public servants. India still has the 1864 Police Act. It's to quell dissent, to keep people kicked down. That's why in my own family in India, people become police officers so they can go around bossing people around, beating up with lackeys and demanding free food. And I'm saying all this because until we face these issues and we look at it, we're not going to change anything. Yeah. Now, Hindu human rights didn't have this hangover, didn't have this cultural um, baggage, which is why we're different which is also why other Hindu groups oppose us. However, it doesn't stop us from actually raising those issues, yeah? Those books written by Voice of India are very important, but, you know, Gowalka has something right at least, yeah? You have to have action. You have to put these things in place and you have to do that, not by writing, but by changing the narrative, yeah? Unless you do that, the same stuff will continue. We can complain about media bias, political bias, academic bias, but unless you go ahead and challenge it head on, it's not going to change. People aren't going to change their opinions unless they're exposed. That's how it is. Yeah. So that's why for the last 20 years, Hindu human rights has pushed uh, protest, has pushed lobbying MPs, has pushed stuff on its website, now looking at new areas. And, and one thing we say is we're proudly polytheistic. There is no superiority in monotheism. Yeah. Um, outside of all India, there are two things. Well, actually, I'll mention you fully because it's important. Two things you must all read. Yeah, one is John Gray's books, uh, Straw Dogs and Black Mass. The reason is they take apart all the Western monotheistic narrative, Christianity, Islam, and it's as secularism because it comes from Christianity. Yeah. Although it's regards nihilistic, for the Indian mindset, it won't make a difference. And the reason is, we never believe in utopia, which leads to a dystopia. We never believe in this golden age, in past or the future. Okay? I mean, God, you not the same thing. So how do you fill this nihilistic mindset you now get with Jyotish? So I recommend David Forley's book on Jyotish. Because Jyotish gives you a pathway, a light, in order to understand your life, yeah, and the cosmos. It doesn't assume a utopia. This stuff only came about because of the activism within Hindu human rights, because intellectually you have to take on the missionaries, you have to take on the anti-caste groups, as they're called. You have to take on the people who think that the problem with India is Hindu intolerance. How do you do that unless you research it? And how do you do that unless you go into what we call the enemy camp? Yeah, and these this enemy camp, 
it's not always inspired by malice. Some of these people, take the anti-caste groups, they actually want to help with social justice. They actually want to improve things. Unfortunately, just like the communists in China and the Soviet Union, they're misguided. Um, and it's to expose that and expose the flaws that is important. Although this job ahead of us is, you know, difficult, it actually isn't as hard as when we first started out. The main opposition uh, Hindu human rights have had has actually been from other Hindu groups. Um, 2012, there was a uh, event in London for Hindu unity. Hindu human rights weren't even invited. Yet two years later, I got invited to speak at the Al Mahdi Institute in Birmingham, a Shia Islamic Institute. I've worked well with Ahmadis, worked well with Christian groups. Um, yet, with the Hindu organizations, the UK at least, complete stonewall, complete grey rock, no interest, very little support. Our last protest, very few supported us because it's that tribal jersey coming in. You can't attack the organization, you can't show flaws. People are saying if inside Lesser the Sun, you can expose it. No, you can't. You're meant to keep quiet. The, the Sun will, as with any political entity, will defend its own. Remember, Shreen Dawani, that murder in South Africa was in the RSS in the UK. Yet they defended him right to the last minute. And it's just that national students from is part of the Sun. Whenever someone attacks them, they're on defensive. And they will get attacked again by Caribbean Carl in Cambridge. She will be attacking them. The point is, everyone goes, we must go beyond our egos. We must go on these petty disputes. There's nothing wrong with that. But why isn't it being done? Because no one can get past this tribal loyalty. Yeah? The mentality needs to change. That's what we found in HHR. It is very important to honor Sitrangon and Rasuji, you know, on their memory by taking ideas and putting them to practice. Having great ideas is fantastic. Me speaking here, you may like what I say, you may not. Me writing stuff, yeah, fine. Carl else, you writing stuff. Anyone writing stuff, anyone who's been research is fine. But unless that is used in some way to change the narrative, nothing will change. I will be here in 20 years' time. Um, older, maybe not wiser, hopefully, but we are not going to be wiser unless we change that narrative. And that's what I'll leave you with. There are plenty of materials within Western countries that tackle the very same Nefer's forces attacking Hindus in India. If I was to criticize Christianity, for example, I'm calling him a mentalist. If a white person like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris attacks it, they're called rationalists. It's the same argument, but depending on who says it, depends on how they're categorized. So you take it apart. How many on here know these anti-caste groups are pushing ideas that are actually anti-Semitic and conspiratorial because no one takes it apart. Because unless you have the information, unless you have those tools, you can't tackle these things. You're always on the back foot. You're like a puppet whose strings are being tweaked by somebody else, who's always got that advantage. You don't play that narrative. You change that narrative. You, you, you show the flaws in that narrative. And in terms of India itself, like so take the CAA. This was a bill to provide accelerated fast track status for refugees suffering persecution. Now in five minutes, the media walked it into an anti-Muslim bill. It was nothing of the sort. The same thing with Article 370. It's attacking Muslims. So that Iran can't have free way on it but he's totally silent on the very real persecution of Muslim Uyghurs in China, the very real persecution of Muslim Balochis in Pakistan, and even Kashmiris in Balwaristan and Azad Kashmir, who, as some of you might be aware, protested, actually want to join India. These things aren't taken apart. The accusations that BGP are terrorist stuff, when a BGP sent forces into Pakistan to attack them as proxies, simple things that are missed. Anyone could tackle it. But those things are being missed. If the media doesn't pick it up, it doesn't make a difference. You form your own media. You form your own YouTube channel. You know, that's the beauty of the internet now. We're not stuck in having to pander to big media companies if we want to. 
They start from somewhere. Now, I don't agree with RT or similar anti-Westerns um, news channels. The fact is they exist and provide an alternative and change a narrative and are seen as a threat in the information war. There is no, I mean, Wild's doing quite a good job as well, but there's no reason why Hindus can't do that if they wanted to. And really, that's what I'll leave you with. If you're going to honor memories of these two great pioneers, you do it by that activism, both on the ground and by changing the narrative. Unless you change it, nothing will move. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ranbirji. That was very insightful. Uh, now, we uh, uh, any comments or questions uh, in that context? Okay. Uh, I think we should move on. And now this concludes the session fifth on intra-Hindu controversies. Now we uh, go to the final uh, session for today's conference that is uh, on the challenge of Islam. Our first speaker uh, is, is a very uh, interesting personality that is Jijit uh, Nandumuri Raviji. Uh, a former rocket scientist with ISRO, he has ex extensively contributed to Chandrayaan-1 and the GSLV launch designs that are there. Uh, but his keen areas of research uh, presently are Rig Veda, Ramayana, and Mahabharata. He specifically focuses on the geography of these Itihasa Purana traditions and uh, also is, uh, is, has a keen interest in the chronology that they present. Presently, he is working as a creative director in one of the largest IT firms in India and focusing on very futuristic technologies such as digital holograms, virtual reality, and augmented reality. But the aim of his uh, research and his keen interest in these futurist technologies is to create a platform which integrates uh, technologies like AI, VR, and AR with the Vedic, Puranic, and Upanishadic knowledge that we have, where he wants to create has created a platform called as Dharma Digital, aimed at dharmic revival using digital holograms, where humans can interact with various devatas, where artificial intelligence would be the backdrop of it. Uh, the focus uh, of today's uh, uh, session that is going to take roots in his comparative study of Sri Sitaram Goyalji and uh, the pre-Islamic scholarships of Amar Atar Yojameen. By comparative analysis, uh, he eventually developed a theory of Abrahamic origin from the Avestian Zoroastrian thought and uh, its origination in the Western neighborhood of the Vedic civilization. GGG would be presenting his paper on SR Goel on the backdrop of the Mopla riots. So I request uh, GGG to please present his views. Uh, GGG, uh, if I am audible. Uh, yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah. Uh, namaste, GGG. Uh, uh, can you hear me? I'm audible. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, so I, I just introduced you. If you can please uh, present your paper or uh, your views on the topic. Yeah, yes. So, yeah, I just, uh, when I went away, so okay. uh, other uh, uh, talk is over. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Ranbirji has uh, finished uh, presenting his views. It's uh, uh, your turn, and I introduced you, so you can oh. straight away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Will you please go ahead, sir? Please go ahead and present your views. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'll just. Yeah. So, namaste to the panel, and uh, I see a lot of. Uh, uh, Respected members who are I consider as my mentors, uh, like uh, Dr. Conrad Ellis and Dr. Talagiri. And uh, of course, Shankar Sharanji, I have uh, uh, met, uh, like interacted with him in the Indic Academy. And Mark Joris, I have uh, in this conference, I'm seeing for the first time. And uh, this uh, Pangaj uh, Saxena, he's uh, like a, a friend uh, in the social media. I see uh, so many other distinguished uh, members uh, as panelists and listeners, including uh, uh, Jackie G and many members in the India Facts. So uh, my particular talk uh, currently is uh, uh, primarily on Sitaram Goel and uh, on his uh, scholarship, specifically focusing on one particular area where I have uh, not personal but uh, uh, impacted my life as well. That is the Mapala riots. 
uh, in the sense uh, four generations before um, i have uh, experience of uh, people talking about this uh, in their daily life so this is uh, one area where i i thought like i put a uh, like a paper presentation so that this this particular aspect of mopla riots uh, as a case study of uh, what will happen if you don't uh, focus on uh, srikanth alagri uh, means uh, focus on uh, uh, srg's uh, scholarship so uh, just with that introduction let me start uh, sharing my screen so uh, my screen is uh, visible Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. If you can put it in the presentation mode. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. So, uh, in the in the first uh, part, what I am going to do is uh, introducing to the Mapala riots and all the political situations that uh, that led to the 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 kind of uh, problem that has erupted in uh, uh, in Kerala, and then uh, I will briefly touch upon uh, how it is connected with the uh, Sita Ram Goel's. Uh, Uh, thesis about uh, uh, Abrahamism, especially the Arabian version of the Abrahamism that we call Islam. And uh, second, uh, I will also try to see uh, you know, so some observations like aftermath of this uh, uh, event, what all happened in India, and uh, subsequently the current situation. Uh, that is uh, how uh, the the people who are uh, focusing on this SRS scholarship, how they are treated uh, in the in the current. Uh, post truth world uh, as well as some possible solutions uh, i am i'm talking about and uh, lastly there is one uh, particular uh, analysis i have done uh, tracing the origin of the abrahamism to sorastrianism uh, basically and uh, how it is all connected and how this entire uh, idea of uh, monotheism and uh, especially the abrahamic uh, variation of the monotheism has emerged and how it is tormenting the entire uh, human population so uh just uh, in the in the first part i'm just uh, uh showcasing the attention of the panel to the the events that led to the 1921 mapla riots so it was uh, basically a result of a global phenomena uh, everybody is uh, familiar with the ottoman empire and many of the previous panelists mentioned about it so the ottoman empire uh, like an islamic state it has uh, rose uh, in the uh, southeast asian europe west asia and north africa so it happened between 14th and 20th century so the rise period of it is in uh, between 1200 1299 and uh, 1453 you can see the map here so this entire area uh, was uh, part of the ottoman empire uh, arabia and then uh, turkey uh, part of uh, the, some of the, the current world current gulf country syria and uh, greece and uh, many of the southeast uh, southeast european countries and uh, like the borderline of the Africa. Everything was part of the Ottoman Empire. Its influence was there throughout the Europe and the uh, rest of the world as well. So, in 1517, uh, it was uh, declared as the Ottoman Caliphate, and the ruler of the Ottoman Empire was uh, declared as the Khalifa of the Islamic world. Uh, it's a title of uh, uh, given to the uh, Islamic uh, uh, global Islam. Uh, the ruler of the global Islam we call Khalifa, and it is a Kind of um, uh, title that was uh, originated during the period of uh, the founding stages of the Islam. So that kind of an empire materialized in the form of the Turkish Ottoman Empire, and the Islamic ca Caliphate slowly eroded because of the rise of the European powers, naval power, Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, uh, even Dutch also we can include that. So because of the naval power, it, the, this uh, world, uh, the European colonization spread across the world. but as a consequence of it uh, the the previous colonizer that is ottoman empire uh, got uh, declines and then the world war uh, starts uh, in uh, 1914 and uh, around 1918 the this uh, caliphate uh, joined uh, the current rulers of the caliphate joined the german alliance in the war and uh, as a result of that uh, constantinople Nople, that is the 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 caliphate central capital that was uh, occupied by the british that has happened in 1918 so uh, and uh, subsequently uh, this uh, ottoman empire was uh, partitioned between 1918 to 1922 so that is where the event of uh, 1921 happened i will put mention that in the next slide and the, the final stage of the end of the ottoman empire was 1924 
so this was happening globally and how how it affected kerala i will tell you in the next slide so what happened that uh, when this decline was happening the ottoman uh, sultan uh, abdul hamid he, he has uh, encouraged pan islam that is bringing entire uh, islamic community, community all over the world to fight against uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, european uh, like uh, powers uh, uh, like uh, domination over the ottoman empire and as a result the entire global islamic uh, uh, like uh, uh, countries where there, there is a considerable presence of uh, uh, islamic people so they have all joined uh, and tried to start agitations in their respective countries and there was a uh, one person called uh, jamal who have been sent to india in the late 19th century uh, like to fight for the caliphate and uh, he was active in india i have searched in the records two periods of active uh, means uh, propaganda uh, and uh, there is 1856 to 1859 and uh, 1879 he was very active in india as a result uh, there are some leaders emerged like uh, maulana mahmud uh, deobandi so he also became active between 19, 1851 to 1920 and then uh, jamia millia islamia a big uh, uh, cultural as well as uh, educational organization uh, was founded in 1920 so this is the backdrop of it. so as part of this uh, entire uprising uh, that was happening uh, the, the, there was a lot of uh, religious passion and uh, violent reaction among indian muslims and uh, this uh, as part of this violent reaction the, the biggest one of them happened in kerala that is the mapala riots and uh, it was in uh, 20 august uh, 1921 it started it ran for many uh, uh, years at least a couple of years it uh, continued and there are two uh, people who are uh, uh, well uh, discussed as the leaders of this uh, riot that is varian uh, kunnan kunni mohammad haji and ali mustriya so they were the two leaders uh, that uh, who were been part of this and they created an islamic caliphate called uh, al daula so there are disputes about it but more or less uh, this is what happened uh, the small caliphate originated in the malappuram district of kerala similar to the isis and uh, it was short lived but it has created much damage uh, many hindus in malabar region of kerala were killed uh, raped converted others fled everything is happened so an estimate of around 10000 hindus uh, were killed in the mapala raids uh, and because there was a centenary celebration or centenary remembrance of uh, the mapala raids uh, in this year uh, 2021 so so many research happened uh, stock taking happened and based on that estimate 10000 10, hindus were killed actually and uh, mahatma gandhi mk gandhi the the exit uh, that uh, thought that the islamic sentiments against the british uh, is an advantage and often endorsed the islamic leaders into uh, in india uh, who opposed british so he was thinking that okay this uh, anyway this uh, islamic leaders are now against the, the british so he can actually cleverly uh, turn them into freedom fighters so that was the uh, mahatma gandhi's idea and he was started endorsing them giving stages for their uh, means uh, talks etc all this happened so they got strengthened actually. and he tried to bring them into freedom struggle and ignore the their hindu hatred and uh, hindu murders so all these things he just brushed uh, aside the, into the carpet so later in the last stages he did recognize uh, that they are not, they have no interest in indian freedom struggle and were simply opposing the british uh, as part of the global uh, islamic fight against uh, like uh, the british opposition of uh, ottoman caliphate but this was a big error in the like of uh, mk gandhi and uh, what happened is that uh, it should have been stopped at that but the independent indian government gave the status of freedom fighters to the mopla rioters and they use uh, all the words uh, sound bites used by mahatma gandhi Uh, praising them as freedom fighters for this purpose so ultimately this is what happened so it's a big uh, distortion of the indian history uh, it, it finally uh, in the uh, nine, since uh, 2021 that is this year so many leaders from kerala they have uh, uh, done, done uh, deep research and campaigns and uh, propagation in social media about all these uh, facts and uh, everybody become came to aware of the gross distortion uh, the biggest of them were giving the freedom fighter status to the this uh, Uh, my plural writers so the ichr the indian council of historical research uh, noted it and uh, based on the petitions uh, they have uh, recommended that uh, this uh, uh, leaders that is uh, this uh, maplar red leaders uh, varian kun mohammad haji and ali muslim and around 387 others were decreed to be removed from the fifth volume of the dictionary of martyrs indian freedom struggle so this was uh, one victory we can say uh, it has happened 
Uh, and uh, I, I professionally thank the three, uh, the three panel uh, committee in the ICHR for the, their decision. And it has to be at, uh, uh, this is the initial stage of it, but uh, subsequently the dictionary revised dic uh, dictionaries has not yet uh, uh, published is not what I understand, but uh, definitely a positive thing that has happened in all these 100 years. So that is what uh, about uh, this brief understanding about the Mapla riots, uh, as, as a kind of trigger event uh, from the uh, global uh, uh, on uh, because of the decline of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it, have, it created a ripple effect in the Kerala state. And of course, I also know that uh, a similar kind of incident happened all over India, but uh, the biggest event of uh, destruction happened in Kerala, unfortunately. And uh, so now I'm connecting the, the Mapla riots and Sitang, uh, Sitaram Goyal scholarship and uh, hoping that it will help uh, us to learn lessons from these episodes. So as far as my understanding, uh, the Islamic destruction of the temples in India, which uh, Gawalji has mentioned in his book, then the Mapla riots of 1921, uh, the 1947 partition riots, uh, ISIS occupation of Syria in uh, 2014, uh, Islamic terrorism all over the world, Taliban occupation of Afghanistan, all are interconnected. Um, this is a very truthful and faithful statement, but uh, this particular simple fact, uh, they are, this is like uh, sugar coated in some um, political incorrect uh, statements, uh, etc. Like uh, there is a general tendency of ignoring these connections, ordering it as isolated incidents or as uh, uh, like uh, expressing it something like a sweet lies, but uh, ignoring the bitter truth. So, but uh, the source of all this is Islamic violence. It never stops uh, somewhere in uh, 1947 or anything. It goes straight away, straight into the past in the where it originated in the 6th and 7th century Arabia. That is the uh, one important attention I want to make to the panel. So this is uh, described by Sita Rangal in his book, Hindu Temples, What Happened to Them, Volume 2. Uh, the book is basically describing about Hindu temples, but he has dedicated a, an entire section uh, for this particular analyzing the theology of the monotheism. So it starts from chapter 9 and it uh, continues into from chapter 10 to chapter 16. Uh, this new chapter are dedicated to the uh, uh, this uh, uh, Hindu uh, for, for uh, dedicated for this particular uh, purpose. So theology of monotheism and I request uh, everybody uh, who is listening to this particular talk to go and uh, read these uh, chapters and they will understand much more than what is discussed in this particular uh, talk that I am giving. So Islam arrived in India and destroyed the temples. That's a, uh, it's a absolute fact. Nobody can deny it. And uh, continued for uh, 1,100 years. So around 700 CE to uh, 1,800 CE. And uh, this is again not an isolated incident uh, because many people think that uh, it's uh, again, it's like a, uh, they will, everything discussed as part of Hindutva, but it's not stop at that. Uh, they, this is the continuity of the destruction of the Zoroastrian worship places in Iran and uh, the pre-Islamic Arabian worship places in Islam's own home, homeland, that is Arabia. So this destruction is nothing but a uh, continuity of what the, the uh, this uh, uh, monotheism has done in Arabia itself. So they have destroyed their own homeland first, and then they started uh, destroying the uh, neighboring places like uh, Iran and uh, India. So uh, this is just a map of uh, the uh, this uh, uh, spread of the, the Arabian uh, version of the Abrahamism. So again, uh, you can see a red color here and that, that is because there is kind of some kind of interference coming from Jerusalem. Uh, that is the, the origin point of Abrahamism. From Jerusalem, there was some colonization happened in the uh, Mecca and Medina. So this is uh, something which very least discussed uh, in, in current uh, uh, academia. That is like, uh, just like in India, the the Arab traders came in India, basically in Kerala, Kodikot, everywhere Arab traders came and then uh, Arab trade colonies were established in Calicut, uh, Kodikot and all those uh, places in India, Kochi and uh, near to Travang, Pallam, everywhere. Similarly, uh, much earlier period, uh, the Jewish traders have come here in Mecca and Medina. So there was a period uh, wherein the the Arabs were polytheists believing in hundreds of uh, gods and goddesses. At that time, the, the, uh, this uh, Judaism and uh, Christianity originated uh, in this uh, Israel area. They became monotheist. So the monotheist uh, judo christian uh, like uh, traders came and established in Mecca and Medina. And similarly, there was also some political military activities. Some of the Jewish and Christian kings 
had some kind of uh, fight, uh, some kind of attacks happening in this area. So this is, this particular chapter of history is very unknown. See, we know that the polytheist in India, you know, the Indians uh, with the polytheism, uh, they we were uh, we were believing. We continue to believe in polytheism and uh, multi, many gods and goddesses, many temples. At that time, the monotheist uh, believers uh, of uh, uh, Christianity and Islam came and colonized us. That we know about it. That Islamic colonization and Christian colonization in the form of U European colonization. But similar thing happened in Arabia. That is uh, not very well known to people. Arabia is sim similar to India. Arabian people were uh, believing in multiple gods and goddesses, having temples, everything. So it's an exact copy of the 21st century India. Uh, it was there in six, uh, 6th and 7th century Arabia. They were just like uh, Hindus, uh, polytheists, believing multiple gods. And that time, uh, monotheist uh, uh, colonizers came here, as exactly in, like in India, as first as traders and then as uh, some kind of political action. As well. So I will explain uh, in detail about that. My journey began with this. Hello, yeah. So uh, what uh, SRG has, uh, and I, all this is I'm discussing based on the SRG's uh, theories, uh, his thesis in that same chapter as I mentioned. So Islamic theology is the same uh, theology of Abrahamism uh, that is formally expressed in Hebrew and Greek, but re-rendered in Arabic language. So this is what SRG has initially, the first element he is mentioning about uh, Islamic theology. It is same as, it's same Abrahamic theology. But earlier it was uh, written in uh, Hebrew and Greek, but uh, in, when it comes to Arabia, it becomes uh, in Arabic language. It is written. So Islam can be also termed as uh, Arabian version of the Abrahamism. Yes. So this is the word I use, uh, Arabian Abrahamism, because that is the correct uh, definition uh, of uh, Islam. Actually. So uh, here the see Allah, that is uh, the God of uh, this uh, uh, Islam. So it, it was originally a pre-Islamic uh, pre Arabian God. So there was like, for example, uh, Islam originated in 6th and 7th century. So even before that, uh, the God Allah was there. And uh, it was a, uh, he was a pre-Islamic Arabian God, totally unconnected with the Abrahamism. So it, uh, this uh, God Allah has no connection with uh, uh, any, any other Abrahamic figures like uh, Adam or uh, Abraham or Isaac or uh, no? any of that lineage, totally that entire lineage, there was no connection. It was just like a, uh, pre-existing for 3,000, 4,000 years, the, the, this God was worshipped in Arabia. So the pre-Islamic pre Allah was not a jealous God, but a deity connected with other pre-Islamic gods like uh, Hubal, God, uh, Al-Usa, Manad, Allah, and so on. And uh, there is another, just because I am connecting uh, the SRG scholarship with another scholar called Amar Atra Yunajim. So he is an expert of uh, pre-Islamic Arabia and his polytheist gods. So he, man he is mentioning, he is even gives the name of that religion. So we know currently our religion is called Hinduism, Sanatana Dharma. Similarly, the ancient Arabian religion was known as Deen al Abaika, faith of the forefathers. And it's synonymous, uh, synonymously, it was also known as Deen al Aliha, faith of the gods. So this was the ancient religion. So currently, we have 100 crore uh, Hindus, and uh, Hindu's name, Hinduism name is at least uh, well known to the entire world. But think about the ancient Arabs. Their religion name also is not known to the people. Only the academic people uh, who are researchers have any knowledge about these names also. So there, the, the Judeo-Christian influenced the pre-Islamic Arabia, uh, and uh, they were living in Makkah and Medina. And uh, they have groomed some Abrahamic missionaries. Uh, just like uh, in today in India, so many Hindus, Brahmins were converted, and uh, they, they will be, uh, start talking about uh, uh, Hindu concepts itself uh, in the form of... Uh, Christian theology. So there, I know about a Brahmin converted Christian who will uh, say Purusha Sukta is uh, basically talking about Jesus Christ. So similarly, uh, and uh, Shivaratri they convert into Vishiharatri. Um, uh, then uh, so many things are uh, they do it. So existing culture. So people pe they are grooming people from the existing culture. So we know what is what happened in India about uh, through in Hinduism we know about it, right? Because uh, they they will. Uh, Get create scholars in the Hindu religion to uh, reinterpret everything in Christian terms. So Purusha Sukta is one example of that. Shivaratri as Mishiharatri is another example. Then um, there is a Velankani Vel temple. They con con converted into Velankani, Amen, uh, the, like that. So it's like they everything they convert into Christian uh, term, terminology. So similar thing happened in Arabia. So there was a lot of Abrahamic missionaries who can speak in Arabia, 
they spread in the abrahamic ideas in the arabic language and uh, so they this is they who were re-rendered uh, allah into a mold of jehovah that is the monotheist abrahamic god of uh, judeo christians so allah's original character was uh, removed and uh, re-rendered as jehovah so um, there is a comparison of uh, pre-islamic arabs versus hindus then they will be able to understand it much more clearly so these pre-islamic arabs uh, who believed in deen al-abaika that is that is the name of the religion they were similar to hindus uh, they worshiped many gods and goddesses they have belief in rebirth uh, they revered ancestors like hindus worship planets and stars suns moons worship nature then they have yoga like something similar to yoga they have uh, 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 similar kind of uh, uh, epochs and uh, contrary to popular hindu belief uh, the, the pre islamic arabic uh, they don't worship any hindu gods so see this entire this is a truth but this truth is uh, uh, obsc- obfuscated by some popular myth uh, like uh, the arabs were hind- worshiping in hindu god this is not true and some say shiva was worshiped there and then uh, the whatever arabian temples were hindu temples vikramaditya uh, ruled in arabia so these are all like fables but this is the reality reality is not known to people but fable is not to many hindus actually so again there is a this is a table of comparison so polytheism say they worship the hubal and uh, allah wat and uh, all sams uh, manat so many gods just like uh, hindus worship shiva vishnu brahma ganesha yappa murga saraswati lakshmi like that pilgrimage so hajj pilgrimage so here people don't know this is a pre islamic uh, arabian uh, cult, uh, like the cultural element of the deen al abaika religion but it is absorbed into uh, current islamic practices so it is similar to tirtha yatra just like we have tirtha yatra shabarimara visit uh, tirupati visit uh, very holy spots uh, visiting in india, various places in indian subcontinent uh, the arabs have uh, hajj pilgrimage but this currently hajj pil- pilgrimage is uh, uh, modified into a pilgrimage of all over, all the muslims can go into um uh, mecca and uh, into the kaaba but uh, in the deen al abaika tradition hajj pilgrimage means all the arabs in the different parts of the arabian peninsula they are uh, coming into uh, this uh, mecca actually that is a difference and they are going to worship their gods there uh, in the in that particular kaaba actually but the, the all the arabian gods uh, anywhere in the arabian peninsula had a representation in the kaaba in uh, so they all go to visit that god their local god uh, represented in the kaaba for that they are doing the pilgrimage that is the original hajj pilgrimage then funeral there is a janasa that is we have sadha then feast that ifada we have sadya and saath ke fries they call it qurbani we call it bali then uh, there are temples of arabian gods and goddesses just like temples for uh, hindus blessing there is a barak there is a concept of baraka varadan something similar to varadan uh that is there in the uh, pre islamic arabian fasting is there so uh, ramadan also is a pre islamic arabian tradition of the deen al abaika which is uh, transferred into the abrahamic monotheism of uh, arabia so this entire thing is available uh, in the this particular website link of uh, athar e junna so uh, this is uh, another chapter uh, in the srj's book so this uh, kaaba the city, that is a city of uh, in the city of mecca that is the most important sign of the polytheist arabs it's a natural sanctuary all the regional gods and goddesses of arabian peninsula are represented there this is not a, uh, there is no equivalent of that in india because we don't have uh, every god uh, goddesses uh, all over india represented in any particular place in india so but this is uh, happened uh, in the arabian peninsula uh, it was a symbol of arabian unity because that is the kind of uh, Uh, status given to the kaaba because uh, just like in india so many kings arabian kings uh, fought between each other so but uh, this particular arabian unity symbol uh, united them together so it is something like a national integration symbol for them uh, united all the divergent arabian tribes in arabian peninsula so around total 360 gods and goddesses were represented in kaaba and uh, in order to foster religious uh, harmony like uh, indian secularism uh, what happened is the caretaker of the kaaba which is a quraish tribe they placed some picture of jesus and mary in kaaba i mentioned the, the there was some trade colonies of uh, uh, judeo christian people in mecca and medina in order to satisfy them uh, just like indian secularism of today the quraish tribe placed the jesus mary uh, pictures in the kaaba uh, even though they are foreign gods uh, they they placed them so judeo christian missionaries they have uh, 
they influenced the polity tribes like Quraysh, who were worshipping Jesus, Mary, and Abraham. Uh, like uh, like today, Navratri Kolu also, uh, there, there is an incentive to place Jesus, Mary statues inside Navratri Kolu. So similar kind of uh, influence they, 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 they have, these Jodo Christian missionaries had on the Quraysh tribe, the polity is Quraysh tribe. They put the idols of Jesus, Mary in the Kaaba. So this influence enabled the Arabic Abrahamic missionaries. They claim Kaaba is built by Adam. This is the first uh, major uh, like uh, shock. The, they finally claim that Kaaba is uh, built by Adam and renovated by his son Seth and Abraham. So Adam, Seth and Abraham are part of the Abrahamic theology of Israel. It's nothing to do with the Arabian polytheism. And they were totally foreign and unknown to the pre-Islamic Arabian civilization, not part of its uh, ancient history or tradition. And uh, what ensued was a complete falsification of the Arabian prehistory. So majority of Meccans till that time have never heard of any Abrahamic names like Abraham or the story of uh, Arabs descended from Ismail, the eldest son of Abraham. None of them were known to them. But the Arabic-speaking Abrahamic agent accused the Meccans of uh, usurping the Kaaba and filling it with polytheist worship. That was the accusation that uh, leveled against the, the Dina Abayka uh, religious followers, uh, the pre Islamic Arabs. They abolished the history of real forefathers of Arabia and linked them to Jewish prehistory. So, uh, the entire prehistory of pre Islamic Arabia completely erased and uh, they, it was reconnected to the Judaism, Judaism and uh, Jewish prehistory. So, falsifying of the history, prehistory is the greatest blow from which pre Islamic Arabia never recovered. Using the false propaganda, the Arabic speaking Abrahamic agents destroyed all the gods and goddesses represented in Kaaba except the painting of Jesus and Mary. And uh, they killed the Quraysh tribe members uh, who defended Kaaba and they obtained all the polytheist Arabs. Today, we know none of the archaeological record of the pre Islamic Arabs contain anything that supports the theory that Kaaba is connected to Abraham or Israel. There is nothing in the archaeological records. Instead, they reveal Kaaba was a polytheist worship place since many ages. Many thousands of years that was a polytheist place. There's the Arabian Abrahamism built on a big lie uh, that the pre Islamic Arabs uh, and, uh, were killed and raped and converted on the basis of big Abrahamic lie. And uh, this prehistory falsification is one of the major methodology that uh, the Abrahamic strategy. For example, the Mapala rites were falsified as uh, Indian freedom, Bodra train burning as if it, uh, it is done by Hindus themselves. Then uh, St. Thomas uh, visiting India. Now, that is false history. He has never visited India. He died in somewhere in uh, Afghanistan somewhere. And uh, falsification of Indian history uh, so that the destruction of Indian temples that continued for 1,100 years from 700 CE to 1,800 CE, it is concealed and not taught in schools or colleges. Falsification of the motive of temple destruction. So they say the actual reason is religious hatred of polities. They call it kafirs or ethans. But uh, they are replacing it with uh, false protection, uh, need to loot temple wealth. Temple wealth uh, looting happened, but it is a coral side effect. Actually, they, they destroyed it because they hate kafir. That is the reason. Then promotion of Abrahamic appeasements and suppression of Sanatana Dharma using protection of Indian secularism. Dr. Saxena has discussed uh, this in detail. And then uh, falsification of true motive of uh, creation of Pakistan. See, the, it is basically uh, following the principles of uh, uh, like Abrahamic monotheist uh, principle that you divide the entire nation into two parts. Wherever there is a, uh, this uh, strength, that is called Dar al-Islam. So Pakistan is the land of believers of Abrahamian, Abra Arabian Abrahamism. And the rest of the uh, land is uh, described as Dar al-Harb, uh, that India is the land of politics kafirs. So kafir land is just uh, separated out from the Islamic land. And the future, they will claim the other land also by increasing their presence. So this is what actually happened in the, the, the creation of Pakistan. But this aspect is completely ignored and uh, covered under wraps. People only talk about political and situation, etc. But uh, this is basically a division exactly well defined in the uh, this religious books uh, of the Arabian uh, uh, Abrahamism. So uh, true history of pre-Islamic pre Arabs. So actually, I told about the false history, the true, true history I'm talking about. There is a king called uh, Maniyam that is uh, as early as uh, 3000 B, uh, BC, similar to the during our Rigvedic period. And uh, then wood, stone and metals imported from Arabia to Syria in around 2550 BC. There are archaeological records for it. And then Sabian civilization flourished in Arabia from 800 BC to till the point uh, the Arabian Abrahamism destroyed it in 6th and 7th century. Sabian worship uh, the sun, moon, planets, natural gods, 
uh, build massive temples uh, uh, and with the uh, gods and goddesses with silver and gold believed in rebirth and yuga like uh, epoches archaeology has records of the temple sculptures palaces city walls towers public works irrigation infrastructure uh, and uh, they have it is very from your archaeology it is very clear they don't have absolutely zero knowledge about adam ismail or abraham the arabian kingdoms exported uh, frankincense myrrh and uh, cassia all these uh, uh, trade goods they have exported and they were brave soldiers tailors and uh, uh, like uh, uh, traders and sailors and uh, of course uh, in kerala also the before the islam came to arabia uh, in kerala the pre islamic arabians were uh, trading actually so this, this is well known to the uh, kings uh, the king uh, kings of kerala actually you, you can get in the archaeology records of the old kings of kerala so their trade colonies existed in, in india and uh, other countries just yes, for in kerala there was there i mean before 6th and 7th century before they they become is muslims they they were there and uh, the what the uh, see arabian abraham is see, if you look at the uh, this is what sri tarain was said uh, this uh, this is what uh, the abrahamic text describe the pre islamic arabs uh, they were under dependent pagans and polytheists and aware of monotheist god and his prophets they attached partners to allah they gave daughters to allah while they preferred sons themselves they worshiped stones and statues they had no prophet they had no scriptures uh, these are all the complaint uh, against the pre islamic arabs uh, they were ignorant of the last day and of the heaven and hell they revelled in blood feuds buried alive their female infants sons married stepmothers same men will marry two men uh, two or more uterine sisters these are all the charges uh, leveled against the pre islamic arabs so that they can destroy them and nobody will raise a question and the same kind of vilification i would say similar kind of vilification is done for the sanadana dharma uh, where our festivals are uh, vilified so vilification is the first step before destruction so today you, you are vilify the, the dasara diwali everything is vilified uh, the karwa chauth is called operation uh, then uh, uh, diwali uh, they called uh, it's a aryan invasion theory like uh, rama destroyed uh, dravidian ravana like that Uh, or uh, uh, similar kind of and the, the, for dasara the the goddess uh, is a prostitute like that they will say and uh, so many other so this vilification is the first step same thing happened in the pre islamic arabia so this kind of uh, information was spread against them uh, this uh, vilification campaign was first happened and then only uh, subsequently they were destroyed so we are we have to be very cautious that this we are, are going to the same phase where first the tradition is vilified and uh, within 2 3 decades uh, they will start destruction after this so after vilification means uh, then all over the world uh, hindus are considered as fascist and uh, like that so when destruction happen when we, uh, everything is destroyed the rest of the world will think that uh, okay they deserve it now same thing happened in the pre islamic arabia for the to the pre islamic arabs uh, who were polytheist so i am just uh, telling you that this is the uh, correlation of uh, what will be happening in our side so uh, how it is spread so arabian abraham is after creation in arabia after destroying gods and goddesses of kaaba and the arabian abraham is to destroy the temples of arabian gods and goddesses in arabian peninsula that in within arabia itself they started destruction alu alusa ubal uh, alat manat what all the temples related to these uh, goddesses and gods they were destroyed first so pre- then uh, the this the, the, the ancient people the pre islamic arab people they cried when their gods and goddesses were destroyed some of them resisted there were some battles they fought back but their men were killed and women raped children smashed to ground others were converted so this happened actually it's the same thing what happened in the islamic period in india and uh, the wealth of those uh, who were killed were distributed uh, to the soldiers of arabic brahmins so women were distributed to sex slaves um, so because of this again it became an incentive so more people joined freely enjoy wealth and women and uh, it was a self sustaining industry kind of it grew so similar thing was attempted in 2014 in uh, isis so the, because of the greed of uh, you know getting uh, free women as sex slaves uh, there are so many european people also uh, european citizens have come and joined uh, into the isis in 2014 uh, this happened so this is a real real thing uh, so isis is just an example of what happened in uh, arabia uh, in 6th and 7th centuries and uh, there there were kilba from the temple of jerusalem after the establishing themselves uh, by deriving uh, entire ideology from the Jew- Jew- judaism and christianity they turned against them that is the last thing so the temple of jerusalem was shifted uh, sorry kilba from the temple of jerusalem was shifted from 
uh, shifted to Kaaba of Mecca, and then Arabian nationalism started. Arabian nationalism centered around Arabian Abrahamism. So then uh, Arabs have also become very proud of themselves because see whatever status of uh, Temple of Jerusalem that is now come to uh, their own uh, local region uh, in uh, Kaaba in in Mecca. So then no uh, then no no longer anybody even though they were some of them were killed. Some of their ancestors were killed because they were all pre-Islamic Arabs, uh, worshiping polities, gods and goddesses. But uh, now they also got some prestige. Okay, uh, they forget all the previous humili humiliation and destruction of their own fathers and mothers. Uh, they just uh, become very happy about uh, the the Kaaba of Mecca getting importance and the Temple of Jerusalem uh, de demoted. So Arabian nationalism started. So there was there was no go back after that because uh, all the Arab nations become. Uh, very proud of uh, the Abrahamic, uh, Arabian, Arabian Abrahamism after the Judaism and Christianity was demoted uh, in their eyes. So even though the Arabian Abrahamism planted by Judeo-Christian Judeo missionaries, they were eventually given a second-class status. Many of them were killed or converted by Arabian monotheists. And the Arabian Abrahamism spread to Iran. Some uh, same pattern repeated in Iran. And uh, this is a uh, this is something that uh, shows the resilience of uh, Indian tradition because. Within 10, 20 years, uh, the entire Iran was converted, and a few people uh, fled the uh, Saurashtra and fled to Iran, uh, sorry, fled from Iran to India. Then God asylum in Gujarat as Parsi, and Ratan Tata is one of them. Uh, and uh, the Arabian Abrahamism finally reached India, destroyed its temple for 1,100 uh, years, finally created Pakistan and many pockets of Darul Islam in Malabar, Kerala, Kashmir, Bengal. That is what uh, the current uh, situation actually. So current situation. So some, uh, some 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 kind of a positive uh, developments. See Daral Islam, uh, the status of uh, Kashmir as a Daral Islam, uh, it is now abrogated and uh, Kashmir is now a normal state in India. I I missed the uh, Ayodhya also. The Ayodhya also very significant because this is the first uh, one of the first instance where uh, uh, one of the uh, Ab uh, this Abrahamic destroyed one temple uh, of polytheist. Again, it got re-established. But anyway, uh, the temple is continuously being, being constructed. But once it is constructed, uh, this will be also another uh, achievement. Uh, just like Kashmir uh, converted into a normal state of India uh, instead of uh, becoming an Islamic state, the Ayodhya uh, we we were able to re-establish Ayodhya. Uh, this is one of the first uh, incident where uh, it is happened. Of course, Somnath Temple also it has happened, uh, but the, one of the major because uh, Ram and Krishna are two important. Uh, like uh, tallest uh, icons of Sanatra Dharma and uh, the, the largest temple of Ram is Ayodhya and it is re-established, re is again another uh, ma minor, uh, so we can say major victory. And the price of adapting this dangerous ideology that uh, originated by falsifying the pre-Islamic pre history of Arabia has caused terrible loss of human life, perhaps the largest in the recorded human history in the entire world. And uh, today it has uh, impacted Arabia, that is, it's on homeland Arabia and Gulf countries, uh, uh, then India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, many African and Central Asian and Southeast Asian countries. Uh, earlier, Southeast Asia was considered as a symbol of a syncretic uh, Islam, but even there also violence have started now and they are slowly changing their uh, characteristics and becoming like a uh, the uh, Pakistan like a uh, kind of uh, culture. Earlier they were very proud of uh, the Hindu tradition, Southeast Asian countries, but uh, slowly they are changing uh, in the in there. So this is a very kind of a painful or uh, maybe maybe a, con means a situation which requires attention. And uh, it has affect started affecting Europe, Americas, Oceania, and other countries. So no country is safe. Europe also a lot of uh, problems started uh, recently. Uh, there was a big incident happened in uh, in UK now uh, that is uh, Ramesh Rao where was mentioned and uh, monotheism is a is a claim of monopoly and supremacy. So in if you look at the core ideology, it is monopoly and supremacy only, and uh, it can never bring peace. Even though it talks about God, God is just a pretext. It is basically a monopoly and supremacy, political monopoly and political supremacy, and can never bring peace. If, even if the entire world become monotheist, assume that we agree to the will uh, wishes of uh, the uh, Abrahamic monotheists, like everybody convert to uh, their their ideology, will there be peace? No, because the, even if the entire world become monotheist, there will be still fight of dominance because the same monotheist religion divided into thousands of sects, uh, like Shia, Sunni, and then fight for dominance until 
seven billion humans will die because Pakistan is exactly this example. The entire country is, is Islamic, but still there is a fight. And in Taliban, the, now in Afghanistan, Taliban has conquered the entire Afghanistan. Are they bringing any peace? Because there is infighting still going on. So this is really, it's never going to get into any peaceful situation, even if the entire world get converted. And uh, now I go to the different topic. Uh, that is, uh, this is this entire thing, what I am able to tell is only because of Sridhar Angoyal. So 90% of my uh, uh, like uh, thesis on this particular topic came from uh, Sita Rangoil, 10% uh, from uh, Yajunam, uh, like that. So what is what is happening today? This is I'm, with a lot of pain I am telling you, because similar to the isolation of uh, Sita Rangoil, like Sita Rangoil in his, in his life uh, died like a, as a sad man, because he was completely isolated and uh, there was no good support of uh, from his organization. And uh, he was isolated and, and uh, uh, the same isolation is faced by those who try to spread a study scholarship. So uh, one of living example is uh, Dr. Conrad and Dr. Salagri, uh, because the contribution Elst has done in uh, portraying the true perspective of Ayodhya is often ignored by nationalist Hindus. I myself was part of some debates, uh, uh, email debates, which are running to 100 and 200 uh, email conversations, counter conversations. I was uh, a part of that kind of uh, debate, where uh, his uh, contribution to Ayodhya is completely ignored. and. Uh, he was uh, being discussed uh, as a anti-Hindu, etc. Uh, and I, I could not tolerate it and I was reacting very strongly to that. So, so many things happened. Same thing happened uh, like uh, this, uh, see, due to the support of uh, true history of Bharata, uh, despite its brilliant expertise in Indology, uh, Dr. Elst is uh, sidelined by international research area, uh, arena by dominated by Pollock and Wilson. So, just uh, giving a tag of uh, um, supporting Hindus is enough uh, for the scholars to be demoted uh, in the in their respective uh, circles. So this has happened to Dr. Els and the Talagri is having a brilliant OIT thesis uh, that is Indian origin, Proto-Indo-European and uh, Indo-European migration from Indian subcontinent to Europe. And uh, but due to support to SRG, so even today also you can, you can hear his words. He, he was very much critical of the current uh, political party, ruling political party, but it is not again because of hatred. Uh, it is basically because he is frustrated that uh, they are having certain mandate and they are not fulfilling it. So people are mistaking the uh, the, the harsh words and uh, brutal criticism uh, as a, a kind of uh, uh, enmity and uh, uh, opposition. But it basically uh, this is basically because of sincerity that it is happening uh, that people should understand. And uh, everybody uh, like uh, both of these uh, leaders, they want uh, the organization, current uh, the Hindu leadership organization, cultural as well as political, to be excelling in their uh, mandate and their objectives. But since it is not happening, they are criticizing. It. But they are instead uh, because of that they are isolated. They are facing isolations in various arena. They say they are isolated for their words, uh, which are which are coming out of experience. It's coming. So that that is this has to be stopped. That's what I will say. I have a, my own share of isolation because uh, in my apartment circles uh, and for friend circles, because in the last three years, since I made a lot of true statements based on Sidharam Goyal scholarship, I no, no longer have that friend circles or uh, any apartment circles. I will not be invited in any of the uh, celebrations, even the Saras Diwali celebrations. I was not invited for that because uh, uh, because I was uh, uh, telling the true uh, perspective on, on every aspect whether it is about uh, uh, this uh, violence is happening in India or, or uh, any of these uh, leaders uh, or any, any of these uh, Islamic leader, uh, leaders like Tipu Sultan or anybody, I tell the correct uh, perspective and these people are not uh, that, you know, means, uh, interested in supporting and try to isolate uh, people like uh, anybody telling the truth. That is the current situation. And uh, this is uh, this kind of situation can be corrected only when there is a central leadership takes uh, some changes in the policy and uh, correct the history textbooks. So as long as uh, in the history textbooks, uh, the counter narratives are uh, taught, they will think that uh, people like uh, uh, Talagri or Cordadels or myself, whatever we are telling, they are falsehood. That is what they think. They are genuinely thinking that uh, this is falsehood and they, this is all trying to get uh, uh, votes for BJP. That's what they are saying. It's all for getting votes for BJP that we are all telling all these things. That's what the simple kind of a belief uh, we are all uh, uh, IT cell. Uh, somebody says that I, I was part of the IT cell of BJP. <laughs> and uh, 
like that. Uh, that is what uh, they are thinking. Uh, but we cannot help it because this is what even the television media channels uh, and the newspapers and even the central leadership currently ruling, they are also not trying to correct it. Uh, similarly, and again, I say that uh, this is also part of a general tendency in the among the uh, Hindus, uh, nationalist Hindus, because they don't want to hear anything uh, contrary to the popular belief. So, for example, uh, just like Sidharangal scholarship, I also tell about the truth about the Kurukshetra war date, which is should be below 2000 BC. The moment I say this, uh, they will start isolating. And um, uh, similarly, history and geography in the Vedas. It is uh, anybody who is familiar with the Rigveda Samhita, they can very clearly understand it talks about uh, the lineage of kings and also geography in that. But uh, the general people have belief that uh, it's only about the philosophy and spiritual spirituality in the Rigveda. So whenever they hear it, uh, they think that uh, this person is uh, trying to brainwash people. This is what they think. And uh, Mahabharata were also the people interested in having the glory of Bharata Varsha. No, they, they think that uh, 5561 BC will be like uh, increasing the glory of Bharata Varsha. So th this is a general tendency. It's not only restricted to the uh, this Siddhara Goyal. Anything contrary to the popular belief, the people are not interested in uh, looking at. They immediately right away reject it without uh, any kind of uh, checks. So I'm not talking about only about problems. I'm just uh, putting up something for the solution part of it. So scholarship of Siddhara Goyal, uh, which traces the birth and growth of Arabian Abrahamism, they can, it can really save the world. Now, I'm not talking about just India. It's going to save the world in Arab countries to make the cause correction. The scholarship, this is a, this other Yajunnam is a very unknown. So his scholarship of Yajunnam, if uh, he's Arab, I think he's an Arab living in UK. So he can help the Arab countries to make cause correction and rediscover their lost goddesses and gods. And conferences like this, uh, highlighting the scholarship of SRG is a right step towards recognizing bitter truths. I call it bitter truths because uh, people uh, people don't like bitter truths. And uh, they uh, discarding sweet lies. Sweet lies is what people like. Anything which is a popular imagination, which is uh, well known, which is popular, that they like, even if it is a lie. And uh, the, hence all the organization of this con organizations of this conference deserve uh, great appreciation and I, I with, uh, sincerely appreciate them for this conference. And uh, then I request uh, uh, the RSS, uh, my humble request, if any, anybody in RSS is listening to this uh, conversation and this conference, the RSS can adopt the SRG scholarship as a core. It has to be the core ideology, core directive, uh, of, and all the policies should derive from this uh, RSS, this Siddharam Jal Jesus scholarship. RSS is the organi only organization that, that can do it. And um, I don't consider, uh, I don't, I, I have never used any word of uh, uh, RSS as non intelligent because uh, there is some kind of uh, inertia. The, I, definitely there is an inertia, I will tell that. Uh, it has happened. But currently, see, anyway, you know, 50, 70 years it was dominated by Congress, etc. So you need to play smart, or maybe you can say we, you need to play smart. If you too much of uh, you expose the reality, they will uh, again aggressively destroy you. All these things were co correct. But now after 2014, that situation is not there. So you have full power. Now you don't have to play a coward, uh, no, play something like, uh, no, you don't have to, you can shun the earlier uh, reservations and then you can aggressively have a uh, uh, SRB scholarship at the core of your ideology. This is one humble request I have to RSS uh, organization. And uh, similarly, another defect uh, I see is uh, the Hindu nationalist leaders, both the cultural organization and the political leadership should uh, avoid the the M.K. Gandhi's Abrahamic appeasement politics. I am a very strong critic of uh, M.K. Gandhi, but uh, I also see the positive, a lot of positive things are on him. So uh, currently, my, my idea is that uh, only criticize for those aspects which uh, require criticism. So I whatever positive things are in M.K. Gandhi, uh, I appreciate that. But at the same time, he has uh, started the Abrahamic appeasement politics in India, starting with uh, the Mapla riots and the way he had treated the uh, this uh, Mapla writers as freedom fighters and try to give stages to them and promoted them. So that is the beginning of the Abrahamic uh, appeasement politics in India. That and the ideology of uh, uh, M.K. Gandhi, uh, just uh, maybe he sincerely believed that by this way he, he, we can convert them into real freedom fighters. But whether sincerely or uh, uh, tactfully he tried that, that same thing as uh, no, adopted by the leftist organization, leftist organization of India 
and the congress party and the, also uh, the currently bjp uh, so all the three uh, that is uh, left uh, communist leftist parties uh, congress as well as the currently bjp everything uh, actually originated from uh, mahatma gandhi uh, who has established this uh, abrahamic appeasement politics in 1921 onwards starting with the napla rights so this should be avoided you have to do course correction so just like the pre islamic uh, arabian nations are doing course corrections we also have course, course corrections to be done uh, on these two aspects like adopting asrg scholarship in the core of rss as well as uh, staying away from the gandhian uh, abrahamic appeasement politics and uh, so this is another thing i observed is uh, like even if you if, see you don't have to hate abrahamism or abrahamic people i don't recommend that i don't recommend uh, any kind of uh, attacks and fights uh, etc i don't uh, recommend that but if you sincerely believe uh, if you have friends uh, across the abrahamic people if you want to really save them if, and you are telling sweet lies it will not save them instead uh, it will make them continue in their wrong paths so that way they may you may be in good books uh, of these people but ultimately you are destroying them so if you are really sincere in your uh, friendship you are you are sincere in bringing them to the right path you have to tell them the bitter truth and uh, avoid telling the sweet like saying that praising abrahamism like uh, some as if something equal to sanatana dharma many many of the people say sarva dharma samabhava they think that uh, similar to sanatana dharma abrahamism also is a valid path to the uh, real uh, the, the god or to the dharma it is totally false uh, it's entire uh, abrahamism is uh, built upon political domination and monopoly there is nothing god inside that and uh, god is just a pretext just like a to to uh, to convince people that it is a religion and it is a uh, something to do with god but there is nothing in that and you make them realize this early as, as a good friend uh, as they are good friends uh, you realize uh, them that this is uh, what is happening and after that if they continue let them do it but uh, you have to do this and instead of continuing uh, telling the lie again and again uh, and uh, that same dna that kind of remorse etc is like that that will not help actually because today they may be praising you uh, because you are siding with them but after some time when they realize the truth that their religion is false then at that time they will accuse you why didn't you tell me so you have to do that and this will also help uh, the bharata so 130 crore people Jew, jewish are just uh, 5% or 1% of our strength so look at how they have uh, reconfigured as a great nation and uh, um, a dominant power we are 130 crore people with a um, uh, sorry one zero is uh, in, uh, more uh, just ignore it so 9500 years um, uh, like so starting with dirana 17 Uh, 7500 years dirana i consider as the oldest uh, record of uh, indian civilization so 7500 uh, to uh, till date we have uh, uh, such a big uh, civilization and we are responsible to make it continue so this all these solu- this if you implement this solution it will help the save bharata with the 130 crore population and having uh, 9500 just uh, ignore this last zero i am very sorry about it so 9500 and uh, uh, starting with birana uh, that civilization will be destroyed if you are not doing it i am 100% sure about it it's not like a, see it's not coming like a meteor impact uh, and the destruction not happening in 10 minutes or one year so it doesn't mean that it is not destruction as we speak every day every hour it is slowly destroying it's a slow destruction so that you are not not noticing it unless you make course correction within 19, 19 uh, 2050 to uh, 2100 we will disappear uh, our civilization will disappear uh, from the planet earth uh, just like the zoroastrians uh, no, we will all disappear and will be part of the museum uh, and uh, can i ask if there is any time left yes sir like 5 uh, minutes we can spare 5 minutes oh, yeah, yeah. so in 5 minutes enough for me uh, this is a this much is i have about uh, the sidaram gandhi scholarship and i have on my own way i have uh, expanded on the two scholarship of yajunam as well as uh, uh, sidaram goel so in the f- five minutes i will explain that so there is a, my website uh, on avestan text vegetar vesperad s9 yes that is in takshushila.wiki.com i have created a wiki for uh, wiki, wiki, wikipedia like wiki for the vegetar vesperad s9 yes the so in that a uh, lot of observations like mary boys uh, 
uh, who were studying the Zoroastrian culture and religion, they, Zoroaster was the first to teach the doctrine of individual judgment in heaven and hell, the future of resurrection and the uh, last judgment. So all these uh, Abrahamic uh, principles you can find in Zoroastrians. And Zoroastrianism is the oldest uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, older than uh, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. So it is the source of uh, Abrahamism. Zoroastrianism is the oldest world religion. And uh, I have also studied the Zoroastrian uh, and Ju Ju Israel interaction. So Zoroastrian Persian occupation of Israel is there. Uh, like Cyrus, uh, Cyrus II was a king. It's, uh, it's around 500 and 520 BC. So Cyrus, uh, the kings like Cyrus and uh, some earlier to him, uh, they have conquered the territories uh, up to Egypt. And uh, Israel was part of it. Uh, so there is a link of Zoroastrian into Abrahamism. So it's not just words, but actually there it was there. And uh, the, it is well studied. And uh, Zoroastrianism evolved from Avastan religion and coexisted with the Rigvedic tradition. So you can read a scholarship of Sri Kantalagiri to understand that. So my addition is the, this hatred to Devadas. So in the Avastan text, it, how it is starting is Indra is the god uh, that uh, Rigvedic people invoke when they uh, attack, they fight with the Avastan people, uh, the enemies. Uh, that is uh, the uh, the Trishtu Bharadas uh, when they fight uh, against uh, the others, the Abhivartin Chayamana and uh, Abhivartin was a friend, but uh, Kavi Chayamana and such uh, Avastan kings, uh, they will invoke Indra. And they, in every battle, whenever the, they get victory, like the big battle of Sudh, uh, the Dasarajana battle, uh, the victory is uh, dedicated to Indra. And uh, naturally, uh, the Avastans uh, have an enmity, uh, developed an enmity with Indra. And they slowly started uh, hating anything related to Indra. In, anybody worshipping Indra, definitely the Ved Vedic people they hated. Uh, so ba based on hatred, their religion was uh, emerged in the uh, west of the Vedic river Parish. And uh, uh, some of the resurrections, uh, resurrection is mentioned, the Mary boys mentioned resurrection is there in the last, uh, in the Sarashtrian text. But I say resurrection is there in the, see, Maya Dhanava. Maya Dhanama by definition is an Ahura or Asura, right? Uh, Aitiyas and Dhanamas are both Ahuras, Asuras. So uh, Maya Dhanama re respected the uh, dead Asuras. So definitely resurrection is part of the, we, we see the glimpse of it in the Maya Dhanama's story. And Shukrajarya is uh, having Vratas and Jeevani, where he resurrected the dead bodies. So resurrection as a rudimentary proto concept emerged in the, this area uh, to the west of Parushni, uh, where all the Daitya Dhanamas uh, or the Asuras, uh, which is Sarasha is called Ahura, uh, they existed. And the one and not only one God syndrome. So Abrahamism, if you look at notice, the biggest problem is the one and only one God. There is only one God. And uh, you have to obey uh, that God. That same God say, I am jealous of other gods. Uh, all these things are there. It is a central tenet of Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Everywhere this one and not only one God, uh, very powerful and uh, jealous of other gods is there. So similar kind of... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, God, uh, it was the Hiranyakashipu. If you remember, the, the Hiranyakashipu declared himself as a God and he avoid, uh, prevented anybody worshipping uh, any other God like Vishnu or anybody and uh, he will kill them. He will destroy. Even his own son Pragvada, when he worshipped uh, this uh, Vishnu, he ordered to kill him uh, and Pragvada was thrown into fire. So all these things are only happening in the Abrahamic uh, theology. Like anybody who uh, question the monotheist God, Abrahamic God, they will put into the fire. So uh, again, I uh, searched a little more deeper and uh, uh, I have uh, looked at it because some people say there is a uh, e Egyptian monotheism, Akhenaten, etc. So during the second millennium BC, Israel was uh, the seat of the Canaan polytheism. So Canaan is here, just Arabia is here like that, Canaan is there. So they were polytheist. So just like the Arab have a polytheist past, earlier even Israel also was a polytheist uh, tradition. So nowhere the, the monotheism was nowhere there in the world. So Canaan's were there in second millennium BC and uh, slowly the Canaan identity was melted into Israel identity. At that time, uh, the Egyptian kings around 15, this, uh, this period, 15th century, 15th and uh, between this period, uh, they have uh, uh, conquered the is uh, Canaan Israel at that period here. So Israel dominated this. And uh, that time there is an Egyptian monotheism, uh, Athenism worship of the sun god uh, Athen, Akhenaten. So it is dated to 1400 BC. So this is, uh, I have uh, explored it because it's a counter, it's counter to my theory about uh, origin of Abrahamism in uh, Swarashtrianism. 
So I looked at it. So Egyptian monotheism has some influence on canal. Maybe it may be having it. But uh, when I looked at it, primarily Athens is a, a sun god worship, is uh, just a worship of the sun god. Uh, and uh, other gods and goddesses were there, still there. And uh, uh, it was, a, I, in my opinion, it's an overhyped earliest monotheism. It's a hype up because the monotheists want uh, some ancientness to the monotheist ideology. Because of that, they are just trying to hype it up like a big monotheism. And uh, both the, the impact and the duration of Akhenaten monotheism is not, is not clearly not. So I am not denying it. There is there is definitely a kind of uh, monotheist influence, but it may be a 5%, 1% influence on the Israelites uh, from the Egyptian Akhenaten monotheism. But here, if you look at the Babylonia, sorry, Babylonia and uh, the Persian dominated uh, Israel, see 586 BC, the, the Babylon has conquered Yehudia. Uh, and uh, Hebrew Bible says uh, the, he destroyed the Solomon Temple and exiled the Jews to Babylon. But uh, 538 uh, Cyrus, uh, that is Persian emperor, uh, Kuru, <laughs> conquered the Babylon and uh, he freed the Jews uh, under the Babylonian occupation. And uh, 436 BC, Jews from Babylon returned to Yehudia and uh, rebuilt the Solomon Temple. So Babylon and Persian culture uh, thus severely influenced the developing Abrahamic Judaism. So this is much more closer to the origin point of Abrahamic Judaism. So I say I see that the largest connection of uh, origin of Abrahamism should be with the, the Zoroastrians. And this is how the Daitya Hiranyakashipu consciousness ended Abrahamism to Avestan uh, Zoroastrian religion. Ah. Uh, okay, so just two slides. The possible bright future because I want don't want to be in an end uh, talk in a negative mode. So, see, SRT scholarship has the potential to fix the demographic problem of India, Bangladesh, uh, and it can help uh, uh, Arab countries to reconnect the lost gods and goddesses of Islamic Arabia. And uh, UAE has taken some steps like building Hindu temples in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Saudi has introduced Mahaparat drama in, in school syllabus. Some of them, it's not officially everywhere. Uh, yoga and Ayurveda already there in the Arab countries. And uh, <clears throat> politicism will enable Arab world to become tolerant of the other diverse cultures. No doubt about politicism being tolerant, monotheism uh, being intolerant. And this will help Arab world to become multicultural again like they were before 6th century. Uh, it will attract more talent into Arab world like, uh, like how in Europe and America is able to attract multicultural talent uh, from India and other countries. And this is more important. The post-petroleum era, they are going to decline. And uh, if you, they want to survive, uh, they cannot afford to have uh, these modern monotheist hardcore ideas, strict Islamist ideas. Uh, you know, it will ripple multicultural talent from across the globe. Uh, and if you uh, adhere to the polytheism, they will, uh, you know, uh, it will create uh, correct a huge error they made in sixth century, which pushed them into the violent and nihilistic path of uh, uh, like uh, nihilistic path of violence. And uh, it will uh, turn them into a society contributing to the progress and stability of the world. And uh, the yeah, this is just a formula of constructing the monotheist religion. Not many people have talked about it, that's why I'm mentioning. The formula is like this. You select one male polytheist god from the existing Abrahamic mono, uh, 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 to play as the Abrahamic monotheist god. So first step is select one polytheist, pick one polytheist god uh, to play as the Abrahamic monotheist god. So Jehovah is selected from Canaanite polytheism for, for Judaism and Christianity. Allah is selected from the Arabian polytheism. And after that, you reject every other gods and goddesses. It's so very simple. Uh, so they reject uh, Yahweh's wife, Asherah, and uh, Canaanite gods like uh, Astorath, Baal, etc. So that way, Judaism is created. And Christianity is copied from Judaism. And uh, in uh, Arabia, rejection of all the gods and goddesses uh, of the Arabian polytheism, Alusa, Hubal, Manat, Tuvat, everyone will reject. So only one will remain. That is a monotheism. So a destruction of the polytheist history. And the second step is, is you destroy the pre all the older history. So that nobody will uh, know about it, uh, but it will not. It is not successful because uh, archaeological records are there. So first, but but whatever written history you destroy, then uh, violence uh, based on forceful conversion, violent reaction, sh sh shutting of free speech, suppressing the truth, controlling the uh, the free and unbiased uh, social dissemination of information and truth. That is social media control, uh, newspaper control, television control, movie industry control, everything. And the controlling politics and power. Whatever whoever is in the politics, you control them. Congress, they have control. Now BJP controlling is, they have started controlling BJP also. So attempts were made to carve Hindu Abrahamic monotheism in 20th century, I noticed it. So just imagine, Shiva is turned into an Abrahamic monotheist god by rejecting Vishnu, Durga, Ganesha, and Murga. And uh, it, is, it is really 
happened. I mean, it's just there what to happen, but somehow by grace of Shiva, it has not stopped. The Abrahamic influence of Shiva was strictest like in Lingaya. They were trying to carve over Shiva into a monotheist god. Then uh, Krishna turning into, imagine, Krishna turning into Abrahamic monotheist god, rejecting Shiva and Durga. All the people who are worshipping Shiva in Durga are killed. Their temple destroyed. Now imagine that a scenario. So even though it didn't happen because of, by the grace of Krishna, it just didn't happen. The Abrahamic influence on Krishna worship in Iskon, a lot of uh, complaints happened. Like they tried to modify the Bhagavad Gita into Abrahamic like uh, statements uh, uh, like that. It tried, they a lot of try like portraying Krishna as a monotheist god. They tried a lot of things like that. Sikhism is currently under influence and uh, it's going to start uh, more in the coming mo coming months. Khalistani movement. This is basically converting up Sikh, uh, Sikh uh, philosophy into Abrahamic idea. Ideology already started during the British period. It has intensified by the last month also. So many incidents happened. And uh, in Hinduism, the entire, entire Hinduism also, this has happened. So, RSM, again, uh, as I, I appreciate all the positive things RSM has done, but uh, one negative, just like I talk about Mahatma Gandhi, they have uh, tried to Abrahamize Hinduism, like uh, by they saying that only the Rigveda is correct, everything, Mahabharata, Raman, everything is wrong. So that is a, that kind of a, uh, trying Abrahamism trying to enter into Hinduism happening almost 300 years uh, it is happening. It's a reality. But uh, by because of the grace of Krishna and Shiva, it is not uh, successful. So that's uh, my uh, talk. Uh, and I uh, recommend these uh, two different scholarship on the left hand side. Uh, Sita Nangoil, uh, Hindu temples, what happened to them, the, the volume two. The entire topic of the book is about Hindu temple destruction, but chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 will give a very foundation, solid foundation about pre-Islamic Arabia. Same thing, uh, and this is the link for that. Voice of Dharma is again uh, the foundation, the, the, sub, the great supporter of the Sridharam scholarship. I appreciate my full appreciation. Then Amar Atar Yajunnam, again, great scholar. Uh, he is, I don't see him writing any books so far. But uh, this is the website, watanism.blogspot.com. He has written two, three articles, and that is good enough, equivalent to the same uh, chapters of, uh, I mean, see, uh, this many chapters, so same amount of uh, solid scholarship. Three uh, blogs, mythology and religion of pre-Islamic Arabia, deities, spirit, figures, and locations. Social context and spiritual belief in Bagan Arabia, rituals and practices in Bagan Arabia. These three uh, big blogs, Almost he should write a book on that. That much big scholarship uh, also will give you a foundation on the pre-Islamic Arabian gods and goddesses. You will know that it, it is exactly like Hinduism, but uh, never get into the confusion that it was actually Hindu. Uh, that is again wrong. There was no Shiva temple in there in the, in the Arabia. I can tell that. But they had similar kind of uh, gods and goddesses and their temples were there. So those things you will get to know from here. Full, very detailed, all the gods. 360 gods of uh, Arabia is uh, discussed here. Uh, all the practices like uh, Hajj and uh, Janasa, similar to the pilgrimage, uh, Tirtha Yatra, etc. of Hindus, everything is discussed in this. So these two scholarship, uh, I, uh, just after this talk, you spend uh, at least half a day in going through these two scholarship. Anybody who has not already gone, my humble request. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Uh, I think... Uh... Uh, Mark Yoris, uh, sir, has, has uh, something to say. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sir, I was very disappointed, not with the historical overview you gave. This was very good. Yeah. And you know many things about Islam, but you don't name the enemy by the name. You use the name Abra uh, Arabic. Abrahamism, and you present it as if Islam, or it's about that, it's about Islam, is an, transla an Arabic translation of Abrahamism. This is plain wrong. This is what the Muslims say about themselves. They try to accaparate it. This is plain wrong. This is a saying Donald Duck is a real duck, or Mickey Mouse is a real mouse. If tomorrow in the United States, a, a, a serial killer stands up and he sucks the blood of his victims and with his tongue dripping from blood says, I'm an incarnation of Kali. Would you then say, oh, well, a Hindu, look at that. This is what Islam did. All stories about 
Abrahamism from the, the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, as the Christians call it, that Mohammed retells or plain wrong. The names are wrong. The, the genealogy, the, who is the son of whom, who is the daughter of whom, this is wrong. The, he, he has not understood a shred of Judaism, of real Abrahamism. He could not read or write. How could he have understood even the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, which could be a powerful argument against Abrahamism? Uh, well, not sacrificing, asking to sacrifice, is so distorted that it means the complete opposite in the real Abrahamism in Judaism, the story means cut to the bone. Two things are the God says, I am against human sacrifice. Everyone does it around you, but please stop. I do not want it. Now you see what it is. This is your beloved son, your only son. I gave you by miracle. So, so this is the feeling you have if you have to bring a human sacrifice. Stop it. Slaughter a goat in place of it, which is a, a step forward in civilization. What make the Muslims of it, of this story? You know, the, what, the, the, each year, the Hajj, there is a moment in which they threw stones at a rock, at a big rock lying there, and this rock represent a devil. And what has this devil done? He has whispered in Abraham's ear so that Abraham hesitated. He thought God had ordered him to slaughter his son and he hesitated. Of course, he was a human being. He had human feelings. He had doubts about this because this was contrary to the, to the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. And the devil made him hesitate. And the Muslims lapidate, throw stones at this devil. If th their view of the problem is, if God orders you to kill your son, well, you may not hesitate, you may not think, you may set aside all, all moral rules, all feelings, and you stab him. And if you hesitate, this is the devil that makes you hesitate. This, how you can say both, is about Abraham, but his stories are completely distorted. There, on this one point, you buy the lies of Mohammed, the lies of Islam. Christianism and Judaism, with all their mistakes and all the bad things they have done, they are completely different. They have had a completely different evolution from Islam. If you doubt at it, ask yourself why values as democracy and human rights and tolerance have, in the end, after too many centuries, I admit that, have flourished in Christian lands and in Israel, the only democracy in the whole, the whole of Arab, the Arab world, and that all Muslim states are dictatorships. This this derives from the lies of Mohammed, who tried to accaparate Juda Judaism, Abrahamism, to say, I am the only real Jew. And in the beginning, I know the stories too. In the beginning, Jews listened to him. I, they thought, oh, well, maybe. Till he began telling Abraham this, this and uh, his granddaughter, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Oh, 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 granddaughter? This is. There he proved he had no idea of the centuries that are passed by between Abraham and Mary, the mother of Jesus. He had no idea of all. He, he was plainly retelling, probably retelling some stories he had here, here around the campfire. And then you say, oh, this is real Abraham. Why has he changed the Qibla? In the beginning, indeed, he tried like a good politician, uh, a good madman or a good demagogue do. He tries to say, I'm with you. I'm a Jew like you. We, and it, you see, I pray towards Jerusalem. But when they said, my boy, you don't know anything of Judaism. You don't know anything of our laws, of our scriptures. You're an imposter. Ah, then he was angry and he, he changed the Qibla. 
and he killed all Jews in Medina. You forgot this detail, but this was this were they these people were the true Abrahamic descendants of the, uh, the true Abrahamic religion, and he murdered them all. And then you say, but that's all the same. Your course, you made me angry, you know. I'm not angry if people say, I do not believe in God, in Christianity, in Jesus. Uh, and I, I'm a Hindu or something else. This is perfectly normal. I think all religious people should have a certain doubt. We, we believe, we feel something is true, but we do not really know. Sometimes in sleepless nights, but I have often, I wonder if, oh, imagine the Hindus are right or the Buddhists are right, and I am wrong. I don't think so, but this is possible. This cannot, there are no proofs in religion. There is an intimate, intimate feeling of this, feels true for me. But for the other people in this panel, other things feel as true. And as long as they respect me, I can respect them. No, never one Hindu has tried to kill me or, or, or has sent me a bullet. And Muslims have done. Uh, this may, But you seem to be what you dislike in monotheism. You have this yourself. You're a a, a, a fundamental, excuse me for saying it, but you are a fundamentalist, not even of Hinduism, but of polytheism. I hope in the next incarnation, you, you know, it's not possible, incarnations don't go to the past, but you should be born as an, an Indian in a Mexican tribe bordering the Aztec empire. So you could be sacrificed by the polytheists as Aztecs. Mm -hmm. your, way, your view is so narrow, all evil comes from monotheism and all good comes from polytheism this is a, 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 a typical muslim simplifications of of historical facts that are much more complex and completely different you can't you in india we had a large discussion about how the in, incapability of the hindu majority to get rid of the muslim minority and the, the problems and the, the the fractions and the, the infighting, and you will even make it worse. You can't put down the Muslim minority in India, and oh well, go to the attack against Christians that many of them want to be your allies against the Jews that, on the geopolitical level, are good allies against uh, Islam, uh, against whole rest of the world. This is a suicidal thing. You make enemies where you have, you have enemies enough and you make enemies where they are not. You scoff at potential allies because you say, ah, you're a monotheist and all monotheists are like the Muslims, so you are as bad as them. This is not honest. This is not tolerant. And this is for yourself. This is suicidal public relations don't put decent people in the same murderous black bloody sack as the muslims this is not decent i do not deserve that who else does not deserve that many well-meaning christians do not deserve to being put on par to be considered as proto-muslims this is destructive. Thank can you. I, can I respond? Gigi, uh, you can, but again, uh, uh, we have to be brief. I know the yeah, debate yeah. won't go. Yeah. Yeah, Please. I just, I, I just have a few words. See, I, uh, my uh, uh, this uh, assessment of uh, Abrahamism is uh, primarily a recording of the words of uh, Sita Rangoil. Second is, I don't uh, have any any kind of uh, negative attitude towards uh, uh, like uh, Christians uh, uh, or even Muslims uh, who are living in the current period because they are victims of whatever happened in the past. I myself have traveled into uh, UK, the London and then Edinburgh. I have visited uh, US, uh, two cities, New York and uh, uh, Seattle. Never I have faced any kind of uh, discrimination or uh, uh, kind of hatred. So um, the Christian world, what, whatever currently we have, 
it is a, i will myself i can say it is far better than the uh, like uh, the uh, arabic world this uh, arabian world or uh, the gulf countries uh, maybe dubai or some other metropolitan city is an exception but uh, nobody will be interested in going to any hardcore uh, uh, islamic nations uh, which is uh, like uh, even currently even despite all the uh, modification despite all the mod modern changes Saudi Arabia, etc. Nobody is interested. Like, for example, uh, if uh, I'm asked for some projects, uh, do you want to go to uh, have as part of the project? Do you want to go to Saudi Arabia? Or and I will straight away I will decline. But if uh, similar thing, if if you want to go to Europe, anywhere in Europe, Belgium, I will say I happily I am ready to come there. So this is not reflecting the current uh, political situation. And uh, Israel is currently an ally of uh, India, and. Uh, whatever irrespective of the ideological differences israel already within uh, uh, maybe right from the beginning of the christianity they have become uh, uh, a very good kind of a civilization uh, which understood a lot of uh, past mistakes and corrected course so i have no enmity and uh, with uh, israel and especially not, not nothing with zero with the current uh, israel leadership uh, current uh, israel nation and i have absolutely no enmity with any christian nation uh, europe uh, any, anywhere in the Europe uh, uh, or in the America, because uh, by, because I tell the truth only. So based on the truth, I can say uh, com compared to Islamic nations, uh, Christian nations are uh, ten times better. I, I can read it. But whatever ideological I have mentioned, uh, which has happened uh, in uh, 2000 or 2500 years ago, they are true. And it is not only my ideology. This is what you read the Sita Rangal's books, whatever chapters I mentioned, it is uh, found in that. So I make a distinction between what happened in the past and what is uh, what is in the present. And uh, uh, second thing is uh, I will look for the the positive part of it uh, every time. See, for example, I can just uh, uh, like uh, end my conversation saying that uh, no, you ask post, you question the Muslims who destroyed all the temples uh, or the Arab nations etc. Instead instead of that, uh, what I am telling is now you look at the future and. Uh, uh, what, think about what what positive you can do in the future. That's what I am only focusing on. I am not focusing on the past, whatever has happened to the uh, our culture because of some wrong ideas that let us forget about it. Move on. Move on to the future. That is what my primary point is about. Okay, if Kunrat Elst uh, was first. Yes, I, exactly. I mean, uh, in 2014, I was at a conference, the India Ideas Conclave, organized by uh, Ram Madhav, whom I am told, who I am told is listening right now. And um, so there was a big problem uh, about my uh, sayings about Islam and the presence of two top Muslim politicians in the audience from Jordan and from uh, Turkey. And so <laughs> I was wondering, you see, these people are neither Indian nor Hindu, what are they doing here? So I assume that quite a few of you have uh, a similar reaction now, you see, uh, telling me, why did you bring this you know, this Mark Yoris here. Uh, so yes, you see, I, I, I perfectly understand that there is a certain uh, gap of understanding. Um, uh, I, 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 I can't, you know, go into the whole debate, of course. Uh, these are legitimate uh, views, if not always true. Um, but uh, it's very illustrative of the flare up that used to happen in debates uh, between Sitaram Goel himself and political opponents. Like I remember a debate with the late Vinod Mehta, a top secularist journalist, uh, where you know he said like, you have blood on your hands and <laughs> stuff like that. It was all very animated. Uh, so this is something similar. Uh, all I want to say about the contents, uh, leaving it open-ended, is that indeed you see the term Abrahamism has a number of uh, wrong or undesirable connotations, but that is stuff for another conference. Indeed, that's a very important 
uh, topic with ideological ramifications. So we'll devote time to that uh, on another occasion. And uh, finally, I want to say that um, I would insist with the moderator that um, in spite of all the hurry that we are in, that at least he gives the, um, the mic to uh, Ranbir. Uh, he gave the shortest speech of all the speakers here, and yet a very important one with a very important message, namely that Hindus should take the initiative, that should, they should stop being on the defensive. And if he has something to say now, I'd really like to hear it. Hello, hello. Uh, I think I have having some internet connectivity issues. Hello, am I audible? You yeah. are. Ha, ha. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Notorious I was going to say that Ranbir ji is to also give, put forward his views. So I'm, I'm totally... Okay. Um, many thanks. Um, just to reiterate, I didn't speak a lot because... Um, like I write, I try and speak as little as possible. Um, I like to make it compact. So I understand, you know, make one fall asleep like Indian politicians doing a speech on TV. Um, you see, he makes some important points. However, again, taking the, the initiative, I think you should. Well, when we look at it as Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that's not how it happened reality wise. I've done some really good research. And of course, being in the West, being having access to our library really helps. Um, you mentioned Zoroastrianism, really important fact because um, this Hungarian scholar Ignaz Goldzer he found there's a lot of Zoroastrian books on Islam. Um, you know, the recite the Quran from merit is taken from Zoroastrian belief in reciting the Avistan. Um, Quran Surah mentions Harut and Marut angels. Zoroastrian angels are Horvatat and Amaratat. I hope I said that correctly. Um, Surat, Surat mentions 1.6 mentions a bridge. Um, Surat al Mustakin, um, again in Israelism. She is in Iran, prayed facing sun or fire. Um, and it's interesting that after the Islamic conquest of Iran, that's when you find books being written, like by Fardosi, to collate all the myths and folklore and stories of pre Islamic heritage. Why did it happen afterwards and not before? Um, five prayers have roots in the five Gaza Israelism. Um, beating the head and chest during Ashura has the Rashtrian precedence. Muhammad is sent to heaven as a Pallavi text, Rashtrian called the Arta Viraf, um, again, is sent to heaven. Uh, was Rashtrian met uh, Omar as in the angels and saw paradise and he saw hell. Now, there are a lot of influences of Rashtrianism on uh, Islam because Zoroastrianism began as dualism between Ahura Mazda and uh, Ahriman, I believe, yeah? By the time you get the Sasanian Empire, you've got Zurvanism. It's a monotheistic form of Zrashnism. That had a huge influence on what became Islam. And I say what became Islam because Jijisti, and it's no disrespect. I mean, obviously, you have to go by the information you have. And I believe this myself once. We think Islam came, Arabs thought, great, let's go and conquer. That isn't what happened. The Arabs conquered first. Islam was formed afterwards. It gave that conquest its credibility. Yeah. There is no proof of Muhammad existing. There's no proof that Jesus existed. I mean, Jesus, there's a lot of scholarship on that, but this came out of Robert Spencer's book. There are references to called Muhammad or the Blessed One, but there is no figure that corresponds to exactly Islamic tradition. The most important hadith, Sahih Bukhari, it's so exact. But then why do you have uh, other texts like uh, uh, Abu Dawood, other hadiths contradicting each other? Surely if it's so detailed, you get the facts right. There is also evidence some of the Quran was lost. Um, Aisha mentions a certain page eaten by a goat. Therefore, and if you look at the Quran, unlike the Bible, it is not in any coherent format. It doesn't flow. There are massive insertions that come out of nowhere. For example, you've got Mary of Magdalene confused with Mary, mother of Jesus. These are basic facts. Now, I don't believe there's a conspiracy. In Gnostic Christian texts, Jesus wasn't crucified. Again, Islam, there was influence on it. So it, the Arabs conquered, early coins show crosses on there, on the Caliph Muayyah. You shouldn't have that. You know, you have contemporary sources by bishops that speak of um, Hagarines, Maghreb, these things, Saracens. No reference to Islam, no reference to the Quran, no reference to um, anything that we recognize as being Islam. 
Now, surely if Quran and Muhammad were the reason for conquest, we would find that. But no, it's conquest first, Islam afterwards. Tom Holland has done work and he got criticized for this massively. He, the Quran mentions Bakr. Bakr says being Mecca. Well, of course it's not because in Bakr you grow olives. It's near a Petra in modern Jordan. This is the mistake we make. Also, we also believe, oh, Jesus came along. Oh, all these gods are false. Oh, yeah, let's just chuck this out. Well, of course that's not happened. Same in the modern interpretation of Sikhism. Guru Nanak went to Hardwar. Don't chuck water at the sun. They thought, oh, I see Bukwas and Bashadir. Well, of course that's not what happened. The whole idea of Christianity came out of the Greek philosophy, Roman ideas, ideas of Mithras, Isis. It was going towards that in the first place. You've got a single empire and a single emperor. Yeah, single focus. If you look at Aristotle's ideas of prime mover, they believe in gravity. Again, that one force that led to monotheism. Yeah. OK, because Greek philosophy was taken in by what became Christianity. When Galileo was persecuted by the church, he was going against the Aristotelian idea of a geocentric universe. Yeah, that the Earth is the center, sun goes round it, not the other way around. So what I'm trying to say is, it isn't so clean cut. There's no evidence of Mecca being a place of pilgrimage, a center of trade. Patricia Cron has written on it. It was formed afterwards. It was invented. Yeah, now, it's not a big conspiracy. Think about it logically. You create an empire. You are focused. You have to justify it. What better way than to make a single belief system to hold that empire together? That is why you find in the early stages of Islam, science, as we call it now, flourished. It later stagnates. And the reason it stagnates is Islam was forming. It was the result of it. Now, once you understand that, all this starts to make sense. Yeah? We have it in India now. The idea of Hinduism. One faith in India. There was, it's a Western construct. It doesn't work like that. It's, 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 and don't feel weak because I'm attacking Hinduism. The fact is, if you attack that Western idea, then you're going back to your roots. If you keep that Western over Hinduism, then what is it based on? Vedas or Upanishads? Which book are you picking on? Because that's how the monotheistic mind works. It needs a single God, a single prophet, a single text. And that God does not even need to be a supernatural being. Communism has a God. It's called the theory. Secular ideas have it. It's called the theory. Modern secular ideas, Richard Dawkins, Chris Hitchens, all come from Christianity because they have that one focus. Humanity is the focus. Yeah? There's no proof of that at all. There'll be mass extinctions. There'll be more. But the fact is, scholarship is out there. Um, good books like Robert Spencer, um, Patricia Crone, which show Islam, it didn't form as we think it did. Again, Tom Holland, uh, Timothy Freak, Christianity didn't form as we think it did. It wasn't the reason for this expansion. It was the result of that expansion. Um, that's all I really got to say. Um, I could go on, but I don't want to bore you guys to death. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, any, any questions on that? Can I speak, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, see, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I found the uh, his talk irreproachable. I think what he said was right. But since Mark Jurisi has raised certain points, let me point out that this is like, you know, there are different stages in evolution, like a uh, virus develops mutations. So what uh, he has shown that uh, there were the original seeds of monotheism in the Avesta. And if you go further back, you'll find some seeds of that even in the Rigveda. And then it developed in Judaism, then it developed into Christianity, then it developed into Islam. So each state, each development brings in new points. Obviously, all if you are indicting those religions, you are not automatically indicting Avesta or the Rigveda also. Because certain things which we are indicting came later. So you see, in Avesta, you find this monotheism, a kind of dualistic monotheism, but even Christianity is like that because there is a God and a devil. But... Uh, Zoroastrianism never preached hatred of the other gods and destruction of their temples and this thing. That thing started with Judaism. Because in Judaism, you find that they're told to go there and destroy all the temples. And that is described in great detail in the Old Testament. And uh, I think in uh, Harvesting Our Souls, Arun Shori has given point after point, you know, chapter after chapter, word and verse of this instructions of God, how to destroy the other gods and temples. So that was there. But the next mutation, Christianity, 
so and you see the zoroastrianism does not claim any uh, descent from abraham whereas all the other three religions do so in that sense they are abrahamic while zoroastrianism is not because and also they bring in this, this uh, hatred for other gods but uh, judaism was restricted only to israel and only in the past today no jew believes that he has to destroy other temples and not as he believe that uh, his uh, jurisdiction is over the whole earth whereas christianity taught that they went and destroyed all the religions of europe of i'm sorry yeah of europe america uh, both the americas and australia and every other area even in africa they are doing it even they are doing it today in india so that same thing is carried by islam and the distinct mutation which took place in christianity was the universalism you know that it applies to the whole world whereas for in judaism it was restricted to israel whereas christianity and islam are common in the sense that they want to impose the thing on the whole world now the point that marjoris raised that we are alienating yeah. possible allies that is not correct because you see in india the um, evangelist christian missionaries and the islamists are united they are not against each other only when one attacks the other like for example recently some kerala christians raised this thing about law jihad and all only when they are attacked for that small portion they oppose each other otherwise they are united so they are not our allies in any sense but uh, israelis are our allies because they are not expansionists they don't want to convert hindus and so india hindus are friends with jews also european people who are now facing the dangers of islam they are our allies because they are not fundamentalist christians they are modern europeans who are facing the onslaught of islam so i think by criticizing abrahamism or criticizing uh, islam i don't think we are alienating them as possible allies because they are facing the same things we are facing they are modern europeans as we are modern indian hindus so i don't think we are really alienating allies by that um actually can i just say um on the whole about rashid you are correct but on the assassinate there was uh, an intolerant from rashid that came uh, into being and it did persecute Jews and it did persecute Christians. You can say it's political, but Zoroastrianism, it was an intolerant form of Zoroastrianism and it had a huge influence on Islam because Iran had to control certain parts of Arabia, the South, even as far as Yathrib, and there's no doubt that it did become more intolerant as time went on. No, it, it did. I mean, it, I don't want to admit it, but that's the truth. And there's huge influence on Islam by Zoroastrianism. Uh, one, the one point I want to talk to Ranbir is that uh, you mentioned that uh, the expansionism of the uh, Arabs uh, predated the uh, development of Islam, but I am not seeing any, any of that uh, uh, in my studies. Uh, and uh, anyway, today in this talk, I represent Sitaram Goyal. He clearly mentioned uh, the Arabs uh, started expansion after the Islamic uh, Islamization. Right. So, he, he, he was, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't sorry, accept that particular sorry. point of view. Uh, first of all, uh, I am not seeing it in the Sita Rangoyal's uh, thesis. Uh, if it is separately available, then you can just provide me some uh, information and I will consider that as part of my uh, end of thesis. Uh, sure. uh, that is one point and I uh, completely align with the uh, Talagrij's uh, uh, mention about the evolution. So, and uh, again, because uh, Jorish has very strongly mentioned uh, against, uh, like, concerned me as a fundamentalist, poly, uh, polytheist, so I'm saying, say, uh, exactly like, uh, because uh, Talagriji has mentioned the cor correct words, uh, uh, which I could not articulate. Uh, it is a transformation. And uh, um, the, the, the idea of uh, believing in Ishta Devada, that is a, a, a particular Devada is my uh, is, is a high, my favorite. That was there in Rig Veda also. Indra was uh, that Devada. And um, after that, uh, in the Swarajtrainism, definitely because of the battles, the political battles that ensued between uh, the Bharatas and the uh, the, uh, the Avastins, uh, there was a kind of a, a hatred, uh, not hatred, but a, that there is a kind of a, uh, a hatred uh, in the Avastin text. So subsequently it came out of in the Avastin text, but uh, right, right in the Rig Veda, you can see that they were described as Anindra, Avrata, etc. That they, they don't worship Indra like that. So this is right from uh, Rig Veda. So, and uh, subsequently, uh, the Western text exhibit uh, the the in the Zoroastrian text exhibits uh, the three elements like resurrection and afterlife uh, and uh, I mentioned that the three elements uh, that is pre pre uh, precursor of uh, Abrahamism. So e exactly like uh, Zoroastrianism is not Abrahamism. Abrahamism definitely start from uh, this uh, uh, Judaism only. 
but uh, some of the precursor features that was developed in the uh, Solarian text. Uh, resurrection, one of the important one, one, one among them. And I traced it slightly to the Mayadanava and uh, also to the uh, Shukra Jairas, uh, the resurrection concept. Like you continue your body life, life of physical body after death, again, uh, you using some medicine, you resurrect. So uh, if I want to, uh, if I, if I, as a person, if I am opposing uh, everything related to uh, monotheism, then uh, I'll have to oppose uh, everything. So I'm not uh, opposed to everything, including some elements of Rigveda I have to oppose. I'm not doing that. My opposition only in that whatever happened in some 2000 years ago. Uh, and uh, rightly, uh, Palakirji has rightly mentioned, uh, current situations are entirely different. And um, uh, today's Europeans, uh, we can consider similar to allies of uh, Hindus. So tell you something happened in the past doesn't make them enemies in any way. So look, um, I know you're saying, but the look, the Shkand Gumani of Wizard assassinate text does a few other beliefs. Temples of Devas were destroyed, yeah, by Zorvanes. Okay, that's what happened. Um, in terms of Sitran Gol not mentioning pre-Islamic, no, no, I didn't say pre-Islamic expansion. Okay, the chronology isn't wrong. What I'm saying is the expansion happened, Islam was formed afterwards to justify it. Because if you look at um, rice like John Damascus, 8th century. There's no reference of these invaders, Arab invaders, mentioning Islam, Quran, and Muhammad. It's not mentioned. This happens afterwards. When did you get the first biography of Muhammad? Ibn Ishaq, a century afterwards. Why the gap? Surely if it was so detailed, you have it at the time. But you don't have any contemporary sources of Muhammad existing. You don't have any contemporary sources um, of Jesus. I mean, Josephus was a later insertion, but again, no contemporary sources. It's all written afterwards to justify it. That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm not um, refuting any of the destruction that took place in the wars. What I'm saying is the reasons behind it. Mm -hmm. Yes, to, to wind up this uh, indeed very important discussion, uh, let me simply say that um, while Golgi has done a lot of uh, historical work about what Islam did in India, about the origins of Islam, he is simply following the established Islamic history, which makes sense because that's what counts for the Muslims, that's what determines their behavior. Also, at that time, uh, the, uh, uh, the things that you uh, explain that uh, are, you know, that were developed by Christoph Luxemburg, by Patricia Krohn, now by, um, uh, what's his name Robert again? Spencer. Tom Robert Holland. Spencer, yes. Um, th that's pretty recent. So, you know, there was only a very distant uh, sense of that in Goelji's time. Now this knowledge is also being brought into India, like Abhas Malhadiyar uh, has done that. So that's very important. And I think in the future, we will devote more attention to this real history of Arabia in the seventh century. Uh, but the, um, the Islamic version is still important simply because it's the one that is believed by Muslims themselves and determines their behavior. But so I propose in the interest of the next speaker that we wind this uh, up here and we promise each other that we will take up this very important discussion on some future occasion. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Els. And sorry, I had some internet connectivity issues, so I was not able to coordinate in between. My sincerest apologies for that. Uh, I, and I hope the discussion went on in a very good, positive way. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan Sitaraman. And he would be speaking on Sitaram Goel's conclusion on iconoclasm and theology in context of non-Indian history. Uh, as we saw yesterday, he is a uh, he has doctorate in microbiology and is a keen student of Indian and world history. So I request uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan to, to uh, present his views on the topic. Okay, thank you. But before I start, I want to know from you and Dr. Elst. You know how much time we have because it's almost one o'clock here. <laughs> so yeah, do we shift everything one by one yeah. hour? I yeah. mean, very simply. Yeah, we we can do that. I'm in no hurry. I mean, I I we don't know do about that. the others, yeah, but yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned, your topic is important enough 
Uh, yeah. So we should divorce. Yeah, we are perfectly. Yeah, yeah. I'm perfectly and, all right. So whatever time you can take, yeah, I'm and, totally uh, okay by me. Okay, so I'll try to stay within my allotted previously allotted time. You know, one hour or so. So that is what yeah. I'm going to do. Yes. Sir. And uh, in fact, this discussion has raised some questions which I'll try to answer. You know, impromptu in the course of my talk also. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope uh, you know uh, this will be good. So let me first share my screen. Yes, sir, please share my screen and uh, let's see if it is functioning, etc. Uh, we need that. Okay, can you see my uh, presentation now? Yes, sir. We can see your presentation. Okay, uh, as, uh, we yeah, go into the slide uh, slide, slide show. mode, please. Yeah. yeah. Is it okay? Yes, sir. It's perfectly fine. Fine. Okay. So thank you. It's a privilege for me to present my ideas or uh, you know extension of. Uh, uh, Shri Sitaram Goelji's ideas on the occasion of his centenary. This is a very important thing, uh, event that has happened and this kind of discussion not to take place. And uh, my topic specifically is not about uh, you know, the challenge of Islam per se, but about his conclusions on iconoclasm and theology, but in the context of non-Indian history. As, as you all know, Shri Sitaram Goel wrote about you know, the Indian temples and so on. Uh, but uh, I want to extend this argument, especially in the light of counter arguments that have come up since. So, of course, the regular disclaimer is that all my views, are, all these views are personal. That's necessary to say. So the point of departure here is uh, Sri Sitaram Goel's uh, own writing <clears throat> in his famous book, Hindu Temples, What Happened to Them, uh, Chapter 9. It's He said that he made this kind uh, of the correlation between uh, theology and uh, uh, actual action and behavior. So he said, it is inconceivable that a constant and consistent behavior pattern witnessed for a long time and over a vast area can be expressed, can be explained, except in terms of a settled system of belief. This is very important. A settled system of belief, which leaves no scope for second thoughts. So when you look at the large number of uh, temples that have been destroyed and turned into Muslim monuments, he says that do not try to come up with economic or political explanations. These uh, attempts can only be futile, if not a fraudulent exercise. These are his words. And uh, the problem is that these economic or political explanations are not even plausible. This is what he said in his time when he wrote that book, uh, you know, Hindu temples, what happened to them. So, now this created, I mean, if you are aware of history, this creates a question in my mind as to when uh, Sri Sitaram Goel was such a talented person, he was so knowledgeable and everything, did he even have to spend time to make this statement? And the reason is as follows. Because the statement that he has made is actually only a restatement in some way, mutatis mutandis, of a 2000 year old consensus, which has been applied to a local context. You know, as we saw yesterday, the first two commandments are very clear. No other gods before me. And secondly, you shall not make any idols. So the injunction against polytheism and idolatry has been acknowledged by, you know, the prophetic monotheistic religions themselves. So why is it that people need to suddenly come up with economic, political, and all sorts of other explanations is the question. And why did uh, Sri Sita Ramji have to expend so much energy and time and resources to come up with this compilation at all. You know, and uh, part of the reason is that in India, things uh, moved in a different way. Uh, even before independence, you know, there was this element of negationism where everything was blamed on the British. All Hindu-Muslim con conflict was blamed on the British, uh, you know, uh, the, the British policy of divide and rule, the British blamed for the partition also. And uh, it became a let, let article of faith in our textbooks also. So if you look at any uh, school textbooks, they will say that uh, Hindus and Muslims were living happily together and these bad British people came and uh, you know destroyed this equilibrium. Now, this was, uh, so this kind of negationism has deep roots. It has nothing to do with modern scholars trying to obfuscate it. So that is also part of the reason. Now, after <coughs> Sri Sita Ram Goel published this uh, list of temples and uh, he also analyzed the theological motivation behind temple destruction. Professor Richard Eaton uh, wrote two long articles in Frontline. Uh, these were titled Temple Desecration in Pre-Modern India. And uh, 
temple desecration and Indo-Muslim states. This is important because uh, Professor Richard Eaton had also written a book much earlier before Sri Sitaram Goel wrote his book on Hindu temples. He had written on the Sufis of Bijapur. And that was a standard book. And it also refers to incidents of temple destruction. And I think some of those have actually been referred to by Sri Goel himself. I'll have to look carefully, but maybe he has. But in other words, uh, Professor Eaton's previous work was unacceptable and it was pretty much the, uh, what the consensus is, historical consensus. Now, the, <clears throat> in these two articles, uh, Richard Eaton insisted on seeing some kind of continuity in the practice of temple destruction by citing a few pre-Islamic instances of Hindu kings carrying away statues after raiding temples. So in other words, what is happening in this Indian subcontinent is nothing more than a continuation of what kings usually do. The kings can be Hindu, the kings can be Muslim, they can be whatever. But, uh, you know, carrying away statues and raiding temples is what kings usually do during a conquest. This was the thesis that was put forward, at least the way I understand it. Uh, but what was not pointed out was that the fate of the statues taken away by Hindu kings was radically different from the fate these statues met in Islamic dispensations. So if the Hindu king takes away a statue, most probably he's going to uh, you know, put it up in his own temple, private temple or pub public one, whatever, and then worship it in a grander way. Uh, whereas in the Islamic case, there is not even one instance where any statue has been taken and then worshipped in a better way or equivalent way. And uh, uh, Dr. Conrad Elst of uh, characterized these arguments as a form of historical negationism. And again, he highlighted the role of theology in iconoclasm. He said, this is, uh, uh, one of the titles of his articles was Iconoclasm Sanctified by Scripture, if I remember it right. So he, uh, he again uh, reiterated that link and he also wrote a separate book on negationism in India. And he pointed out the scale of destruction and contrasted the ultimate fate of statues and either things, just as we so uh, now the related question that uh, came to my mind is about this cultural continuity. Based on this postulate of cultural continuity, is iconoclasm a continuation of cultural practices in the Middle East, the original home of the prophetic monotheistic religions? This is the question that came to my mind because when a group of people go to some new country, they can be, uh, you know, refugees, they can be invaders, they can be anything in between. That doesn't matter. Uh, there are certain kinds of cultural adjustments that do happen. One is that a certain amount of assimilation occurs. In, a, in effect, people take up the language of the country that they have come to. That, that can happen. You can see it in the case of gypsies who are all over Europe and they speak the local language. Uh, and, uh, you know, on the other hand, they can also try to preserve some elements of their own culture. For instance, they can have names the way they used to and not you know, assimilate with the local naming methods. Or you know, if you see uh, many Indian immigrant communities all over the world, you see that they try to maybe have their local Hindu temple and local community associations and they celebrate uh, certain cultural elements. They have language classes. So, when, a, when one group goes from one region, from its native region to an alien region, it can do two of one of two things. It can do two things, actually. These are not mutually exclusive. Uh, it can borrow, it can assimilate, and it can also try to retain some of its uh, cultural norms. So my question now is, when these Islamic invaders came to India, were they actually maintaining the cultural continuity that was there in their, in the native land of prophetic monotheism, which is the Middle East. Though these were Turkic invaders, clearly as Islam uh, comes from the Middle East and it converts to Turks, now do the Turkic invaders actually uh, uh, convey this cultural continuity from the Middle East into India is the question. Now, I don't know. I, I put this without knowing what would happen, but it seems to be uh, sort of relevant because uh, this is the criticism of uh, the world's first Indologist, Al-Baruni, about Hindus. He says that Hindus believe there is no country but theirs, no nation like theirs, no kings like theirs, no religion like theirs, no science like theirs. They're haughty, foolishly vain, self-conceited, and stolid, 
and so on and so forth and uh, they are sort of hostile and he advises them if they traveled and mixed with other nations they would soon change their mind and he also uh, gives some mitigating circumstances for their ancestors were not as narrow minded as the present generation is this was 1000 years ago now the context is that alberuni came in the wake of uh, mahmud of ghaznavi so all the hindus pretty much were angry with the so called foreigner they didn't really parse it out very carefully so they seem to have been pretty narrow minded in that sense so but anyway we don't want to be narrow minded and keep confining ourselves to india so that is why we want to look at some uh, non indian history so to find out whether you know some of these practices are imports from the native uh, lands of the of prophetic monotheism so the area that i'm going to talk about can you see my cursor no you can't see my cursor anyway the area that i'm going to talk about in this map is uh, from roughly from modern iraq which would be mesopotamia all the way going leftward to syria lebanon uh, israel amman jordan and egypt and all the way down to sudan because egypt uh, south of egypt what is now sudan was also the kingdom of nubia which will feature in our talk later and of course uh, you have iraq Uh, which is mesopotamia and you have the near east uh, we will not go into anatolia but anatolia will figure uh, peripherally you know or indirectly so this is the area and this is where i want to find out whether you know there are some uh, cultural there is con- cultural continuity between those practices and these so in search of continuity we go to mesopotamia now consider the semitic speaking assyrian empire in mesopotamia so this is the bronze age empire and interestingly here we hit pay dirt because there are documented instances of assyrian kings who capture the statues of gods of other cities hostile kingdoms and so on and they destroy them they deport them along with the people that they are deporting so the assyrian uh, uh, kingdom was pretty much warlike it was extremely warlike and uh, uh, probably a a bronze age equivalent of chenghis khan i don't know maybe that is carrying it too far but they were pretty brutal in punishing uh, rebellious peoples or enemy uh, kingdoms so they would take away the gods and uh, statues of gods either destroy them deport them or they they would do another thing they would take these statues of gods and put them as doorkeepers in assyrian temples so in other words the god has been demoted to becoming a dwarapal as we would say in uh, sanskrit so uh i found this interesting paper by shana zaya uh, called state sponsored sacrilege god napping and omission in new assyrian inscriptions which is uh, you know published you can see the reference so uh, uh she has uh, taken a very different view and i think a refreshingly different view from what most modern secularist historians do you see most modern secularist historians are obviously discarded religion as a factor in their personal lives but many of them make this mistake of assuming that it must apply likewise to the people they study whether ancient or contemporary that is not true there are people who keep uh, you know uh, theology and religion above economics and politics there are still human beings of that sort also and so trying to reduce everything to economic or political explanation which was criticized by shri sitaram goel again applies to these people so for a there are many papers in which they will say that assyrian kings did this because they wanted to show political power or political might or favor some vassal and this and that but you know they were also religious people and they venerated these gods just as much as the next man so why can't we grant them that religious feeling and that intensity of religious feeling that sincerity of religious feeling so let us just look at them in their own way on their own terms so that is the reason this particular paper really caught my eye so what she has done painstakingly is that she documented 56 instances where assyrian kings had done these things during the course of war there are 56 instances in which these things have happened but only seven of them seem to include the names of the actual gods that they so desecrated or destroyed or deported or demoted you know they are sort of reluctant to mention the names they might say oh the gods of such and such kingdom they might say the gods of such and such city or they might say the gods of such and such people or tribe 
but they are reluctant to include the names of the gods that they have subjected to such uh, ill treatment on the other hand the same assyrian kings also restored statues and temples to various cities ostensibly to highlight continuity in rulership and reassure the conqueror so this is the political part of it but again when you look at the actual instances you find 22 instances of such restoration and in 18 instances they are proudly naming all the gods they have no problem so clearly they are very happy to take credit when they are doing something meritorious like restoring the worship of a god restoring a temple or restoring the statue of a god that had been taken away earlier back to the original city and back to the original people so this is what has happened and uh, in in the second latter case where they are restoring things they are very happy to uh, name the gods so that they can pro- probably get some punya or uh, you know merit in the hierarchy Assyrian treaties also recognize the gods of other people and invoke formulaic curses on violators. And this we saw yesterday because you have these uh, translations of you know what god should be used in which treaty and you know what gods are equivalent. The people of that area, Mesopotamia and Near East, have gone into uh, some trouble to recognize what equivalents we have in other cultures. So this is also a feature of Middle East. And the conclusion of that paper is that. the scribes are generally reluctant to mention desecration and they are very reluctant to even mention the desecration in the name of a particular king so desecration is clearly an act of revenge of anger of something it is a it can be symptomatic of everything but it is not a symptom of piety in the assyrian scheme of things however the restoration is unequivocally an act of piety so that shows that the king is so pious and so on and so forth the first one you know uh, they are not very sure they are, they would rather not talk about it because you see they do not think the other gods are false this is a very important point so it might invoke the wrath of the other gods who are not false who are merely not your gods but they are not false now th- this is assyria in the next part of the continuity we go to egypt which is of course the cradle of monotheism as we saw yesterday so there is an incident in which kushites from nubia that is from sudan they raided egypt during roman times and they carried away statues of the emperor augustus as we said earlier these statues are probably erected as a symbol of the roman conquest where you had to sacrifice to the genius of the emperor and so they uh, the kushites understand that symbolism they uh, they are at war with roman egypt so they raid egypt and carry away these statues of emperor augustus and that's not all one of these statues was decapitated and the head of the statue was buried face downward in a temple at meroe which is a major site of uh, the kingdom of kush you know of nubia and it was discovered in 1910 so they were capable of doing this kind of desecration to a statue of some adversary but then the same kushites had also ruled egypt much earlier as the 25th dynasty of pharaohs and in that case there are no instances of anti egyptian iconoclasm so the kushites did this as a one off thing where they are at war with roman egypt and they are trying to uh, that they have they seem to have avoided all the egyptian gods but they have taken this uh, augustus statue and then uh, given it some harsh harsh treatment and finally after alexander's conquest the greek ptolemaic dynasty also ruled as per the pharaonic norms and in fact uh, Uh, Cleopatra was married to her own younger brother Ptolemy. Yeah. So this is a matter of recorded history. So we are looking for iconoclasm. Just to remind you, we are looking for a continuity in iconoclasm in the Middle East. And uh, now we come to the Hebrews, and we are getting into the Bible. One of the things that biblical scholarship has uh, revealed is that the covenant of God with Hebrews follows. templates that were prevalent in the ancient middle east assyrian hittite syrian templates that were prevalent in the ancient middle east and uh, you know i have given two references for this but this is insufficient because there's a huge amount of work that has been done on you know word by word analysis of the bible and i'm obviously not competent to go into all of that all i can do is apologize to all the scholars whose work i have not cited okay yeah. but one, certain things are very clear there are two types of covenants that are Uh, prevalent in the ancient middle east 
Uh, first is the promissory covenant, which is unconditional. So somebody is going to do something for someone else without any condition. So it could be a king saying that I protect you regardless because you are my subject. So that could be a promissory co covenant. The, the other type of covenant is the obligatory type of covenant where you know the discharge of the superior person's obligations is conditional on the uh, subordinate person observing certain norms. So we'll come to that in detail. So these are the two types of covenants. One form of obligatory covenant used in you know, international relations is the suzerain, suzerain vassal type. That is between the Chakravarti and the Raja in our terms. So the uh, emperor and the king, uh, the king would be the vassal of the emperor. So one party is distinctly superior to the other. The suzerain will discharge duties towards the vassal. There is no doubt about that. They have to protect them and so on and so forth, provided the vassal remains obedient and loyal. So what is required of the vassal is obedience and loyalty. If they are required to send so much of tribute, they got to send it on time. They got to supply so many horses and so many men. They have to supply those things on time and in the correct uh, way. So uh, contingent on all this uh, good behavior, the suzerain will discharge duties towards the vassal. And uh, uh, this is very important because the covenant of God with the Hebrews follows this kind of suzerain vassal template. This is an important finding. And especially the part where the suzerain will discharge the, his duties towards a vassal only if the vassal remains obedient and loyal. So this explains a lot of the biblical narrative because uh, obviously the Hebrews are in many wars with many people. There's a lot of conflict. There's no doubt about that. So in some of these conflicts, they win. In some of the conflicts, they lose. And I would like to uh, direct your attention towards the conflicts that are lost by the Hebrews. So whenever the, people lose, uh, the Hebrews lose the conflict, the prophets immediately arise among them and they tell them that you lost because you were not loyal to the Lord. In other words, what they might have done is they might have been worshipping and but like Solomon, they must have gone and worshipped Chemosh or uh, uh, some other god. And so, you know, it's like a vassal professing loyalty to two kings, which obviously cannot be done. So the uh, prophets interpret the defeat as being a consequence of disobedience and disloyalty. And therefore they say, uh, you know, once you set aside all these other polytheistic elements and go back to the worship of your true Lord, only then will the Lord start to discharge his duty of protecting you and making you victorious. So it explains a lot of biblical narrative. Now we come to a very specific incident, which is again part of the biblical narrative, which is the promised land and the Philistine captivity of the Ark of the Covenant. So let us explain these terms. What is the Ark of the Covenant? The Hebrews carried the stone tablets containing the canonical Ten Commandments in what may be considered a mobile shrine. So this is described in great detail in the book of Exodus. And uh, you know, God tells them that how to make even how to make this mobile shrine. Okay. And uh, uh, the ten the tablets on which the Ten Commandments are inscribed, the stone tablets are actually kept inside this mobile shrine and they are carried around with the Jews wherever they go. Now, again, I, I'm not going to assign a BC date or an AD date to all these happenings because this is not strictly history as it happened, but history as it is remembered and made into a narrative. Uh, Jan Aspen, whom we uh, referred to yesterday, refers to this as Nemo history, that is history as it is remembered. So, uh, the uh, Hebrews carried around their Ten Commandments in the form of an ark, and it is sort of an improvised shrine. It is a sort of improvised shrine. Now, the Philistine captivity of the Ark of the Covenant is an incident I have chosen among all the other incidents of iconoclasm for a particular reason. Yes, the biblical narrative is full of iconoclasm, no problem. But uh, this particular incident describes not only the religious attitudes of the iconoclasts, but also describes in great details the uh, attitudes of the idolaters. This is where you know this uh, Philistine captivity of the Ark gains some importance. So 
this is an artist's uh, rendering. I mean, since it's about iconoclasm, I had to show at least one statue. So uh, you can see that, uh, you know, the Jews are carrying this uh, shrine in which the Ark of the Covenant, in which the tablets are placed. And you can even see the two uh, cherubim on top of the uh, casket where, uh, you know, they are uh, shading this casket with their wings. And this is exactly as per the instructions given in Exodus 24. Uh, book 25, 10 to 22. So this is from one of the cathedrals in France. So now what happens in the promised land when the Philistines uh, capture the Ark of the Covenant? So the scene is that in uh, the first book of Samuel, the Hebrews are fighting with the Philistines and uh, you know they are losing also. So since they are losing, uh, the uh, the Philistines seem to come to war with the statues of their God. So the Hebrews suggest that they also take out the Ark of the Covenant and bring it to the front lines. Okay, Because, you know, if their gods are supporting them, why can't we get our God to support us? This is a very simple logic. However, what happens is the Philistines win. And as war booty, they capture the Ark, but they do not destroy it. They keep it in the shrine of their own god Dagon at a city called Ashdod. So this ark, even though it is captured, it is not desecrated, it is not destroyed, it is kept in a temple. So it's in, kept in a good place. Now they keep it, go back home, and after day one, they find that Dagon's statue is found face down. So they say, okay, something must have happened, never mind. They uh, set it upright. And then they go back about their business. On day two, the same thing happens. Dagon's statue has fallen down. The head and hands are broken. And the broken hands and uh, head are found on the threshold of the temple. So the Philistines take this you know, uh, very badly and they feel very sad about it. So the Bible informs us that the Philistines subsequently abstain from treading the threshold of Dagon's temple. So they don't want to put their foot on a place where, you know, uh, parts of their God statue had lain. So they are very careful. I mean, uh, they don't like this kind of iconoclasm. It's very clear. And uh, probably they were trying to, I mean, this is purely my guess. They were trying to see if the God, if the Lord of the Hebrews could be brought over to their side. They were probably trying to propitiate the Lord of the Hebrews. But unfortunately, this doesn't stop there. There is a sudden invasion of mice. So uh, after these people bring the Ark of the Covenant, there is a sudden invasion of mice. There is the outbreak of tumors or some kind of disease that causes boils. I'm guessing it's plague because plague also causes buboes. But anyway, uh, because of this, uh, these problems, priests are consulted. However, I wish to draw your attention to uh, this which seems to be a mini case of the play, 10 plagues of Egypt. Because in the case of Egypt also, the Lord brings you know, 10 plagues on the Pharaoh and uh, the Pharaoh relents only at the 10th. So priests are consulted to see what can be happened. That is the priests of the Phil Philistines are consulted to find out what could be done to avert these calamities. So they suggest transferring the Ark to a city called Gath. And then subsequently, they try to transfer it to another city called Ekron. Why? Because the same story is repeated over seven months in both cities. The same story is repeated over seven months in both cities. The same mice come out, the same people break out in boils, and all these problems happen. Now again, the priests are wondering what we are, where we are going wrong. They want to first do it very systematically according to their theology. They want to check if the capture of the ark is responsible for all these calamities. They suggest sending the ark back to the Hebrews with guilt offerings. This is very important. Guilt offerings, which consist of five golden tumors and five golden mice. And, in a, and these things are kept in a cart. The ark is kept in a cart drawn by two cows and uh, along with these guilt offerings. The stipulation, according to their system of belief, is that if the ark is not causing all these miseries, then it would not go into Israelite territory. 
On the other hand, if the ARC was uh, causing all these problems as a hostile act, it would go back into Israelite territory. And as it happened, the story ends when the cart came to a stop in a Hebrew speed. So clearly, this was uh, the Lord exercising his powers against the enemies of the Hebrews. So again, another picture, the ark sent away by Philistines. So it was kept in a uh, cart like this, probably, and uh, sent away. Now, some observations and comments. First of all, uh, since this is a biblical narrative, this account is provided by hostile witnesses, that is hostile to Philistines. But it shows that Philistines do not desecrate their rival's divine symbol, but try to cooperate for themselves. Okay. And they, when they send these guilt offerings, the Philistines seem to implicitly recognize that separating a god from his people is sort of wrong. And this goes back to the Assyrian thing. They are reluctant to say that we took away such and such God. You know, uh, and uh, all that reluctance is again manifested in this different form. Because they send them back with the say, uh, guilt offerings. The Philistine norms ensure the safe return of the Ark. On the other hand, the Hebrew norms suggest the symbolism of the broken statue of Dagon. You see, the first day, second day, the Ark is kept First day, the ark is kept in the temple. Dagon falls down, and the second day, the ark is the uh, statue is righted, and the ark is left there. The second day, the statue of Dagon is broken. So the symbolism of iconoclasm is there. So these are the two different norms coexisting in the same area, which is the ancient Middle East. And the reason we had to do this excursion to the Bible is also because Goelji traces Islamic iconoclasm directly to the Bible. Because as uh, Dr. Elst pointed out, uh, he took those biblical narratives and whatever research was done at his time at face value. So if this is the biblical narrative and this is the outcome that, is, that we are going to have. Again, from the same book, Hindu temples, what happened. And more importantly, the Quran itself uh, goes into some lengths to uh, suggest that Abraham was an iconoclast in his own tribe. Though this account of Abraham as an iconoclast does not appear in the Bible, the Quran has dedicated nearly 20 verses to this uh, fact, at least the Quran as we know it. And uh, there is an incident in the early Islamic history where a, a, a person named Khalid destroys the temple of al Uzza. This is also noted by Goelji, by the way. Uh, so the uh, uh, the Islam, the, the Islamic warrior Khalid goes and destroys the temple of Al Uzza, who is the, one of the goddesses of the ancient Arabs. And uh, the priest is helpless to do anything. So he uh, say he prays to Al Uzza, and he says as follows: He says, Al Uzza, either you make an attack on Khalid and destroy him. And if you can't save yourself, at least become a Christian. So this is what the uh, uh, pre-Islamic Arabic priest says, tells his goddess, see, either you protect yourself or you quickly become a Christian, which means that he understood that iconoclasm was somehow normative for Christians because they were more familiar with Christians in Arabia. Now, uh, what has been done is just as important as what is not done. That is the other part of this entire story. So the hostile witness, Khafi Khan, who was a historian in the court of Aurangzeb, cannot cite even one example of wanton mosque destruction by Shivaji, who was the deadly adversary of the Mughal Empire. And this is from you know old records. Now, we come to the contemporary times. So many people are saying, uh, you know, are uh, uh, getting very happy about the destruction of the Babri Mosque, but uh, they are not. They are giving any number of reasons. They are saying that uh, they have taken revenge. They're, they're, this is justice, or you know, serves them right. People say all sorts of things, but what they are not doing is they are not citing Professor Eaton to affirm that this is our subcontinental practice, that it is our subcontinental game to you know keep breaking each other's uh, place of worship. So, and neither can they find anything to cite in their own theology. 
and likewise they cannot find anything to cite in their own history as uh, goel ji again pointed out in his writings because uh, he actually prepared a questionnaire for marxist professors and he said please tell us which are the buddhist monuments that were destroyed which are the hindu monuments sitting on the site of buddhist monuments show us the epigraphic evidence show us all the historians who have uh, applauded the kings for doing this kind of uh, destroying the buddhist monument and so on and so forth so he set up a full questionnaire for uh, for the marxist professors who insisted that this was part of you know practice and hindus have done it too now this is the kind of continuity that we should be seeing so nobody from ancient times can find any justification among hindus for iconoclasm that is continuity what is worse the much maligned manusmriti also doesn't help us in this regard it states that a victorious king should affirm prevalent traditions in a conquered territory you can conquer the territory get tribute or whatever maybe punish a few people but uh, you know the prevalent traditions should all be maintained and finally you know we went all over the world so i think we can justifiably come back to india in zafar nama which is a letter written by guru gobind singh ji to aurangzeb he informs aurangzeb that he himself is an idol breaker and that is the reason he is uh, fighting with the kings of kangra who are idol worship okay so clearly guru gobind singh ji understood what was normative and in which context that is guru gobind singh had no doubts as to uh, where iconoclasm is normative and where idol worship is normative and finally uh, again the absence of citations the bamiyan buddhas were destroyed on february 26 2001 again the taliban put out a statement at that time but they never mentioned that you know again this is our subcontinental or south asian continuity that we are uh, observing no they had uh, they cited other precedents and other principles and the entire reason goel ji had to go through all this trouble was probably because of uh, this the eminent historians you know if they had not tried to change this 2000 year old consensus that prophetic monotheism essentially works for the elimination of both polytheism and idolatry i mean there is nothing to argue about this at all and after all even uh, goel ji's own book is a compilation of everything that is there in other books and in epigraphica indica so goel ji went far beyond that and he said that the movement for the restoration of hindu temples has got bogged down around the ram janmabhoomi at ayodhya he said that the more important question in his mind was why hindu temples met the fate they did at the hands of islamic invaders which has not even been whispered that is what he was really concerned about one or two temples restoration is fine according to him but and in fact he was the person who wrote the white paper on ayodhya and he uh, wrote so many articles about ram janmabhoomi so there is no question about his commitment to it but he said that this is only a side light and the more important question is we should understand the theological basis of iconoclasm and uh, i finally conclude with what could well be a sort of uh, memorial to shri sitaram goel ji on his uh, centenary because uh, he often he, once or twice i think i learned from uh, dr els biography of goel ji that he was on the wrong side of the law and he was almost arrested so we can say that uh, goel ji was arrested not for spreading rumors but for spreading facts this was his fate so uh, with that i can conclude my talk and i would like to acknowledge of course sri ram swarup and sri sita ram goel uh, and without their ideas i don't think we would be having this discussion and you know so many things would have, would not have come up and of course we have to remember the internet which en- enable the dissemination of their ideas mm-hmm. and uh, of course india facts and professor ramesh rao for organizing this uh, conference on the centenary which is very notable and uh, dr conrad else for all his wonderful books that he has written for his uh, you know uh, counsel for his advice for uh, getting putting together this program and abstracts papers etc and for mr b srinivas for taking care of the logistics in conducting this program so thank you very much for your attention i hope we are not too late
no dr sidaram thank you for that very very insightful and very fact based uh, session uh, now i request uh, dr els to do a conclusion of the conference with his uh, with his insight please dr els thank you right thank you and uh, thank you ramakrishna ji uh, i am very glad that you did give the full paper that we extended our time for that i would not want to have missed it so um me too of course i i join you in thanking uh, first of all ram swarup and sitaram goel then the um uh, india facts and um the uh, indic academy for all the logistic and so on support uh including uh, our moderator sushant and um our handyman uh, Srinivas Vade. Uh, okay, so what, uh, what do we take from this conference? Where do we go from here? Uh, Sitaram Goel was a historian. And so maybe the question, where do we go from here? Doesn't apply to a historian as he is busy with the past, but um, as as Gigit has just now repeated, uh, the doing of history determines the future, and you know determines the way that you go about policy making and and making the future. So in this case, um, we see that in India the enemy is very aware of this fact. That's why. Uh, the secularists are very busy manipulating the history books because they know that this has an influence. And indeed, we see that influence among Hindu youngsters who have swallowed uh, most of their version. So the work that Goelji did was very important, not just for considering the past, but for formulating where India goes from here. His um, historical work is unchallenged, like his list of 2000 temples. There is not one where any uh, historian from the opposite camp has been able to find fault. We've heard here the uh, story of Hushwan Singh repeating the secularist rumor that the Golden Temple uh, was uh, um, started by a Muslim uh, divine. Goelji uh, challenged that, showed what the real history was. And even though Hushwan Singh then appealed to secularist historians to please, you know, give the true story, show that Goelji is an obscurantist, blah, blah. No one came forward to do that. So Sitaram Goel's work in history is unchallenged. Uh, however, as has also been uh, discussed this morning, his uh, history, not of the doings of Islam in India, but the origins of Islam, that of course follows the established Islamic history. For Muslims themselves, this history of how Islam came about is very important, is indeed normative, is quite literally what the Sharia is based on. So the whole of Islam collapses if this history is not correct. And so this uh, shows where we're going from here, at least for that uh, part of uh, history of Islam, namely the uh, upcoming uh, historical research into the real origins of Islam as distinct from the scriptural ones. Uh, that is going to further uh, undermine Islam. Many Hindus are still very afraid that before too long, Muslims are going to be the majority in India. And even though there is nothing wrong with every individual Muslim, in the aggregate, they do pose a problem for, for others. In all the countries where Muslims are in a majority, we do find some amount of uh, oppression of problems for the minorities. 
This can be straight out oppression and expulsion, or it can come in much milder form, but nowhere is there really full equality. So Hindus absolutely want to avoid that. And so it's important for them what is going to happen in the future. Is this uh, demographic challenge continuing? Is it going to be victorious in the not too long run? So Goelzi himself was rather uh, unconcerned with this question. And we can see here why. You see, the, um, the whole situation can change the moment Muslims themselves start doubting Islam. This is happening already to some extent, even in the heartland of Islam, uh, often in secret, of course, because people are still afraid of the reaction of their surroundings, uh, often openly in circles where it is possible, uh, but not in the Muslim world itself yet. But it, is, it stands to reason with the enormous availability of information now, where you see all the information that, uh, that for instance, Sitaram Gowell himself or others have collected on Islam, now it is one mouse click away. In any harem in Saudi Arabia, it, members of the household can secretly download this, get all this information. So it can, in fact, go much faster than we expected. And so this is the, 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 the great importance of historical work. You see, since religion harks back to the past and tries to continue something that obtained in the past, or in their imagination, uh, seventh century Arabia, uh, the work of historians is very important in, in verifying or falsifying that past on which they base themselves. Then um, I've just checked uh, some, some online sources about Sitaram Goel, where indeed, uh, still today, Indologists continue to mention him only very briefly and rarely without the, um, rarely without the, um, claim that he is the most fanatic uh, Islamophobe in India. In a sense, that's exactly what he was. Not, not Islamophobe, you see, that's a, a voguish term that is simply illegitimate as a term. You know, this suggests that uh, being against Islam is some sort of mental disease. That is not the case at all. Um, but he is certainly the fiercest critic of Islam. And that precisely is good for Muslim human beings in the sense that the focus is laid exactly where it belongs. If there is at any point something wrong with Muslim behavior, it is not because these are evil human beings. No, it is uh, because they are conditioned by a certain doctrine. You see, as uh, uh, the physicist uh, Steven Weinberg has said, good people are going to do good things and evil people are going to do evil things. But to make good people do evil things, that takes religion. Now he is, of course, speaking from his modern Western atheist viewpoint. And I don't think that this can be said about religions in general. However, it certainly applies to Islam. So you have very many fine human beings who nonetheless are going to, like what happened in Lahore in 1947, are going to kill their neighbors who had trusted them, to whom yesterday I had promised, no, no, I will protect you. Uh, so you see, once they get religion, uh, then that has certain effects on human behavior that are not always desirable. And it is therefore these doctrines that have to be taken apart. So that's what Goelji has done like no one else. Well, except Ramaswaru. So that's an incredibly important work. And that is not a case of uh, hatred as people like to formulate it nowadays. On the contrary, hate has nothing to do with it. It is like a school teacher who is correcting 
the essays handed in by his pupils. You see, when he finds a mistake, he goes through it with the red pencil. And he clearly marks, he clearly tells the pupil, you see, this is a mistake. Next time you do it better. Now, does that mean he hates the pupil? <laughs> of course not. You see, he tries to improve the uh, writing capacity of the pupil. Does that mean he hates the mistake? Well, <laughs> you see, of course he thinks the mistake is wrong, but the emotional investment that is suggested by the word hate, that's also not there. This is just not the kind of thing you hate. You see, Islam is a mistaken belief system, but you see, nobody who notes these mistakes cares to hate them. So you see, scrap the word hate, that has nothing to do with it, but straight criticism, yes, of course. Uh, so that, uh, you know, we have our work cut out for us, like I already mentioned, the uh, ongoing research about the real history of Islam. So that's a job we should continue. I think here we've had an array of scholars who have given proof of precisely that. Uh, like uh, everything I heard this morning was really uh, innovative. Uh, so on this day, we shouldn't congratulate ourselves, but nevertheless, I'm happy it's evolving in this direction. So, um, I thank you all for your participation and uh, certainly we'll meet again. Namaste. Uh, will we uh, participants at least get a recording of this full? Uh, yes, of course, of yeah. course they will. Um, well, about the physical recording that I don't know, but of course we are working on Congress proceedings in which I invite your own cooperation, of course, by sending in fully uh, publishable versions of your talks. Will it be on YouTube or something or no? Uh, there is a Facebook page of India Facts, uh, yeah. uh, Shripaji. Uh, the whole session, yesterday's session also is already uploaded. You can okay. just go to the Facebook page and uh, you can access the video from there. It is, it is on the Facebook page, so I don't know whether you would be able to download it, but you can watch the whole session. Yesterday and today, yeah. uh, that is being made possible. Yeah, and shortly we'll upload into YouTube also, India Facts yeah. channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess with this uh, we conclude the conference, and uh, at a personal level, it has been an eye-opening and a very enriching and enlightening experience for me, and I hope it is for all the attendees who have attended the conference. Uh, along with that, uh, I take this opportunity to thank India Facts, uh, also uh, Shri Ji and uh, Ramesh Rao Ji and uh, Dr. Pankaj Saxena for giving me this opportunity to moderate this session. I hope uh, I uh, have done enough for my capabilities and have uh, carried out. And also, Doctor, uh, I also thank Dr. Elst for his guidance and insight, uh, which helped me a lot to moderate the sessions in a better way. So with that, uh, I think, Shridimaji, uh, we would conclude the session. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to all panelists and attendees again. Have a good day. Namaste. Namaste.